Can you all hear me? Okay. Good morning. I'm assuming everybody here is like west of the Mississippi because apparently nobody can fly out of DC right now. Is that fair? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Monotrauma. Um, I, I don't know what's my favorite. Is like seeing so many familiar faces or seeing so many new faces. So. Um, that said, I'm going to try and make this quick. We have some quick housekeeping notes before we kick off the event. Um, but uh, for those who don't know, my name is Jason Dixon, AKA Office Security on any number of various social medias that are all in disrepair. Um, this event does sort of mark the 10th year anniversary of Monotrauma. We started back in 2013. We started back in 2013 in Boston, followed by Berlin, and then we kind of just shimmied over here and mostly have been anchored here uh, for the last however many years. Um, so I love Portland. I hope you enjoy it as much as I generally have over the years. Um, I, we will do a, uh, attendee surveys after the event concludes, so I encourage your feedback. Um, it's kind of optimized for the event that I always wanted to go see, um, but you know we've, we've iterated on over the years based on feedback from all of y'all, so thank you. Um, quick notes, uh, if anybody needs or wants to use masks, you're encouraged to do so. You're welcome to do so. We have uh, masks available via uh, Portland Center stage in the main lobby near the registration area. Um, if you do not read your, uh, if you do not receive your Slack invite, please info us at info at monotrauma.com and we'll check into it. Um, Slack is generally the way we uh, communicate and keep up to date on everything during the event. Uh, let's see, Wi-Fi. Uh, we have Wi-Fi here. Uh, Monotrauma Guest is the main Wi-Fi for folks. Um, there's no password. You can just easily connect and use it. Uh, we have pretty good bandwidth for a uh, tech conference, knock on wood. Uh, there are also dedicated uh, segments for sponsors and speakers. Uh, you probably have it already if you need it. Uh, if you don't, please see one of our staff members or myself to, to get those uh, credentials. Uh, reminder, there are no open container drinks or food in the theater. Uh, if you'd like to bring anything, please bring in the boxed water. Um, I'm also encouraging folks, this is, these are really excellent containers to refill. They have a nice big open mouth. Um, and we have, uh, all the water fountains have refillable sp spigots there. So I encourage you to, uh, to make use of those. Um, if you haven't already, please check out the pour over coffee stand in the main booth. Um, we have some awesome baristas manning the, uh, the stage. Um, okay, yes, I'm biased. Those are my kids, but... Um, uh, it is really good coffee from Nosa Familia. Uh, bathrooms, restrooms. We have uh, big restrooms one floor down. So if everybody was waiting in line over here, you don't have to do that. There are restrooms one floor down um, off the lower lobby. Uh, we have single stall, ADA, non-gender specific bathrooms. Two on the main floor off the lobby, which many of you have seen and waited for. Um, again, one floor down off the lower lobby. And I believe there's a bathroom up on the uh, third floor where we have the rehearsal hall, which I'll touch on in a moment. Um, reminder about our code of conduct. If you haven't seen it already, please check it out. It's linked on the website. Um, we take it seriously and we do uh, reinforce or enforce that. So if you have any issues, again, reach out to me, email us at info at monotrauma.com or reach out to one of our staff uh, and we'll look into any issues. Um, for our schedule, this is a single track event, um, which again, it's optimized for personally my experience, but hopefully you enjoy it as well. Um, our sessions are 30 minute talks uh, for our main speakers. Um, we also have small blocks of sponsor talks interspersed, uh, which are basically three five minute talks, uh, which is a great opportunity to kind of learn, you know, see our exhibitors have to offer, and also it's just a nice refresher, you know, break between uh, the larger sessions. Um, uh, speaking of breaks, uh, we have extended breaks in monotrauma. So we have 30 minute breaks in the morning and the afternoons. And we have a long, almost two hour lunch break. Uh, it's about a minute, 45 minutes. Um, and uh, it's basically so you can take advantage of the fantastic restaurants and, and eateries nearby. Uh, speaking of which, and we'll share, I'll share more of this in the, uh, the lunch party uh, channel. Props to anybody that gets the office reference. Um, Little Big Burger, the Baker's Mark, excellent sandwiches there. Von Ebert's, Deschutes, uh, Shake Shack, Life of Riley, Park and Burnside Food Pod, Sizzle Pie, and if you'd like some fresh stuff, there's Whole Foods. Um, 
rehearse hall. If you'd like a little bit more space to spread out beyond the balcony, um, we have space on the third floor. It is called the rehearsal hall. Uh, it's casual seating, and we also live stream the event up there, um, so you won't miss out on anything. Um, a reminder to hold on to your tickets, which I guess I don't have or need because I'm a sponsor, because I'm an organizer, um, but you should have two tickets on the back or a stub. Um, you tear that off, exchange it for socks uh, in the registration area, and then hold on to the second ticket because we typically do raffles at the end of the event on Wednesday. Um, okay, and tonight, uh, after the conclusion, we do our, after, our official after party at Castaway Portland from 7 o'clock, and I'll remind you about that later. Um, quick thank you to all of our sponsors. You've probably seen them floating through here on the slide deck. Um, we couldn't do this event without your help, but also without their help. They help us flow the costs and making this possible. And so again, it's a great chance to see what's being offered and what's going on in the world of observability and monitoring. And uh, I guess with that, I'm going to intro our uh, MC. Um, some of you may know this gentleman. His name is Pete Cheslock, a uh, longtime friend, um, interesting character. Uh, uh, for those of you that follow him on social media, you may know he kind of he gets a little out of hand at times. And it's my job to kind of rein him in. I, you know, I, I kind of ground him at times. Um, don't tell the story. Um, but anyways, I'm going to hand it over to Pete. He's going to be our main uh, MC and you know, coordinator of affairs for the rest of the day. I will be around. Uh, if you see me, uh, feel free to flag me down. Um, if you, if you want to reach me on Slack, that you can do that as well. Anyways, I hope you have a great time. We've got a great lineup of talks for today, and uh, enjoy it. Thank you, Jason. Yes, my name is Pete Cheslock. I'll be wrangling the speakers and generally be up here throughout this conference. Uh, you can find me on Slack. I'm Pete Cheslock. I'm on social media. I'm Pete Cheslock. My profile picture, I've realized, does not reflect current hair growth patterns. So. It's a very pre-COVID picture, so I have not, I don't want to update my picture because that means I'm committing to the hair, so we're not quite there yet. Um, Jason didn't do this one, but I always like to ask, who, uh, who here is their, the first Monitorama conference? If you could just raise your hand. Wow, that is way more than I expected. That's amazing. All right, so if you've done, I'm now I'm going to do the classic thing while we wait for Adrian to come out, but uh, how, uh, how many people got two, two or more? Hand up. Keep them up for three or more. Four or more, this counts in any monotrauma too. Five or more, yeah, six or more, seven, that's a weird kind of half seven there. Eight, eight, nine, come on Josh, we're going to 10, all the way to 10? Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. Well, it's awesome to see so many new faces here. As Jason said, it's a single track conference. Uh, I personally love single track conferences because the talks really build on top of each other. Um, leverage the, uh, the extensive break time for networking as well. Check out the sponsors. They're upstairs and downstairs. Uh, and with that, let's kick it off and get going. Our first speaker today is Adrian. Adrian has worked at some companies you might have heard of, like Sun Microsystems. They're, they're still around, maybe a little bit, just in name only. Pour one out for Sun. Uh, Netflix, Amazon, things like that. Uh, and outside of talking about math and other hard technology, likes to take pictures of beautiful sunsets, which we're going to enjoy today. So let's give a big round of applause for Adrian. Hi, everyone. Okay. Oh, too many microphones on at once here. Okay. Um, yeah, great to be here again and, um, and uh, the opening. So... Let's talk, a tale of two histograms, the best of response times, the worst of response times. It's a Charles Dickens, Tale of Two Cities reference. Don't have to get that, but it just sounded like a cool title. Um, I'm going to start with an apology because this is a very geeky, you know, I submitted something that I thought it's something just really geeky talk proposal, some obscure statistical methods, and then Jason decided to inflict it on you on Monday morning. Um, so if you haven't had enough coffee, I'm sorry, right? So we're getting into some, some, uh, some odd things here. Um, and then just, just briefly, uh, you can find me on Mastodon or on the Slack channel. I'll be around till Wednesday afternoon. So I want to sort of follow up. This is a sort of launching some ideas here. Uh, and then just the other thing is, you know, I used to work for all these companies so about a year ago, um, just before the last um, Monotorama, I quit my, like, corporate day job uh, working for Amazon and uh, now sort of independent, sort of retired consultant, whatever. So you see Orion X on my 
uh, .NET. That's basically a sort of a consulting advisory analyst sort of group of a handful of people that gives me a sort of a vehicle for doing things, but that's basically it. And mostly I'm doing conference-driven development. So I, I get really busy because I put in a proposal and you know I checked in some code into GitHub this morning, so there you go. Um, back at the end of January, I, said I had to do enough work that I thought I could actually turn it into this talk. So I, I blogged it and I put it out there and that was my sort of down payment on, on this event. So, so um, there's a blog post, basically percentiles don't work. I'm talking about the analysis of response time distributions. And I've interposed this where there are pictures of sunsets, so you've got some eye candy, some things to look at. Um, so what is wrong with response times? And it's really, these are the two histograms. That most people think response times look something like this. You've got, you know, sometimes it's fast and then there's this long tail of it getting slower and slower. But what it actually looks like is more like this. And I constructed these to have the same sort of mean and maximum. But what you find is, actually, they tend to be spikier and have multiple spikes and then have a longer, flatter tail. Right? And that's kind of the way it looks. But this is kind of hard. It's hard to see what's going on there. In fact, even the resolution on this monitor on the display, it's not showing it very well. Um, so the problem is that you get a small change in load leads to a large change in response time. And if you've got like an SLA that says we will respond 95% you know, of the time within two seconds or one of those SLAs, you say, well, how much more load can we take before we break our SLA? And you actually, it's very hard to model that. An average response time isn't useful. So people use percentiles. But then percentiles actually don't work that well either because small changes in load move your percentiles around a lot. And then the other thing you get is like a 95th percentile calculated every minute, but you're summarizing by the hour, and you average them together, and it really isn't a percentile anymore. It's like an average of what used to be a percentile, but uh, statistically it's actually a meaningless number. It might be useful, but it's not a percentile, so you have to watch out for that. Um, but the th thing is, there's a lot of interesting structure in response time distribution. This has been bugging me for a very long time. Um, so if you remember your high school stats, right, there's mean, median, and mode, right? So median is the 50th percentile, so if we're doing percentiles, we're kind of doing median-like stuff. Mean's the average, so you can see the mean is, on this one, is a bit over a second. The 19th percentile is, whatever that is, like three or four seconds. Uh, but the modes are the interest, there's three modes here, right? There is the spike, a short spike, another spike, and another spike. So what I care about is those are the most common, that's the most likely thing to happen is something that's going to be on that spike. That's the most probable thing, right? So, but we don't generally use modes when we're talking about response time. So what I've, what I've developed here is a way to try to figure out how to manipulate and figure out the modes and manipulate them. That's what this talks about. So then why is there structure in response times? And it's basically because requests that come into a system take different paths through the system, right? If you've got microservices, they're going through different services. You've got some queries are heavily, heavy load, some are light load. You, put, you, have a, you look at an API front end, it's got this big mixture of things hitting it, and they all respond differently, and you combine all those together. And so you wouldn't expect to get a single smooth response time distribution. And the key point here is the word mixture. It's a mixture of underlying distributions. So back in 2016, I gave a talk where I simulated response times to show this. This was at the uh, um, micro exchange uh, event, which is in Berlin. And, uh, and it's actually in some slides. I rolled it up into my Microsoft tutorial slides I did at the end of 2016. So you can find most of my slides are on GitHub nowadays. Um, I'm still waiting for GitHub to support PowerPoint as a, as a file type, but you know, maybe they'll get there eventually. Um, this little diagram below is from this deck, but think of a load generator that hits a web service and it's got a memcached and MySQL and a, and a disk volume, right? And depending on what request you send it, you might find the data in the cache. You might be able to satisfy the data directly from MySQL's cache, or you might have to go to disk, right? And then those three things take different lengths of time. And there's this um, spreadsheet based thing. You can just go to this URL and play with it. 
Um, it's a Monte Carlo simulator, and Monte Carlo, if you want to combine together response times, the, the, the technique you use is called Monte Carlo simulation. You have a bunch of different, bunch of different distributions. You can sort of combine them together into a, into a final one, and that's what this is doing. So on the left, you have the overall response time, and I'm sort of modifying, uh, so combining together the distributions of, of the different things. And it's a bit clunky, but it's interesting. So if you look here, underneath all of this stuff, you can kind of see this fairly blocky distribution. So if you hit the memcache key, you get a nice fast response. And then a bit later, you see there's the MySQL cache hit. And then there's this much slower, I had to go talk to the disk, right? So there's three spikes in this response time. And then there's this weird gibberish thing you had to put in to make it do that. So anyway. Um, but if you change the response time, so one of the things I can do in this is you can tweak it. So if you look at the sort of shape there, this is 580 whatevers. It, and then if I increase the memcached hit rate, it's 480. Right? And if I um, decrease it, it goes to 740. So it's basically simulating the overall average response time, and it's, it's playing around with the distributions. So, I can take individual responses and combine them together to show that I get these sort of multimodal peaks. But what I really want to do is start with a histogram and do the reverse direction. And that's the thing I couldn't figure out how to do. And actually, I was at last, last year, I was talking to uh, people here at, at Montreal and saying, how does this work? I mean, is there, this must be a statistical technique here, and it probably has a name. I couldn't figure out what the name of the technique was, and I was talking to statisticians. And my dad is a retired statistics professor. I tried explaining it to him, and he went, yeah, I retired 30 years ago. I've forgotten all that stuff. So, um, so that didn't work. Um, but so then earlier this year, like in January or something, I was just, you know, Danny Burkholz was on Massive, and we were just chatting. And, and he knows R, and, I said, and he knows statistics. And I was asking him, I was trying to explain to him what I was trying to do. And then Ed Baraski, who I'd never heard of before, just pipes up and said, oh, that's called mixed methods. OK. And they sent me an R routine. And now I have all the stats. Yeah, great. Now I actually have, I know what I'm trying to do, so, which is a bit weird. All right. So this is what we're trying to do. Um, um, yeah. It's a maximum likelihood. Uh, method, um, expectation maximization of uh, finite mixed methods. And um, you don't need to know any of that, it's fine. <laughs> so, all right, so hopefully we're, everyone's either sort of got deer in the headlights look here, or is going, of course, that's the way you do it. Um, so then the question is, you're mixing these distributions. What is, the, what is mathematically, what are these distributions? Because that matters, and what, what, how do you put this together? So there was a really nice uh, blog post from like, 2017 or so by Bill Kaiser of New Relic. I, don't think, I think he's now retired out of New Relic, or he's not there anymore. But um, he was, I forget, CTO or, or something at, um, at New Relic at the time, or a distinguished engineer or something. And he was saying, well, what shape is this? Is it log? He's got a distribution. Is it log normal, or is it gamma, or whatever? And he was saying that it's really, um, but yeah. And then he had this multimodal distribution, it says, OK, you've got two modes here, and you can, but he didn't really show how to analyze it. So more coffee time. Um, what would you expect? Like under, you have to kind of go, well, a distribution is because of something underneath is happening. right? Um, if you have random arrivals, you're a telephone network, that's, you have gamma distributions, and this is sort of queuing theory leads rise to this type of distribution. If you have a normal distribution, the sort of symmetric thing that you see in sort of statistics textbooks that's easy to work with, that assumes you've got random adding and subtracting going on. Right? And it goes to minus negative and, and minus infinity and plus infinity, but response times obviously don't do that. You can't have negative response times. So actually, response times are always a one-sided distribution. And if you take the log of a normal, it's called a log normal, and Effectively, what you're saying is that the errors are adding or dividing. So it means that you're getting proportionately slower or proportionately faster on your response time. So this is, this is kind of why it makes sense to me. So let's say you've got a system and its CPU slows down for a bit. All the requests that come through it will be 20% slower for a while. Or they'll be 10% you know, faster or something like that. So it's like you're turning the speed knob up and down 
as the requests come through, and that's what's causing the distribution. Um, so what I'm basically saying is that if you, if you get a mixture of log normal distributions, all right, so, so this is the, and you know, there are no new ideas, just ideas that you, that, that you have. Somebody's probably already done this, I just haven't found them yet, right? But this is what I think I'm trying to produce, do that's vaguely new here. If you take response times and you take the logarithm of them, then you're turning everything from a log normal to a normal, right? And makes it's a nice symmetric thing. And then I can mix together a bunch of them, and this is nice and mathematically tractable. It's easier to do. All right, so what does that look like? So that's that spiky thing that I showed you at the beginning. The actual data was collected on, for this particular system, was connected using a high dynamic range histogram, which HDR histograms are really, really nice package that will collect histograms for you. The bins in the histogram double as they go up, right? So, so it, you're, you're, it's, it, it's, dub, it's sort of a, it's a logarithmic a histogram, right? The, the really fast bits are down sub microsecond or millisecond, but the really, the bins out here are like tens of milliseconds or seconds apart. And when you do that, you're effectively, when you just plot it as bins, you end up with effectively, you've got a log, a log normal uh, distribution. So when you just plot the histogram, you get this nice shape here. And I was staring at that saying, those look really symmetric and that looks like a normal to me. So I actually hand fitted a bunch of normal distributions to it, which is the plot on the right. Uh, and that sort of was my sort of starting point for this, was saying it looks like um, if you fit multiple distributions to it, it works. All right. So the statistical tools for doing this expect you to have the underlying data and to run it through that Greek algorithm thing that I showed you. Um, but quite often, you've got millions of data points happening. If you've got a really high throughput website, you've got millions of requests coming in, and you've just got the histogram. The underlying data is too much. All right. but, and even if you do have the underlying data, it turns out that the tools want to have a first guess at the peaks anyway for the, to for the algorithms to work. And I really only want a rough guess of the peaks. So in the end, I'm just ignoring all that Greek methodology and brute forcing the thing. So this is like, I was trying to find the real algorithm that would really do this for real. And in the end, I just brute forced it. Anyway, so I'm going to start with the, either a histogram with exponentially increasing bucket size, which is kind of what you'd find from HDR histogram, or a log file that's got timestamp, latency, and then hopefully a tag for what kind of query was going through it at that point, right? Just those three figures, and you just got a whole bunch of those. And then I can just take, make a histogram out of that. So I got some code, I wrote it in R, it's called SPEAK. So it takes this log of um, data, um, and log of latency, and it finds the peaks for it. There's a whole bunch of stuff here, but basically you see it's a function, you give it the histogram, you give it a timestamp, and then there's a bunch of other options. And I won't show you the code, it's about 100 and something lines of code, it's on GitHub. Um, and this is what it produces. So I, I gave it the thing. Basically, it says um, the peak latency on the right is the latency of each of the spikes in this thing. So there's something at two milliseconds, something at three, there's something at 477 at the bottom, um, and it's basically looking through the buckets and finding finding them. And what that looks like. Um, if you've got a calling pattern. So this, the, the thing about this is that what it does is it keeps subtracting out. It finds the top peak, it subtracts it out. Then it looks for the next one, subtracts it out. So it works when there's overlapping peaks. It's obviously clearly easy when you've got peaks that are nicely separated. You can just analyze them separately. But when they're all mashed together, you end up with a very wide peak. And so this is kind of what's happening here. So this is the, this comes from a system where there's lots and lots of calls going on that are roughly the same latency, so they're all combined together. So you've got a, very, a little bit of very quick stuff, a little gap, and this is rounded off to a millisecond, so there's a bunch of gaps in the distribution on the left. But if you look on the right, you can see a bunch of different colors. Each of those are the separate distributions I'm adding together. All right, so then the other thing is, okay, I can just do it for one system, but what I really want to do is look at how the peaks change over time. So I want to take chunks, say I've got a log file or I've got a series of histograms, I've got one every minute. How do I identify that this peak is the same as this peak is the same as this peak as I go across? So I've got some, some work to work on that. So I've got, as peaks will give me the individual processing, but I need to do some clustering. 
So I'm going to now look at, this is another system, this is a, a GraphQL front end, right? So you've got lots of different request types coming into this, and it's got three different clumps of data, of, of, of peaks you can see, and then there's this huge spike at the beginning because there's some kind of configuration thing, which is a super quick response. Um, and I, I figured I'd just like, I'd use my, I just filtered that out. So if we just forget about the sort of super quick thing, let's just, this is probably more of the real GraphQL stuff that's going on. So I've got a bunch of distributions here. So that's the response time on the left. In the middle you can see the histogram, and on the right you can see it fits really nicely, um, the three spikes in different colors and then some other residual bits and pieces. Um, and then that's for all of the traffic coming through all the GraphQL traffic, but basically I picked what's the most common actual business request, not configuration data, but something that actually does work for the business. So this is like the most common important business thing this does, and it turns out that that data has two spikes. Right, that's the distribution. There's a little, it's a spike on the left and then another spike. If you do it on the histogram, you can see there's two spikes and it fits. And if you, did, if you analyze this the normal way, you'd say, well, the minimum is eight, median's 40, the mean's 240, and I've got my percentiles, and I can analyze it like that. And nowhere in that data does it tell me I have two spikes and what the characteristic of those spikes are. All right, so I'm a bit theming here off of uh, Taylor Two Cities and the French Revolution, which is where it's set. So I have a guillotine algorithm, which is going to chop off the head of the log file in chunks. You give it a log file, and it takes, basically, it chops it up into one minute chunks, processes each chunk separately, and then tries to flow that across. So the two peaks that I actually have, um, once they're processed, so one of them, you know, minute by minute, for the, this is just the first five minutes of a 15 minute thing, it's about 18 milliseconds, that peak on the left. And the peak on the right is about 430 milliseconds. Right? Just for the same business request is hitting the system. Sometimes you get an 18 millisecond response, sometimes you get 430. You actually have no idea why. Maybe it's caching the results and some of the times you get the fast response. And, or, I don't know. But it's, got, it's very distinctively two different response times. And the thing is that what's actually going to happen over time is that the ratio of those two are going to move about. But, the, but when the system feels slow, it's not usually that the 18 milliseconds has suddenly become 25 milliseconds. What's actually happened is the proportion of the two has changed. Right? So what you're seeing over time is the height of those two spikes is changing. The position of them isn't changing. So this, if the position moves, it's probably because you, you know, did a code release and you changed the code path. Right? But a lot of the time it slows down because the ratios change. So here's sort of the same thing coming out of these chunks. There are 15 little plots like this. And then I find the spikes, and you can see, there we are. All right. So the leftmost spike is that position, that one on the left. And then the big spike's the one over there. And the bit that's hanging off around um, a bit slower is down there. So, this is a clustering algorithm. It basically it, it, it looks at all of the, the peaks and it says this is near enough to this. This must be the same one because the numbers aren't exactly the same. And you can see that the height of the data is moving up and down. The height of the peaks is moving up and down, but they're not moving side to side very much. Right? Over at least this fifth. The system I took this off was actually struggling a bit at the time. There were some issues going on and, and there was some variation happening. Um, so then, and I'm still working on, on this. If you've actually decomposed this, you can actually reverse engineer the actual percentiles over in any time frame by reconstructing the distributions. And I've, all, I've, I've been working on that code. I haven't quite finished that yet. But this is what it looks like over time. So if you look at those little dots on the left, um, this is that, the, the dots sort of moving around. And you can see you know, they're roughly the same. And then at some point towards the end, the, uh, the orange cluster drops and the um, blue cluster goes up at the same time. They sort of diverge. So the ratio of the two moved a bit towards the end of this time. All right. So what, what am I trying to teach you here? Um, first of all, that histograms are response times. I think they contain a lot of interesting structure um, that the, you should not ever treat response times. If you're processing anything to response times, 
it's really good to do the logarithms of them or use a, a log-based histogram. It'll give you, it's a much more tractable sort of value to work with. I think the peaks are interesting. And what I've seen from a number of different systems is that the modes, latencies tend to be stable and a lot of the variations we see in response time, our distribution, are, are um, the probability of each mode changing rather than the position of the mode. This is all on my GitHub account. Um, so, next steps. If anyone wants to help me play with this, like I say, I'm a free agent, I do whatever I feel like um, nowadays. So I'm happy, or if anyone wants to implement this, um, most of the code I wrote here was written with ChatGPT. I just like, how do I do this in R? And it's like, it gives me a page of code. Um, and if you want it in Python or something, just give the code to ChatGPT and say, yeah, I want this in Python, and it'll probably work. It seems to, it's, it's amazingly good at doing something. This is the free version of ChatGPT. I'm just throwing stuff into it. Um, so that's been pretty interesting. And then I've got the final quote. I started off with the opening quote of Tale of Two Cities and the final quote. It's a far, far better thing that I do than I've ever done. It's a far, far better risk API than I go to that I've ever known. I just had to add the, the letters API was the only thing I needed to modify in that quote. Um, all right, so that's what I've got. We've got a few minutes left. Um, if there's any questions or discussion, I'll be around the next few days. And I apologize for this being the first thing you had to sit through on a Monday morning. <laughs> but hopefully the sunsets made it OK. Any thoughts, questions? Got like five minutes or so. Uh, I think there were some questions out there. Yeah, go for it. Did you actually find out where the spikes were from? Did you know what the, where the spikes were from? Um, in this particular case, I haven't dug into it. I mean, I've got lots of data I've collected over the years, and I just keep throwing, going through random collections of data and, and trying them out. Um, the Primarily, it, it's, like I said, it's usually, if you've got two modes for the same request, it's usually a cache hit, cache miss situation. And it's your, it's your, you can reverse engineer a cache hit ratio out of that one way or another, right? Um, and it could be, you know, from a code point of view, it's sort of somewhere in the system, it, it's, it's, it's already got all the data. So those are the fast modes. And it usually has to go to disk or storage or something to with this, the slow mode. And that, that's a very common situation. Um, but yeah, and the thing that's encouraged me is pretty much all the data I've seen, it's really worked well for fitting those normal distributions, the log normal distributions, um, regardless of where the, where I've got the data from. I've tried a bunch of different systems. Um, this data I've shown you here is from three or four completely different systems. Um, and uh, it's, it seems to work reasonably well so far. Awesome. Any other questions out there? Anything for the top? It's kind of hard to see, so just wave your hand. Oh, I see one back there. Great. So have, have you applied this to like other data that's like time oriented or any other kinds of interesting data to this model that you built here, like build times in a CI environment? or other things and seen similar patterning or anything like that? So the question was, have you applied this to other data sets? If I summarized that right for yeah. the screen? Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't got data for that, but we're certainly happy to try it. Basically, anything that is modeling a response time that's going through a system that tends to speed up or slow down, right? That, that's, that's the model that, that I'm, I'm assuming here. So. Um, yeah, a CI system should probably do something like this too, right? But the thing, I mean, the thing about, we will see response times. Yeah, normally it takes eight milliseconds. Every now and again, it takes 20 seconds. Like, what the hell's going on? What's this long distribution thing? Well, there's some weird mode out there which just suddenly got a little bit more traffic to it. So one of the things um, that the code doesn't, it, it, it does identify these really long tail um, uh, peaks right now, but um, that sort of another area of investigation is see if we can just focus on these really, the, the way out there, like why is it suddenly you get, what is going on with the extremes? Like if you, if you trim all the data to the 95th percentile, you're actually ignoring the 5% the, the that's most interesting, which is like why did this really take forever? 
If you know why it took forever, you can quite often figure out how to sort of dramatically improve the response time of something. Because it's the long tails that cause the timeouts that screw everything up. So that's kind of the, the way I think about it. Great. Any other questions out there? All right. I don't see any. So if I'm missing you, yell at me. No? All right. All right. Time, time how about another round of applause, uh, applause for Adrian? Thank you. Exactly. So while we're waiting for our next speaker to come on up and get all plugged in, I uh, want to just remind everyone the Wi-Fi has been pretty good. It's thumbs up, thumbs down. That means no one's running their dockering things. So just be, be mindful of, uh, you know, not like spinning up your Kubernetes cluster here. Just wait. Wait until you're back at your hotel Wi-Fi. All righty, our next speaker is Adriana, who's going to be telling us about observability anti-patterns. And it's going to work? It is. Beautiful. All right, big round of applause for Adriana. Thank you so much. Um, well, welcome to observability anti-patterns. Before I get started, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Adriana Villela, and I am a senior developer advocate. Um, I love solving hard problems, whether it's part of my day job or on a rock wall, which is where you'll find me blowing off steam when I'm not at work. I'm also CNCF ambassador. I am a second year HashiCorp ambassador. I write a tech blog on Medium. I'm co-host of the On Call Me Maybe podcast. And I have been doing the computer things for about 30 years, if you count the fact that I learned how to code in basic at age 10, thanks to my dad. So I'm kind of old. Now, as I stand here before you, I can't help but be in awe over the fact that when I graduated university 20 plus years ago, told you I was old, um, we were at a time where we were starting to talk about surfing the web on our mobile phones, shout out to flip phones. Um, we were starting to move away from those little um, three and a half inch diskettes to USB flash drives. The Google search engine had been around for three years. Monoliths were king. Java was the hot new language and cloud, what cloud? Now, fast forward 20 plus years and our software has only gotten more and more complex. I mean, we are at the point where we rely on software for pretty much everything in our daily lives. I mean, even our cars are powered by software and our fridges are powered by software. This is bananas. So we are, we are dealing with increased complexity. And that means that back in the day, you know, we were dealing, when we were troubleshooting our systems, um, it was, relatively straightforward. I mean, it was still annoying and complex, but it was relatively straightforward compared to now. Now we're dealing with these and microservices that are interacting with each other, and there are thousands of microservices interacting in ways that are often unpredictable. We have no idea what's going on sometimes. And so we need a way to be able to understand what's going on behind the scenes, and that's where observability helps us out. Now, I'm super excited for that because um, you know, I am in the observability space and we are starting to see more and more organizations embrace this observability thing, which is awesome. But I also find myself in a situation where I've been in the space long enough to see that there have been a fair share of observability anti-patterns out there. And so today I'm here to talk about not one, not two, but six observability anti-patterns and what you can do within your organizations to try to avoid them to achieve observability greatness. Um, and this applies whether you're an individual contributor or a manager, it does not matter. You can do something to help out. But before we get started on that, I wanna set the ground rules with some terminology. So um, just very basic gloss over some terms so that we are all on equal footing. So of course, I'm gonna start with the definition of observability. There are tons of definitions of observability out there. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to use the definition um, that, that I feel 
best, um, best explains it, which is observability or O11 wire OLLI lets us understand the system from the outside by letting us ask questions without knowing the inner workings of the system. Now, what does that mean? It means that the system is emitting enough information so that you can follow the breadcrumbs to answer the question, why is this happening? But how does the system emit that information? With our other thing, or other term, open telemetry. Um, open telemetry is a vendor neutral framework. Um, how many people have heard of it? I'm sure it's like <laughs> pretty much a, a bunch of people. So open telemetry, vendor neutral, it, it emits um, uh, telemetry, um, it is used to ingest, um, transform, and export uh, telemetry data to an observability backend, which is the thing that renders that pretty data for you so that you can follow the breadcrumbs to answer the question, why is this happening? It's a CNCF project, all the major observability vendors are all in on it, so this has become the de facto standard. All right, next term that I'm going to review, service level indicators. Service level indicator, two-dimensional metric, answers the question, what should I be measuring and observing? And an example of an SLI is something like number of successful requests over total number of requests, or it can be something like number of requests completed in less than 10 milliseconds over total number, number of requests. And why do we need SLIs? Because we need them for SLOs or service level objectives, which are informed by SLIs, which is just a fancy way of saying they're built on SLIs, and they answer the question, what is the reliability goal of the service? So if we took our SLI example from earlier about number of successful requests over total number of requests, that's our success rate, we might want an SLO to be targeting, say, 95% success rate over a 28-day rolling period. So that's the basic terminology, so we're all on equal footing, and now we can start talking about those lovely anti-patterns, or what I like to refer to as high crimes against observability. <laughs> so, high crime number one is undervaluing the trace. Now before I get into this, I do want to establish the fact that, you know, the three signals that we know and love, traces, metrics, and logs, at the end of the day, all they are is events. Now they are all specialized events, so each one serves a specific purpose. My beef is when organizations put so much weight on either metrics or logs or a combination thereof and forget about our poor little friend, the trace. That's not to say that metrics and logs aren't important. After all, metrics are great because they gave us aggregation of, of values. So, for example, um, they're great for telling us things like CPU utilization, memory utilization, number of requests for a given service, the amount of time that it takes for a service to be executed. That's awesome, but it's aggregated data. So can we dig in further into that data? Not so much. So we don't know what's, what's happening in the greater scheme of things. Then we've got our friends' logs, which we all rely on at some point in our careers, right? I mean, I've gone into log files and looked at the various log messages, trying to find that little needle in the haystack. Oh yeah, this thing happened at this time. Logs are great. They tell us about the thing that happened at a particular point in time. But in relation to what? What are the things that led us to this point in time where we are seeing these things? And so, how do we make sense of it all? Well, if you're guessing traces, that's a pretty safe bet. Um, what I want to see is traces being made first class citizens in our observability world and metrics and logs being relegated to supporting actors. Again, it's not to say metrics and logs suck and are, in, are not important, that is not the case at all. I'm just saying, let's make them part of our overall narrative. Traces are key because they tell us the thing that is happening overall, from start to finish of your request. What happened end to end? What happened between services? What happened within a service? Traces can tell us. Then we can take our friend the metric and say, hey, if we have a way to correlate that to a trace, we have even more understanding of what's going on. Same thing with logs. If we're able to take our logs and correlate that to a trace, again, we are now starting to form the picture of the thing that is happening. All right, high crime number two, the wall O dashboards. This one's a little bit of nails on chalkboard for me. Now, 
as an example, I worked at an organization where I was reporting to the CTO and I was running an observability practices team and he goes to me, you know, your team should go and build dashboards and we should put them on these big monitors and mount them on the walls. And it's gonna be awesome because I did this at my previous organization and it was super, super successful. And I'm, I'm like standing there thinking, how do I tell this guy that this is a really terrible idea? Like this was useful maybe like 10 years ago, but we're living in this complex world of microservices. There's like a lot of really, you know, complex interactions. The Wallow dashboard simply will not do. I mean, yes, this was a common practice across the industry, right? Where you've got the dashboard, problem occurs. Let's check the dashboard. Let's do some querying. Oh, we found a new problem. Okay, let's schlep it onto the dashboard. Awesome. So now we're schlepping more things onto our dashboard and our dashboard is so cluttered with crap that we don't even know what's going on anymore. It's like information overload. And also, what are you gonna do? Like every time there's a problem, put it on the dashboard. I mean, we could predict every problem that there was out there. I certainly wouldn't be here. I'd be filthy, stinking rich. I wouldn't be talking here right now. So what would we do instead? Do we dashboard all the things? I say no. Instead, remember our friend, the SLO? Well, we create SLO-based alerts. So basically this means that we set a target. If that target is breached, we set off an alert. We correlate that target back to our observability data. So then now two things happen. One, we are told, hey, there is a problem. And two, now we can follow the breadcrumbs to answer the question, why is this happening? Much more convenient and we go from now trying to find a needle in a haystack to a much more directed search. All right. High crime number three, not instrumenting your own code. I'll go back to my previous role of managing this observability practices team and my CTO manager turns to me and says, so Adriana, um, you and your team, y'all have to instrument the application code for the developers. And I'm like, ah oh, crap gonna tell this guy again that the thing he's asking me to do is like absolutely ridiculous. What do I do? And the thing is though, it's like this is common practice. A lot of organizations, I hear so many stories across the board of organizations knowing, hey, I need to instrument my code, my house is on fire, this observability thing is gonna be worthwhile, but I ain't got time to instrument the code, so let's find some other team to like go instrument the code. And that is extremely problematic because say I'm, I'm instrumenting, I, I, I write the application code, all right? So I'm debugging my code. Um, as I'm debugging, I know the information that's important to me to debug my code, right? I know, I know what I need, I know what I'm missing, I know what I need to look at. And then say I go, hey you, why don't you instrument my code for me? You'd be like, okay, I can instrument something. Will it necessarily be the thing that I need you to instrument? Eh, possibly not. I mean, that's no better than me saying, you can write my code comments for me and you can write my unit tests for me. It makes zero sense. Now, it can be very daunting to instrument your code, especially if you're getting started with open telemetry, right? It's another thing that you have to learn. So there's a learning curve. On top of that, if you're still wanting to develop new features, um, you don't wanna stop doing that to put things on hold to instrument your code, but think of it this way. If your house is on fire, shouldn't you put down the tools and stop building the room that's burning? and instrument your damn code. I mean, this is basically the same thing. Um, it also means coming to the realization that, um, you know, I, I think the scariest thing of, of this whole thing is, is knowing that um, when you're having to instrument existing code, it basically means, oh, this is like new technical debt that I didn't even know I had. So it's like on top of the other technical debt. But, if, but this is a worthwhile exercise. So it is something that's worth doing, stopping, taking the time to do. Um, the other thing that's important when instrumenting your code is making sure 
that you identify the high touch areas. So if there's a particular service that keeps getting called over and over and over, perhaps that's a pretty good candidate for something that you'll want to instrument first. Or if you have any homegrown libraries or frameworks, again, instrument those because chances are you'll be touching, your code will probably be touching a bunch of these uh, over and over and over. And then finally, get into this lovely practice of observability-driven development, which is instrument your code as you work. And then that way, at least you're not leaving a trail of more technical debt as you write your code. You're taking care of the stuff, uh, of the instrumentation as you go along. Okay, next we have, oh, before, uh, before we go to the next uh, high crime of observability, I do want to leave you off with this lovely quote from on Call Me Maybe podcast um, guest, Liz Fong Jones, who does put it quite Great. perfectly. Open up software engineer, write your own damn tests, right? Like, so write your own damn comments, write your own damn observability uh, annotations, right? Like, this is what will help you understand your code later. Someone else writing it for you achieves like very little of the value. There you go, well said, Liz. Don't just take it from me. Um, all right, high crime number four, belief that observability tools equals observability. Now, think back to the DevOps movement when it was gaining steam, and how many organizations could you think of that would say, I have Jenkins, I am doing DevOps, yeah! And we're kind of seeing similar things happening in the observability space, where, hey, I'm instrumenting my code with open telemetry, and I'm sending it to an observability backend. Therefore, I have observability, mission accomplished. And of course, that is not true because observability is all about practices, just like DevOps. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that you need to do things like instrumenting your code as you go. When you're instrumenting your code, ask yourself the question, am I instrumenting enough? And I'm, am I instrumenting enough data? Because ultimately you want to be able to Follow the breadcrumbs to answer the question, why is this happening? If you're not following the right breadcrumbs, you can't act, answer the question, why is this happening? You need to um, also be able to, um, when you deploy your code to production, um, don't do what I call the deployment hit and run, which is, hey, the thing deployed successfully to production, mission accomplished, let's go home. Yeah. It, that's awesome, but that's not gonna cut it because when you deploy your code to production, something magical happens. Humans interact with your code and we act in really unpredictable ways. I mean, all the tests in the world cannot predict how, how like some human with a very strange use case will interact with your code. So don't just deploy your code and, and just leave it there. See how it is doing in production to make sure that it's doing the thing that it is doing. And finally, again, our friend, the SLO, make sure that you get into the practice of creating those SLO-based alerts so that if and when there is a problem, you've got the directed search so you can follow the breadcrumbs to answer the question, why is this happening? Next, we have what I call observability theater. So thinking back to our agile transformations and our DevOps transformations and our digital transformations, right? All worthy causes, right? These, these are all great transformations to be having, but a lot of the times you have these organizations doing these half-hearted attempts at implementing these transformations and it was all for show. It's all theater and and then they'll, they'll be like, huh, I wonder why that didn't work. And you know, it's, it's a failure, and then they'll call in the consultants to try to fix it for them. Um, we can't have that, I mean, and unfortunately we're seeing the same thing with observability. Again, it's theatrics, it's for show, we need to do away with that. So what do we do instead? Well, it's all about making sure that you advocate for observability within your organization. Observability is ultimately a paradigm shift, and so that means that you have to open your mind, be curious to 
allow it to permeate and, and really do its thing. So in order for observability to take hold in an organization, we need two things to happen. We need convergence from the top and we need convergence from the bottom. From the top, we need executives to actually buy into this observability thing, not just for show, but for realsies. Um, I'm part of the Open Telemetry and User Working Group, and recently we had somebody come in and talk to our user community about how they work in a company that really fosters an observability culture. And the wonderful thing about it is that um, there is directive from the executive saying, thou shalt do observability. And also, developers are the ones instrumenting their own code. Which means that if you have some disgruntled development team saying, eh, I don't have time to instrument my code, tough shit. It's <laughs> a mandate from the top, that's what's going on. So they can't go and try to circumvent this thing because that's been mandated. Now, that's one half of the puzzle because, yeah, it's great that it's mandated from the top, but if the people doing the thing don't want to do the thing, well, that's useless too. So we do need to have that grassroots movement of, of people who believe in the power of observability and have experienced it firsthand um, to advocate internally. And that means making friends who believe in observability um, internally and externally, bringing uh, use cases, right? Um, success stories from outside, success stories from inside. If you're trying to advocate for observability within your organization, nag your manager and nag and nag and nag them some more and do some POCs to prove that this thing actually works. So then when we have that convergence of top and bottom, um, then we have a good chance of having this wonderful observability culture where everybody will thrive. And finally, we come to high crime number six, not treating observability as a team sport. Now, I've noticed that a lot of organizations have this tendency of dumping observability concerns on one team. Typically, it seems to be that, you know, observability ends up being dumped on like an SRE team. But the fact of the matter is, it is a team sport. We have tons of teams working together to make it happen. And this starts earlier in the SDLC, as we saw earlier, right? When developers are instrumenting their code. Developers instrument their code, and it helps them troubleshoot their own code, but then when they hand it off to QA, the QAs now have this lovely instrumented code, and they, they, can, they can actually use that information and use observability to troubleshoot anything that occurs when they're doing their tests. So, so that if something goes wrong in the test, they can go to developers and say, hey, you know what? This thing is wrong and I can tell you why. Or if they're troubleshooting, they find a bug and they don't know why, they can say, hey developer, there's a problem, I don't know why. That's still a good thing because it tells the developers, hey, I'm actually missing some instrumentation, right? Again, it's about having that information so you can follow the breadcrumbs. So you're helping the developer. But we can take it one step further with the QAs because they can leverage those lovely traces, those trace the trace first approach observability driven development traces and they can actually take those traces and create integration tests from those traces and um, that is known as trace based testing and there are some awesome tools already out there that do that including trace tests helios and malibi so these things do exist and then finally we make it all the way over to our awesome sre who is the benefactor of all this lovely work so now the application's been deployed to prod. They're troubleshooting um, any potential issues in prod while well, the application has been instrumented. And so because it's been hopefully instrumented fairly well, they can follow those breadcrumbs to answer the question, why is this happening? Or if they realize, oh crap, I don't actually have enough information. No problem. Take that information, send it off to the developer and say, hey, you're missing some instrumentation. No problem, it's an iterative process. We can't get it right uh, perfectly the first time. And then finally, again, using that instrumented data so that they can create those lovely SLOs that are tied to observability data so that if something happens, they get that alert. Hey, there's a problem. Hey, this is where you look to go find it. So there you have it. Observability is a team sport and don't forget that. So in a nutshell, today we learned um, what not to do to 
achieve observability greatness. So we keep the following things in mind. First of all, we make traces, first class citizens with our supporting actors, the metrics and the logs. We say bye-bye to the Wallow dashboards and hello to SLO-based alerts. We encourage our developers to instrument their own code because they know the things that are actually important for instrumentation. We also uh, want to make sure that we treat observability as practices and not tools. Um, we say no to observability theater. And finally, we treat observability as a team sport. Now, before I conclude, I like to finish off my talks and my blog posts with cute pictures of my rats. I am a rat person. They're like little tiny dogs. This is my rat, Phoebe. Um, she is named after the Friends character. She is coming up on two years old, so she's like a little old lady rat, um, and she loves to burrow into little things. So that's Phoebe. Um, if you are interested in any of the topics that I discussed today, I have some lovely references. You can scan the QR codes to check these out. Um, I've got the article on observability anti-patterns that I wrote, which was the inspiration for this talk. I have a blog post, blog series on Medium about all of my explorations around observability, plus a couple of great book recommendations, Cloud Native Observability with Open Telemetry, and if you want to dig into SLOs, um, definitely recommend Alex Hidalgo's book on implementing service level objectives, and of course, open telemetry. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that I do not have the artistic talent to draw those amazing capybara images. Um, however, I do think I make a decent prompt engineer. So, you know, um, I do thank our evil AI overlords, uh, Dolly, for being able to generate those images. Um, please do follow the On Call Me Maybe podcast. If you scan this QR code, you can find us on all the socials. And finally, if you would like to connect, you can scan this QR code to follow me on all the socials. Until next time, peace, love, and code. Okay. All right, we've got a few minutes. We can uh, do some questions. Any questions from the audience? Uh, I see one right there. Okay, do you have a stopgap for S S L O alerts? Um, I do remember reading an article recently about, um, it was, uh, I think it was a company called Zolando and where they found themselves in that particular situation. And so they actually scaled back on the number of SLOs. I mean, I, I, I guess at the end of the day, like SLO creation is a very iterative process. And they, um, they found personally that they had too many SLOs. And so they scaled back on their SLOs to, to really uh, zero in on the ones that were most important to them. So that might be one approach to take around that. Awesome. Any other questions? I see one right over here. Oh yeah, of course. Was this the slide in question? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> not, not the rat picture. <laughs> awesome, any, any other questions? Oh, I see one over there. How do you deal with people who are obsessed with single panes of glass? <laughs> oh man, um, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, honestly, with 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 my um, with with my former boss, it was it was a constant fight. I won't lie; it was like it was extremely painful because he was like very like, "Hey, this worked. This worked at my previous organization. It's going to work here," and I'm like dude, just give it a chance here. Like, let's, I, I think part of it is like kind of um, wearing them down <laughs> and, and nagging them <laughs> to, uh, to, prove, to prove your point otherwise. But I, I think ultimately you do have to like be able to demonstrate that their way is not as ideal as the way that, you know, you want them to go into. 
Um, but I, I, I think there's, there's like no right answer because some people are just like very, very, very headstrong. So even, even getting like other people from other organizations who have done this and, and saying, presenting, hey, this person has done it this way. Why don't you listen to them if you don't believe me? I think those kinds of stories where you can share external stories can be very compelling. And I think a follow up. <laughs> and all the directors and all the VPs want to exert the health staff, all the rest of the lives, all the rest of the lives, are we free? Is that a bad thing that you've asked for? Do you just want a manager for you? Or is that also a compassionate thing you'd like to do to say to them, but you want to have the whole thing in the world? So my oversimplistic <laughs> summary of that one for the stream is, do you advocate for no dashboards or dot, dot, dot? <laughs> Um, I, I believe the ideal scenario would be like more dynamic dashboards. So you, you would have like a dashboard of your SLOs um, because the, the SLOs are based on like a metric and many dashboards are, are based on metrics. So using, I, I'd say using that as, a, that as a starting point, you can, um, I think you can hopefully appease the, the people who are like very dashboard happy. Oh, got a question up top. <laughs> if, <laughs> if my manager says all alerts have to point to a dashboard, how can I tell them that they don't know what they're talking about? I mean, start with, you don't know what you're talking about, but say, but say very politely. Very yeah, nicely. Very, very politely. I think, oops, did I just, I fiddled with my mic, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I think at the end of the day, um, the only way to make the compelling argument is to like show them with the way it ought to be, um, because otherwise you're just gonna keep having this argument in circles over and over and over. But I think part of it does have to start with saying no, because you know a, a lot of these executives don't like being told no. <laughs> they certainly don't like being told that they're wrong. Um, and I think it's part of our jobs to be able to say no. Um, my, my saying is always like, you're not doing your job well enough if you haven't pissed someone off at least once a day, so. <laughs> It's very true. Uh, all right, maybe time for one more question. Also, just a reminder to you that uh, for every speaker, there is a channel in the Slack that you can continue the conversation. Also, there's uh, the, the great breaks and whatnot that you can chat with other people. But let's see, was there one more question, I think? Maybe not. All right. Oh, wait, no, there is. Here we go. How do you shift from a log first to a trace first mentality? I love that question. I think again, it's one of those seeing is believing scenarios. Like you have to prove, um, like so at my uh, previous organization where I had the, uh, the very demanding CTO, um, being able to demonstrate that hey, um, like taking a POC, ta taking like either an existing application or, or a small application where you can instrument some of it and show, hey, look, this is what happens when we're going the trace first approach versus the just focus on logs approach, um, I think makes for a very compelling narrative because now you're showing to them, oh, this, this is how it can work. This is how it can benefit you. But again, like de being able to demonstrate, I think goes a long way. I will say it was the best use of the word schlep. Uh, and <laughs> if there is not yet an open source tool to move metrics and logs and traces from one place to another, it should be created and it should be called schlep. <laughs> All right, let's give a big round of applause for Adriana. Thank you. All right, so we're now entering into a break. There is some snacks in the main area. We're going to reconvene uh, at 11 o'clock for our next round of talks. Enjoy.
Alrighty, welcome back. Hopefully everyone got some of that popcorn. Was anyone surprised by the dill? We were talking about this in the back of, you don't want to be surprised by dill. You want to know there's dill in it beforehand. I did try it. I, it was weirdly delicious. So um, hope you got to try that one. All right, so we're going to kick off the last block of talks uh, for this morning before we break for lunch. Uh, we'll have a talk followed by a few of our wonderful sponsor talks. Make sure to take some time to go and check out all the great swag and the sponsors. They are upstairs and downstairs as well. Uh, but until then, we're going to kick it off with our next speaker. Uh, I'd like you all to give a big round of applause for Jack Neely. All right. Everybody hear me? Great. So let's get started. I am passionate about the mathematics that underlie some of the observability that we do. We don't just have noisy alerts and bad manager reports. We need to make real decisions about this data, so we need to be able to trust that we can make decisions about this data. So I want to take you through a little story of, of how I use the four golden signals to do just this. I'm a DevOps observability architect. It says so on the screen. It must be true. If you know what that is, will you come find me later? All right, so I get this question a lot as a DevOps observability architect. What do I monitor? Well, I tell them to monitor the four golden signals, except there are five golden signals. How many people that I work with, I, I coach, can't tell if the customer is actually getting a legitimate response from your application. There are five golden signals. There are five lights. Good, y'all got that one. So the conversation continues a lot like this. I bet you've had this conversation a billion times with your management and folks that you work with. You know, there are five golden signals. We need to know stuff before our customers do. But we've got special customers, Jack. Well, if we do our SLOs right and we chart the max, we're going to be able to tell who lands in the cracks and, and get our traces and debug that, right? But, you know, when a customer calls and we've got to be able to verify, and, of course, you start digging around and realizing um, yeah, customer ID stuff's not metrics. Where are your traces? What are your logs? Oh, it's a mess? Which always boils down to, yeah. So I want to take you on a journey of, of how we build that, how we get there. And I'm only partially joking about how you build that. So let's start with signal number one, traffic. We count things. Counters are amazing. If you don't understand the power of counters, here is the power of counters. The OpenTel data spec says it better than I will. Counters are accurate. They're incremented. Uh, in discrete units, so if you miss a scrape, if you miss data somehow, you can still put together what happened between the last scrape and this scrape. Counters are so fundamental, they are synchronization primitive. I should have put a paper there or something. They're cheap, easy to implement, and mathematically fundamental. They give us position. Why does every single router on the face of the planet count the number of bytes across the interface? Yep, wrong button. So again, counters are fundamental. We obviously know that we have position over time. We can take the first derivative of that, the rate. If you've used any of the solutions in the hallway up there, you know about taking the rate. This is the velocity. This is how fast you're moving, how fast you're serving HTTP requests. But you all remember physics, right? The second derivative is acceleration. So all of a sudden, you have cool things like peak detection. You can tell if you're speeding up or slowing down. All sorts of neat little tricks you can do with this. Keep this one in your hand, in your playbook. It's handy. So this is the scary PromQL slide I have. The thing about Prometheus is you can't aggregate counters. And think about it. If I had a counter for every person in this room of where you're located in the hall, how would I, I can't aggregate that together and make any sense of it. So what 
we usually do in Prometheus land is we aggregate the rate, how fast we're all moving, and we can add that together easily. So when I do SLO stuff, uh, seven day, 30 day SLOs, of course I'm gonna write a recording rule that aggregates my Prometheus data so I can make some fast dashboards and fast alerts. But again, I've gotta be able to build these SLO fast, these SLOs in a you know, reasonable time frame. So I use this Riemann sum technique which is I build a recording rule that runs every five minutes, looks at the last five minutes of data, makes that data point, and I can multiply that data point by 300, 300 seconds in five minutes, and I can build those columns that estimate the area under the curve, and I can get back an estimation of what that integral is, how many discrete events happen. And I can use that to, to build ratios and count things, and makes your SLO dashboards go fast. So that Riemann sum technique's handy. Um, your CPU metrics are wrong and I know why. When I first got to observability, oh the days, um, I found myself in a, in a situation where the tool we were using to measure CPU usage was counting jiffies. Now jiffies are the BOGO MIPS of Linux kernel process scheduling. When Hertz was set to 100, there were about 100 jiffies in a second. Now there's 1,000. Uh, but the keyword here is about. So our CPU metrics were often 104%, 92%. They were obviously wrong. So I went to fix the problem. I put in a new tool that gave us real percentages of our CPU. But it didn't feel right. It, the, the intuition wasn't there. It didn't seem to explain the behavior we were seeing. About that time I moved toward Prometheus. This was like in the 016 days, a long time ago. And Prometheus counts the number of seconds that a process spends on the CPU. In fact, it doesn't count it. It reads it out of proc because Linux has counted CPU usage this way since like the dawn of time. That is the only correct way to measure CPU usage. What I was doing is something much like this, explained by the Nyquist-Shannon theorem. And if you're doing any work with gauges where you're sampling things, you need to have this in mind. This is how CDs work. Who likes music? Yeah. So this theorem is how we can sample a signal and be able to accurately reproduce that analog signal. We have to sample that signal at twice or faster the frequency of the signal. Now this isn't quite twice as fast as the signal. Um, so what I was doing is I was actually reproducing an aliasing pattern from the CPU metrics that I was reading, not actually the real signal. CPUs run at what, three gigahertz? So you need to sample those at about six gigahertz to get an accurate result if you're using that technique. Good luck with that. Let's talk about non-normal distributions. Um, this is Anscombe's quartet. This blew my mind when I really understood it. These four distributions are obviously different. They have the same number of points. You can average the y's together. You can average the x's together, the same numbers. The standard deviation is the same. R squared is the same. Your correlation, correlation coefficient is the same. I graph the, the linear regression lines they're the same, um, but obviously those distributions are not the same. And again, this was created in the early 70s to show the importance of visualizing data, something we know well. But when we are working with specialty distributions, we tend to build up these summary statistics and we graph those summary statistics over time. So knowing what this shows us about that data how do we trust those graphs of our distributions over time on these simple summary statistics? We can't. Uh, drilling in further, this is my shout out to Jason. This is a really fantastic, I think it's fun, data set from uh, my old Graphite server. It tells you how fast my Graphite server is answering questions. Um, I've scaled this for density. You can see that 65% get answered really fast. I cut the graph off at eight seconds because it goes out to 29. Um, 
but is, can this be represented by a normal distribution? And you know, Adrian already answered that question. Um, so what I would usually do is slap a normal distribution on top and try to see, okay, the normal distribution is a density curve. The histogram is, is estimating a density curve. These both have the area of one under the curve. So if you integrate, you should always get one. Does it look like they take up the same space? Why is there so much negative space up there? The real humdinger of the matter is there's no way to fit 99.7% of the data within three standard deviations. It becomes obvious. Now, Adrian gets good credit because if you take the logarithm of this data, suddenly it becomes well behaved in their three modes and it's really interesting. Um, now, I know this rolls off the tip of your tongue, uh, but I think this is kind of handy to have in your tool bag, especially when you're doing some basic analysis. This reproduces the standard distribution curve and it's just kind of handy to have. And at this point, I should make a joke that we finally got to pi and circles in observability. But this is not the first time pi has been in this presentation. All right, are you saturated? So tracing, I love me some tracing. And I have this lovely problem of pipelines where your job one discovers data, does some stuff, sticks it on a queue, there's some queue time, job two picks it up, et cetera, et cetera. All the stages are written by different teams so no one talks to each other. Um, and it kind of looks like this. And the real important things that we want to get out of this is our freshness, our saturation, SLOs. What percent of our results are generated within the Y seconds? Uh, what percentage of our results have Y Q time or less? And that Q time is important. So you know, that kind of looks like a tracing diagram, doesn't it? So obviously, you know, you can just trace this like a microservice, right? Except sometimes jobs fan out, sometimes they fan in. So you've got results with the same trace ID. Um, there's no root span. The results never go back to where the jobs originated from. And really the kicker here is, is this pipeline usually takes minutes, except when it takes hours, except when it takes days, except when it takes weeks. Uh, so most solutions limit how long a trace can be, and especially without a root span to tell your tracing solution how to cut the trace. You, yeah, the, your tracing solution has cut your trace and you're still sending spans in. Um, so doing some research, digging into open telemetry, having telemetry for each unit you know, to pod level, so each job has its own trace ID, each job emits its own metrics, is the way to go. Um, there's also this lovely technique called span links, which allows you to reference an outside trace from another trace. So the open telemetry agent with Kafka queues will do this automatically for you. Um, job two will pick up the trace ID from job one and embed it. Um, but yeah, shout out if you use span links. <laughs> All right, I'm impressed, I'm impressed. They're really new. All the tools don't support them very well. If I want to put together interesting data about this, I've got to find the results, quarry back of the history. Did I account for sampling? Oh. Um, so really, Stop being cool for a moment and let's keep it simple. In fact, if we can generate some sort of schema, some sort of agreement between our teams, uh, we get the customer ID, we get the, the task ID that we're processing, we get when it was discovered and each stage in the process upends uh, start, stop, time, status and link to the trace ID. And when we have our uh, results, we have this lovely history of what happened that we can calculate all those SLO numbers on. And it's almost like magic. If we can see something is wrong, the trace IDs are there. So the only hard part is, is working with your teams here. But continuing that particular journey, because this is about our customers at this point, right? Um, <clears throat> so I want to generate those SLOs. That's the goal. Uh, 
but I'm getting this high velocity, pretty chunky log data at millions, billions of times a day. Um, so you're getting real uncomfortable with that logging bill and the person who's running your logging infrastructure is like, so how are you gonna roll that up? And of course, you know, naturally you might think of, well, we can roll up per customer, do some summary metrics, you know, at 15 minute intervals, right? But again, I want to be able to generate those SLOs. And what can you not do with pre-aggregated percentiles? Combine them to make more percentiles. So, being annoying, I figured I would go and do exactly that. Uh, when, I, when COVID was COVID, and we were all locked down, I was bored. And what, what did you do during COVID? Um, I studied T-Digest algorithms. Um, some of our friends in the hallway uh, use this instead of histograms. T-Digests are like a histogram, uh, but the buckets are completely dynamic. The buckets shift around. The buckets are actually weighted averages, so there are many distributions that represent the whole distribution. And they're based on a, uh, an equation like this, or similar, there's a family of these equations that allow for a, a steeper curve at Q of zero and steeper at Q of one, but flat around the median, Q of 0.5. That's the trick that allows this algorithm to allocate more smaller buckets in the extremes and fewer larger buckets in the center. This allows this algorithm to estimate percentiles within 1% in most cases. It's really quite powerful. So what I did is I took my 15 minute customer roll up data, since I have weighted averages, dumped them into a percentile or a T digest and tried to merge those T digests together and build a 24 hour SLO, right? Surprisingly, it wasn't horrible. 80% um, of my te test results are pretty good, 20% were really bad. Of course, the bad thing is you can't tell if you drew the short straw or not. Um, so, interesting results, but I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, and so are you. So we use a scientific method here, and when our, ob our observations don't match our predictions, you know, we can tune our hypothesis and try our experiments again. This is how we've learned and, and proven information for centuries. So I adjusted my hypothesis. What if instead of logging those 15 minute roll up summaries, T digests are serializable? What if I log 15 minute T digests for each customer? It takes up ish about the same space, reduces from the roll data quite significantly. So I rewrote my code and I made 15 minute T digest roll ups for each, each customer. Digest, I merged them back together to get my 24 hour SLO. And surprisingly, 95% of, uh, of those data points came out pretty close. Satisfactorily, I mean, they are estimates. 5% were a little questionable. And really, so much of my data looks like this. I've got several uh, observations at the beginning in the five minutes, 15 minute kind of range. And then I'll have an observation, this is logarithmic, that's four and a half days. Um, so I looked at the algorithms I was using and when I was look, uh, building the percentiles off of my raw data, I used the traditional method of you, you figure out where that 99th percentile bucket should be between two data points and you take the average and that's your 99th percentile. Well, that's just one way of calculating a percentile. In fact, if you look up in the documentation of R, um, R has nine different ways to interpolate your 99th quantile or any quantile. Um, so really, my laptop has died. Oh, it wants me to log in again. So in fact, if I can if I can produce a number estimate for my 99th quantile that is somewhere between the three orders of magnitude I have between my uh, last point and the penultimate point, I've got a pretty good estimate. And 
that may not be, you know, within 100%, but there's three orders of magnitude there. So really, I thought that was halfway decent. Live, laptop, live. <laughs> so, <clears throat> glad you liked that performance. <laughs> so the things I want to leave you with, Adrian was right, average is a lie. Don't trust an average. We can use our heads when we roll up data. Don't just store random summary statistics. Use your brain. What do you want to do with that data? There are smarter algorithms we can use to effectively roll up data and estimate percentiles and build SLOs on them. Now, what I demonstrated I wouldn't use for billing data, but for good observability, um, always remember, there are five lights Use quantiles. Remember that we are data engineers of, of the new generation. We are the data scientists, the engineers of our times. Without good observability, we can't have good data science. Without good data science, we can't have good AI. So all of that comes back to be, being able to, to gather and understand good telemetry from your applications. Left my clicker. So, that's the end. I am Jack Neely, me and my friend's podcast at operations.fm. I'm sorry I don't have a fancy little code for you. The real title of this talk is Finding Pi and Observability. And I will be around on Slack and here all week. So if you want to come find me and ask questions, please do. I love good questions. All right, Pete. Wow, where were you? You were a little quick on the, quick on the trigger there. Apparently, uh, yeah, sorry about that. I will say, did you type your password incorrectly on the first try in front of a live audience? Yes. That's. I was stressed out for you. On this you keyboard. <laughs> uh, awesome. Are there any questions from the audience here? Can't see anything at the top. Nothing? No. There's one over here. Oh. I'm not even looking, obviously. There's multiples over here. All right, let's go all, yeah, all the way to the whatever your, you. Yeah. <laughs> Stage something. <laughs> For the uh, stream, it's how many characters are your password? I'm going to have to change that now, aren't I? Don't you have touch ID on that? Maybe. <laughs> I hate next, that. Next, next question. Why does the world think there are four golden signals? Was that the? Um, we need to review that Star Trek um, episode, The Chain of Command. <laughs> um, what I tend to see that I forget and other people forget is when they're developing their observability strategy, using some of these, more, some of these what they would believe as advanced techniques we think are pretty basic. Um, but synthetics are important knowing that your, your customers are actually getting a legitimate response is important. Um, so that's one thing I've stressed with the, the, a lot of the clients I've had recently is, is you know, not only do we want to do SLO-based alerting, but you also want to make sure that the customer is actually getting something. All right, you can see people, I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> doing the other part of my job, which is wrangling people while you're, you mm -hmm. know, entertaining the audience. Uh, awesome. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, we got one right here. What's the best way to determine if your customer is getting something real? What's the best way to determine if your customer is getting, getting something, something real? real? What is real, man? <laughs> is, isn't all of this, you know, a delusion of our own brains? 
we're, we're going to go, we're going to go deep here. Um, and to answer your question, um, I use synthetic user testing uh, a lot, um, which I is one of the services I really like to outsource because I want to be able to, to, to synthesize, to emulate my users. And if, you know, if I'm supposed to be serving um, content into India, I want to have a synthetic customer in India hitting my APIs, walking down my website, making sure that we get valid results in valid times. And not only does that start to, to fill out some of my SLO-based metrics, but it, it makes sure that there's legitimate traffic. Um, the, the great thing about having SLO metrics is if there's no traffic at all, there's not a lot of data to alert on. All righty. Who's next? Any other questions? From somewhere. There we go. Uh, the question here, I'm going to repeat just so all the sponsors hear it. Uh, some synthetic <laughs> vendors, I feel like I'm monitoring them more than the other way around. I mean, to be fair, it's not a slam. It's that web browsers are unreliable. They're heavy. They come and they go. They start from an ephemeral. It's just they start slow. It's just the common It's true. <laughs> I. <laughs> it's true. Thanks for coming in. <laughs> So how do you measure the health of something when you don't trust the thing giving you the numbers? It's like, how do you monitor the monitors is, is the basic question. I mean, if you, I do a lot of Prometheus-based monitoring. You know, how do I monitor Prometheus? Well, with other Prometheuses. <laughs> um, depend, and it depends on the architecture we use. Um, where I am currently, we have many very separate um, architectures that stand completely alone in their own VPC, it's their own world. So I can safely have one kind of monitor the other um, to do some, some safety checking of my stuff. Um, I use a observ observable observability cluster to kind of monitor most of what's in, say, the North America region. Um, and that's how I make sure that that the observability cluster can reach the observability tools on each cluster. And I do some similar stuff with um, the vendor I use for uh, doing synthetics. I monitor them like I do any other service. Uh, was there any other questions? Can't actually see anything. <laughs> All right, let's do another round of applause for Jack. All right. Alrighty, Monitorama exists because of all the amazing sponsors that uh, kindly give their time and more importantly, their money to be here and share their awesome products with you. So uh, we're gonna hear from three of them right now. And oh man, that works so well. For those that don't know, I'm gonna take a little sidebar. I rage about Google Sheets and it's terrible usage of speaker notes and full screening thing. It only happens if you have speaker notes. Last year, some very kind person, when I was raging on it, actually DM'd me and said, oh, you know, let me know, we'll try to fix it. And then I totally mailed it in, I never followed up with it. So if you were that person, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry I yelled at the Google person about terrible Google Sheets. <laughs> All right, our first sponsor talk is uh, Rob from Chronosphere. Awesome. All right, yeah, thanks a lot, Pete. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm Robert Chronosphere. Um, I'm the CTO there. Uh, prior to that, <clears throat> I started M3DB at Uber with a few other engineers. Um, been doing uh, monitoring since uh, the Microsoft days, uh, my Microsoft days rather, at Office 365. Um, and uh, I think some of the questions around, you know, uh, telemetry quality and how much it can be trusted is, is definitely um, always top of mind for me as well. So very, very pertinent. Um, and this kind of, uh, you know, what I wanted to talk to you uh, right now was around essentially uh, how can you unlock some of these um, use cases that essentially are, are really important to, you know, our uh, time to triage and time to remediate. 
Um, and honestly, the biggest common problem we have around is not just data quality of the telemetry and the metrics and how much they can be trusted, but is also, uh, you know, where can we spend it? So picture this, you know, you have a, a few code paths that uh, essentially experience errors um, being surfaced by a new feature or behavior uh, just a si in just a subset of the client application. Of course, the, you know, the devil on your shoulder tells you, well, uh, wouldn't it be great if we had the client applications get revision, um, whether that's you know, mob a web app or a mobile app, so we could work out which code paths are actually leading to these errors. Um, you know, the angel on your shoulder steps in and says, well, you can't just throw in a label, uh, throw in label after label onto this thing, um, especially those with values that you know, have a significantly high population. Uh, that's how you blow up cardinality and uh, ruin the SRE team's day and uh, you know, start ch essentially making the rest of your organization pay for a huge bill on, uh, on your observability spend. Um, this is a common scenario, but you know, why did uh, cardinality get such a bad uh, reputation and is it deserved? Um, because it can make a big difference uh, when we're debugging and experiencing and triaging um, issues like this uh, when we operate our software. You know, the, obviously the backdrop to this is cloud native data growth. Uh, volume and cost of operating uh, observability data grew disproportionately during the shift from long running VMs to ephemeral containers. Um, and that hasn't really delivered any deeper or better insight, but um, has increased costs. And you can see here with, uh, with metrics uh, especially, um, you can very quickly get to millions of time series uh, very quickly. Uh, and this is just, and for instance, this use case is looking at a single uh, latency metric, which is essentially, you know, um, per endpoint uh, latency broken down by type of error or, um, you know, or success. And essentially, you have 50 apps, 20 pods per app, um, 20 HTTP endpoints, gRPCs perhaps per service, um, five common status codes, and uh, a whole bunch of histogram buckets. Um, so that, you know, in the that simply adds up very quickly to millions of time series, uh, three million in this case. And wouldn't it be nice to essentially add uh, the client app version um, or perhaps the origin of the request by region. So suddenly you're now at like 30 million or 300 million if you keep multiplying these. Um, so, you know, why, why, uh, what can we do here? We can take away some of these attributes that you don't need for latency. Um, for instance, like latency across a huge subset of the the dimension space um, usually doesn't require per container if, if there's a specific code path that's experienced across all the pods. Um, so it is true that cloud native systems generate an ungodly amount of uh, telemetry. It's not true that high cardinality data has no place in observability. We believe in spending cardinality where it counts on your workflows, solving real engineering challenges, not wasting your effort on unutilized metrics, labels, and continually adjusting telemetry by hand um, to roll back telemetry changes which seems to always be on Friday when everyone's trying to get their feature out, obviously. Um, thank you. So, uh, you know, with the metrics analyzer and what we think of as a data observability optimization um, practice, uh, you can get a much clearer view into determining the cost of value of your telemetry. Um, this lets you do something about it immediately without any code changes, immediately benefit by creating entire aggregation policies to solve classes of common problems unlike per metric name aggregation rules like other tools out there have. So here, you know, these tools let you see, break down what's being used, where it's being used, what dashboards, what alerts, um, and whether people are exploring that data in the Explorer. Um, so this lets you know what, what you can do about this data. Um, and so we want to get you to a place where you can spend on the uh, cardinality that matters. Um, thanks a lot for your time. All right, thank you, Chronosphere. All right, next up. Next up, we're going to hear from Safe, from Axiom, or, uh, Rand, how, how's it pronounced? Axiom. It's just Axiom, yeah. I always have to ask if what's the correct pronunciation of company names just because uh, I'm terrible at pronouncing pretty much everything, so. Just a moment. This one is actually not using Google Sheets, so I can't get irrationally upset about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. How do I, yeah. Nope. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're, uh, they'll flip it over. Yep, there we go. Yeah. Just need to make sure this happens. And 
goes here. There we go. And I can do the other side. There we go. Looks good. I'm trying to get my mouse back. <laughs> ah, sweet. Good. All right, here we go. Here's Axiom. So hey everybody, my name is Safe. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Axiom. My co-founder Neil thought it would be a good idea that I do this presentation. I know where he is, but dude, what the hell? <laughs> You've known me for 15 years. And he thought that's a good idea. And he actually sent Kendall here just to make sure I don't go off script, so I'm sorry, Kendall. <laughs> so yeah, uh, basically, dude, this is his advice, and I don't think I will stick to any of them. I'll try, but it's really hard for somebody like me to do any of these things. Again, it says more about Neil than it says about me. So yeah, let's get to the boring stuff uh, so he doesn't lose his shit. What is Axiom? Axiom is logging reinvented. We built a time series data store from scratch, which means no Athena, no ClickHouse, and no Elastic. See, I mentioned Elastic the first time now. We have streaming, search, dashboards, and monitors. I won't demo it to you because if you have seen one, you've seen them all. So just come over to our booth later and see it for yourself. We believe petabyte is the new terabyte and we're working our way there. We were architected from the ground up for efficiency, scale, and performance. Thanks to Neil's thriftiness, he made me develop a te and test against a $10 digital ocean instance for two years. Today, we allow you to ingest one terabyte of data for $25 a month with 95, data re 95 days re retention. You can scale this up to 50 terabytes a month without having to talk to us. Just sign up and go crazy. Now the fun stuff. So let me tell you how we got here. Before Axiom, we were building a crash analytics platform called Xamarin Insights that received billions of events a day. And let me tell you, we broke every time series database out there. Against our better judgment, we landed on Elasticsearch and Azure. For those who don't know, back in 2014, Linux VMs on Azure would suffer from a problem that if you used 100% of the CPU, the hypervisor would decide to take away your network. <laughs> you can see how that was a problem for a multi-node open source Elasticsearch cluster. <laughs> we then moved from Azure to AWS, and as our service got bigger, we realized Azure was, wasn't solely uh, to blame for everything. Elasticsearch green status was a myth. You only saw it the first time you spun up the cluster. So in building Axiom, we decided to make ingest coordination free and separate out storage and search. This allows each component to scale individually and makes our data store more robust. Here's my favorite part. We did all of this without Kafka. Why? Well, it's expensive and maintaining it is as depressing as reading the collective work of the author. <laughs> the result of all these decisions is you can send more data per dollar, avoiding the need to sample. You can store it for longer than you've ever been able to store it before. And query whenever you want. No cold, no archive, no warehouse. All the data is hot. So now story time. That's the, there's a story about Alibaba and a bracelet to save my relationship. It didn't save my relationship. Um, again, I'm going against Steve's advice here. Uh, and it wasn't a bracelet as much as it was a shock collar. <laughs> we're back in those Xamarin years and uh, we're maintaining the Elasticsearch cluster that does not want to live. And you know the deal, being on call means everyone uh, in the household is uh, suffering with you. Early mor mornings, uh, you're on call over and over again, just, yeah, miserable times. And it doesn't help that I'm a deep sleeper, so alerts need to be very loud. You see where this is going, right? And when your partner threatens to leave you several times, you have to do something. My move, I went to Alibaba and bought a shock collar that, you know, it was a, I used it as a bracelet. It would discharge the entirety of the battery on every alert. While my teammate would show up to the call dazed and confused, 3 a.m. in the morning, I was 100% lit. I was there <laughs> on top of things. The advantage, that, well, that was the only advantage, really. The downside was I continued to feel aftershocks for the next 30 minutes. I couldn't type and developed a taste, and developed a new kink. We are no longer, well, me and my partner were no longer together anymore, and uh, I blame Elasticsearch for that. <laughs> Axiom exists 
because we don't want anyone else to go through the sa same pain, we want you to lead a healthy relationship with your partners. Axiom's architecture means we do stay green all the time, so when you get alerts, you know it's actually serious. If you want to learn more about Axiom or a link to the shock collar, come say hi. <laughs> Awesome, thank you, Axiom. All right, well, our next speaker is getting ready to go. Just want to remind everyone that uh, these sponsors, or many of them, if not all of them, I don't remember the specifics, are all hosting various parties on Tuesday night. There's a Slack channel called Tuesday Night Lights, maybe? I don't know, I'm really, I'm really bad at this. I don't know anything, basically. But go into that channel. Uh, there's a bunch of different parties that are going on, and uh, obviously they would love to have you at all of them. All right, our next speaker is, who is it up? Great. The next speaker is Michael from Honeycomb. Hello. So, yeah, I'm Michael Sickles. I'm one of our staff solutions architects here at honeycomb.io. Uh, I hate slides and presentations, so you get one today from me. The rest is going to be a demo. Uh, honeycomb.io, for those who are unaware, is an observability company. So we help understand your applications and where the problems might be. And I'm going to really focus today on SLOs, or service level objectives. So SLOs are the real way to like measure this user experience. For example, I don't know if there's any pizza lovers here, but if you were to go online and try to order a pizza, you probably have an expectation of waiting if you try to add one of those pizzas to your cart. And if it doesn't load in time or you get an error, you're hopping somewhere else. And so we need to measure that experience. And SLOs is a great way to do that. You could do something like, my response time is less than five seconds, or not error. Here is Honeycomb's live dog food system. So this is monitoring our own production systems. I have this SLI here, OTLP error. So we take in tracing data from open telemetry. All this is saying is when we take in a trace, it shouldn't err. That's how we're measuring success. However, and this is going to be a little bit of a hot take here, we need to be able to go fine level like control on how we measure that success. And so you should be using the raw, actual, real user events to measure these SLOs, such that you'll see in there, I'm ignoring a couple of errors that really aren't relevant. For example, uh, I'm not gonna penalize us if it's their fault. Uh, I'm not gonna penalize us if they're sending too many columns to their data sets, or uh, if they're being rate limited, right? Now with this SLO, no one has a perfect system. So I'm gonna set this expectation. In this case, we have four nines over the past 30 days. You get this nice thing called an air budget. And you can see we we're doing pretty good. Something bad happened. And now we're getting this constant burn. We're doing good. We're still above our yellow target line. We're still beating four nines. But now, because I use these raw events, I can start asking more complex questions. If you wake up in the middle of the night, you're probably asking, why is my SLO burning? Who is affected? And so if I go down here, we're gonna analyze all the attributes on this tracing data. And this is real world, this is happening right now. It seems like most of the errors is environment has reached the maximum number of data sets allowed. Now that's kind of interesting. I know that error. What's even more interesting, and I gotta be careful because this is production, so I gotta be careful where I hover. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You'll see on there app.team ID. One big yellow bar, lots of little blue bars. One team is the majority of all these errors. Not only that, we have this great attribute pricing plan. You can see there, they're a free team. This error, they are getting an email for this. <laughs> However, this is causing us burn. So maybe we should proactively reach out to this one team and I'm gonna to talk to our CS team to maybe do that. In reality, this is an instrumentation problem. You'll see here app.drop, our fault, intentional. Honestly, this isn't our fault, this is their fault. This free team is reaching a documented uh, limit of data sets for our, a given environment. We can change that, uh, but this really shouldn't hurt our SLO. So if I update our instrumentation to say that this is their fault, it'll no longer hurt us. But because I went and had these raw events, because I have this really wide high cardinality event, without jumping anywhere, I was able to understand so much of the problem just in one place. 
If you want to learn more about Honeycomb, come visit our booth. We can go on to the next step of actually debugging like more errors and using tracing. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Honeycomb. All right, well, our next speaker is getting ready. Uh, we were talking backstage, and um, you know, he actually flew in uh, earlier, but his flight from London is about 10 hours. And I'm kind of curious uh, if we can figure out who actually had the longest, now barring any sort of flight delays, but of like just pure flying time. Did anyone fly over 10 hours to get here? Who over 12? Anyone over 12? Where did you come from? Which way is that? Slovenia. Slovenia, okay. What is that flight? 14? Yeah, I think. Whew. Incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. Amazing to hear. And then where'd you fly in from? Portugal. Portugal. Oh, awesome. Love it there. Love tin fish. Anything. You put fish in a can, and I'm a happy person. <laughs> All right. Let's give a big round of applause for our next speaker, Dylan. Um, so this is my first monorama. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, apologies about my uh, voice, if my voice is a little bit crackly. Um, I run a four-person startup, and apparently this is just what I sound like all the time now. Um, I'm here to speak about unknown unknowns and how to know them. Um, as I said, my name is Dylan. Uh, I run a company called Overmind. Previously, I was a professional services engineer at Puppet for a long time, so I know Portland quite well. Um, but Firstly, I want to start with the story of how a printer made me quit my job. So while I was a consultant at Puppet, I was working for a company that will remain nameless. Um, and the gig was going really, really well, but we wanted to get a big win before I left. And at the time, every server had the same root password. This is this, yeah, I know. This is the sort of uh, arcane knowledge that gets passed down to you on your first day in the operations team and you're told never to tell anyone because it's never been changed and it's never going to be changed. <laughs> and, uh, and so we wanted to deploy triple SD, which would mean that users could log in with their actual username and password and they could have it revoked when they left the company and all kinds of very nice stuff. And so the plan was to deploy Triple SD to all of production on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now, I know this is a bad idea now. <laughs> and I knew it was a bad idea at the time. But we had done all of the preparation that we reasonably could. We'd followed all the processes. We deployed it in the dev test environment. And we had all of the approvals. Theoretically, we were ready to go. It was the last day of the engagement, so we decided that we're just going to do it. And so we did. And we deployed the change, and we watched the results come in, and they were coming back green, green, green. And so we tried to log in using the old root password, and it still let us in, so we haven't locked anyone out. And then we tried to log in using our new usernames and passwords, and that let us in as well. And at this point, we're kind of done. All we need to do is just sit back and wait for all the rest of the results to come in, uh, and then go to the pub. And we were about T minus 90 minutes from going to the pub at this point. At T minus 45 minutes, the phone rang. And somebody said, hey, I can't save PDFs anymore. Nobody on the team can save PDFs, and we're at a complete standstill because nobody can save PDFs. And I sort of thought, what? How could we possibly have broken the ability to save PDFs? We were touching the back-end Linux fleet. We didn't touch any Windows, anything, certainly not any laptops. But by the same token, nobody else would have been stupid enough to do a deployment at 4 p.m. on a Friday. <laughs> so it probably was us. And so I asked a few more questions, and it turns out they're not clicking file, save as PDF, save. They're clicking file, print. And they get a print dialog with a list of printers, which are mostly physical printers in the office, with the exception of one called PDF printer. And we've broken this thing, whatever it is. So now we had to work out what it was. Um, we started with the easiest thing, which was ask around. We asked the team, and they'd been there for a while, and nobody had heard of the thing. Nobody knew what it was. 
But they had a wiki. And in the wiki, they documented all of the stuff that they were responsible for and all the processes for it and how to upgrade it and stuff like that. And it's not in the wiki. <laughs> but they have a CMDB and everything is in the CMDB because it has to be in the CMDB. All of their servers, all of the stuff, and it's not in the CMDB. And so at this point, we're sort of running out of ideas. Uh, thankfully, we know the IP address of this printer. And so we SSH to it, and we get a blinking prompt that says password. And we type in the root password that's been the same for 10 years. And thankfully, it let us in. Uh, and so what followed then was a particularly complicated session of infrastructure paleontology, which sort of much like regular paleontology is a hell of a lot more boring and tedious than Indiana Jones makes it look. Um, but eventually we worked out how the bones of this thing fit together when it was alive. And it turns out that about 10 years ago, somebody bought a physical server and put it in the data center. And its job is to pretend to be a printer. And when somebody prints to it, it uses like cups and it saves that to a PDF and then runs a script and the script picks up the PDF and moves the file to a mount point. The mount point's on a NAS and the NAS is, is on their laptops. And so to the user, it looks like they've saved a PDF to their laptop, but actually it's done this horrible dance all the way around the network <laughs> and back again. And we've broken this somehow. Turns out, we had to then work out how to fix it. Turns out the fix is pretty easy. Um, all we had to do was change a few thousand permissions on the network share, <laughs> which is easy to do, but not so easy to decide to do. Um, but at this point, everybody had already gone home. Um, we tried quite hard to work out whether anything else depended on the network share being set up with the permissions that it had. And given that we could barely work out that the thing existed in the first place, we really had absolutely no chance of working that out other than just doing it. Um, and so since everybody had gone home, we just did it. Uh, and it was fine, amazingly. Everything was fine. It fixed the, the, the PDF printing. People could save their PDFs again. Nothing else broke. Um, and so... Everything was okay, except for the fact that the entire department had gone home early without getting done all of the stuff they needed to get done before the weekend. So, not fine. But we did make it to the pub. Um, and at the pub, we were discussing, all right, that wasn't brilliant. Uh, how could we have done better there? And I really don't think that we would have thought to test for that beforehand. In fact, if future Dylan had come from the future and said, hey Dylan, you should check to see if there's anything pretending to be a printer and saving things as PDFs and running a script. I would have said, that's so dumb that if I was to check for that, I would have to check for every other possible thing under the sun and I'd never get any work done. So we wouldn't have checked for it. There was no way to test for it. There was no dev environment for this, amazingly. Uh, and so all we could really have hoped to do was pick it up before the users did and fix it before the whole team went home. Um, this is a really good example of an unknown unknown, something that we didn't know that we didn't know. This particular situation is so esoteric that it will hopefully never happen to anybody ever again, but it's in a class of really esoteric problems that are actually very, very common. And so I realized that in general, our industry is not super good at dealing with these sorts of really, really esoteric problems. Uh, and I thought that I had a way to fix it. And so I quit my job um, and I started Overmind and started working on it full time. Before I can talk about any sort of solution though, I've got to give a bit more background on the problem. Firstly, mental models. A mental model is what allows us to predict the, what the outputs of a system will be for a given set of inputs. For example, I have a mental model on how driving a car works. I know that if I press the accelerator, it speeds up. If I press the brake, it slows down. Now, I didn't develop that mental model by taking the entire car apart and looking at every single one of the pieces and then predicting how they would interact. I learned that by just driving a car. And the mental models of our applications and systems are often built like this too, from experience in operating them 
rather than from first principles. And just like no amount of driving a car makes you a mechanic, these mental models that are built from experience don't prepare us properly for when things go wrong. Um, Wood's theorem states that as the complexity of a system increases, the accuracy of any single agent's own mental model of that system decreases rapidly. Uh, Woods himself actually conducted a workshop that delved into a number of outages and the role that mental models played. Um, I thoroughly recommend reading the report. It's called the Stella Report, S-T-E-L-L-A. If you Google that, you'll find it. Um, it. It's a really interesting read. But what they came across that was common in all outages was, and I'm going to read these because they're important, in all cases, each anomaly arose from unanticipated, unappreciated interactions between system components. There was no root cause. Anomalies arose from multiple latent factors which combined to cause a problem. The vulnerabilities themselves were present for weeks or months before they played a part in the evolution of the anomaly. They were acted by, activated by specific events, conditions, or situations, and the activators were minor events slightly uh, near nominal operating conditions are only slightly off normal situations. And in all of these cases, the outage caused what he called fundamental surprise, which is where the situation refutes your most basic beliefs about how the system works and forces you to rebuild your mental model to take these things into account. These are the unknown unknowns. And I don't think that this is a coincidence. I think that outages will always happen at the edge of your mental model with the things that you don't know that you don't know. Because if you knew about it, you wouldn't have got yourself into that situation in the first place. You would have coded around it or you've had an alert or whatever. Even if you only know that you don't know something about a system, that is a, a known unknown. If I know that I don't know how this new version of Kubernetes will play with my application, I can prepare for that. I can do a deployment in test. I can read the documentation. And I can move it into the known knowns section. But doesn't that sort of mean that it, by definition, can't be solved? Because these are things that we don't know we don't know, and therefore we can't prepare for them, because otherwise they'd be known unknowns. Um, and actually, it's a little bit worse than that. As we improve our mental models of our systems, we move more of the simple ways that it can fail into the known known section, which leaves only the complex ways. So by improving our understanding of our systems, we're actually making outages more complex. To our credit, we are probably making them less frequent, but they are almost certainly going to be more complex because they're always going to be something you didn't anticipate. And this isn't even the worst part because management have not got wind of it yet. <laughs> and when they do, they do this. Yeah. So <laughs> we know that the outages were caused by unknown unknowns. But, but you've got to think about how that must look to management. We followed all the process and something still went wrong. Therefore, we must need more process. More process. <laughs> and so that's what you do. You add some process to try and avoid the problem in the future. And that increases the lead time for changes. Um, compared to high performing companies, low performing companies that participate heavily in risk management theater have on average a 440 times longer lead time than their high performing counterparts. That longer lead time leads to a lower deployment frequency. A lower deployment frequency means that every change needs to be 46 times bigger if they're going to keep up with the high-performing companies. Now, spoiler, they don't keep up, but the changes are bigger nonetheless. Larger changes and less practice in doing them means that they're five times more likely to fail, and all of the above means that when things do go wrong, they go wrong in a big way and take 96 times longer to recover from. And this is the real demon here. This, remember, the thing that started this was a big outage, and we added some more process to avoid it, and of course, the result of this process is another big outage. It's a feedback cycle that feeds back on itself and causes organizations to grind to a halt by adding more and more and more process to try to stop 
things that may never happen again. You can imagine if I was to go back to this company with the, with the PDF printer and do a production deployment, there's probably a step where before you do a production deployment, you print a test page on all of the printers and then you do a production deployment and then you print a test page again and nobody knows why we do that but it's part of what we do and obviously it helped once and it didn't but <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm, I'm judging by the reaction, but uh, I want to I hear. Has anyone uh, worked somewhere that's been affected by this? I see like a wave of hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah I thought so. Good. Um, these numbers, by the way, are from the Puppet State of DevOps report in 2017 when it focused specifically on risk management theater. Um, there are more up-to-date State of DevOps reports, but this one specifically focused on it. So that's where those numbers are from if you want to quote them at your boss. All right, so how can we fix it? We've got good tools for using our mental models when problems occur. If we look at observability tools, for example, they let us see the outputs in detail, metrics, traces, logs, and we, we can apply our mental model and infer what must the internal state of the system be in order for it to have produced those outputs. But they don't really help us to build mental models. Um, in the Stellar report, they found that in all instances, despite the companies having good observability tools and other abstractions, the building mental models work was done exclusively using primal tools, which is the command line. And so what are we doing when we're using the command line? Well, we're not looking at the logs because we already have the logs somewhere. We are looking at the inputs, so the configuration and also the internal state, things like how many replicas are actually running, that sort of thing. And there's a potentially dubious but nonetheless sort of right feeling Gartner statistic that says that 80% of outages are caused by configuration, but also configuration is where all of the how the application's supposed to work information lives. Um, and this is what helps us to rebuild our mental models when our systems are behaving in a way we didn't think was possible. This is stuff like what database server does it point to, what security group is in, what are its rules, who's the last person who changed it, all that sort of thing. If we had tools that monitored our inputs and our internal state, as well as observability tools that monitored our outputs, we'd be able to do things like immediately look at whether a setting has changed or not, find out what's changed and whether or not it might have caused an outage. We could build mental models before making changes that were specific to the things that we were changing, especially if we're changing configuration rather than application code. So at this point, I'm sure some of you are thinking, yeah, but I have good documentation, I have config management. If I want to understand the inputs in the config, can I just read the code? And the answer is kind of, they help to mitigate, but they're not really solutions. Um, documentation, for example, is basically the best way we have of taking our mental model and putting it somewhere so that somebody else can sort of load it into their brain when they need to. Um, but we know our documentation has problems. Um, I certainly can't stand behind our docs and say all of it is up to date and absolutely correct. Um, but also, as per the Woods theorem, we know that our mental models are going to be incomplete as uh, things get more complex. And so the documentation, because it's just our mental model of the thing, is also going to suffer from that. Config management tends to be more complete because it has to have a lot of information in order to actually go and build the systems. Um, but it still has some limitations. For example, this Terraform code is fairly easy to, you, uh, to read, but it doesn't tell us anything about the security group that the EC2 instance is going to have. And changing the security group could absolutely break the application that's running on there. The other thing, which is probably more of a problem, is Terraform code never looks like this. It's never this easy to read. It's every, every single one of these things will be a variable, which is coming from some other place. And you have to chase all the variables down. Um, and it ends up just being easier to use the command line and go to the source rather than try to be a human Terraform parser. Uh, the thing that's common, though, between docs and config management, which is what makes them not a solution, is that they are an abstraction. Abstractions are good for building systems, and we need them. They allow us to compartmentalize our mental models 
into easier to digest bits so that I can say, hey, Terraform, give me a load balancer, and it gives me a load balancer, and I don't have to, don't have to worry about how it did that. Documentation follows that pattern as well. It will document the things to, use to pass in to get the load balancer, and it'll document the th load balancer you get back, but it often doesn't document exactly how that gets done. Um, and so we need these abstractions in order to build systems, but when we have to fix systems, we know that the problems tend to occur outside of our mental models, so that they are most likely to occur in the gaps where these abstractions meet. As I said, the Stellar report found that even though all of the companies that participated had lots of abstractions that they used to interact with their systems day to day, in every circumstance, they went back to primal tools and raw data when things went wrong. So docs and config management can help to mitigate, but they're not necessarily a solution. So what is? I've been trying to work this out for the past, coming up on two years. Um, we can't practice for a specific outage because we know that it's going to surprise us each time, but we can improve our general troubleshooting skills. For example, we can use chaos engineering principles to actually break things and go and fix them, but instead of knowing what the uh, chaos engineering tool is going to do, withhold that from your team so that the team has to do the troubleshooting and work out what's happened as well as the actual fixing um, in order to get things working again. Doing regular training and drills. Um, when's the last time you practiced finding all the logs and traces for a specific customer or for a specific transaction? I know that I only ever do it when something is actually broken um, and I should do it more often because it takes me too long. Um, it should be part of our onboarding. It should be something that we do very regularly. Also, a great deal of our troubleshooting time is spent just trying to find the right information, trying to remember the correct flags for the AWS CLI or, or the correct query language thing. Um, interpreting the information is often the easy part. So to fix this, we can make our config a lot easier to discover. For example, uh, Cloud Query is a tool that lets you take all of your cloud configuration and dump it into a SQL database. So we could do that and dump it into Postgres every hour, and suddenly we have a SQL database with all of our AWS stuff in there that we can hit as hard as we want. We don't have to worry about rate limits. We can write our own queries for. We can look at the deltas. Um, that would be fairly useful. If we had kubectl, it could be even simpler. We can just use kubectl to dump the contents of your entire cluster into a Git repo and just Git commit that once every hour. It sounds kind of dumb, because these are really very, very simple things to do, but it can seriously help. For example, um, do you know how to get the list of all the places a security group is used in AWS? You basically don't. Uh, there are entire blog posts dedicated to how to do it. it. It involves hitting every single AWS API with a certain set of queries to work out whether that security group is used, and it's horrible. But if you had dumped all of your AWS to a big folder of text files, you could use grep and it would take a couple of hundred milliseconds and you'd know exactly where it was. So even though it seems a bit dumb and there's probably some security considerations and stuff that you'd have to deal with, in a pinch when things are down, it's a hell of a lot quicker to search through simple stuff like this and then maybe go and cross-reference to actually AWS than it is to remember all of the, um, these complex tools under pressure. Once you've made your config discoverable though, the harder part is helping people to understand the relationships. Just because you can grep for the security group in a bunch of places doesn't mean you understand how they actually interact. The way that I'm solving this, and I think that we can solve this, is similar to the way a web crawler works. So if we look at the details of something, in this case it's a HTTP endpoint, there's a bunch of breadcrumbs that we can sort of follow to find out more. Um, this endpoint has got a certificate which we could parse and get details from. It's got a DNS record that we could query and get the, the results of. And if we did that and then did it again and did it again, we could go from the HTTP endpoint to the DNS, to the IP, to the load balancer, to the actual infrastructure that runs the application. And eventually we'd have a big 
directed graph that looks like this, which we could use to do a bunch of interesting things. And they wouldn't require the user to understand the system. This is really important. We know that when things go wrong, they are going to refute our mental models. So our systems have to assume that the user doesn't know what they're looking at because when it's broken, you won't know because it will be behaving in a way you thought was impossible. So what we can do with, with this sort of information, because we haven't required the user to give us anything to get it, we could take, say, a plan change from Terraform plan and then look at if Terraform touches this thing here, what is the blast radius going to be? What potentially could be impacted? Given that, we could take snapshots of it and look at the changes before and after to make sure that if I've made a change, it has not only affected the things I thought it was going to affect, but also a bunch of maybe, you know, the load balancer has gone unhealthy or the um, 95th percentile has changed massively for this particular thing that we're monitoring. We can find the downstream impacts very easily. Um, we could also cross-reference this sort of infrastructure config data with a database of applications and work out what applications might be affected if these things are affected. If we do this for each change, not only do we get more confidence that our changes aren't going to break things, but we can create sort of a focused database with the details of everything that's changed and answer questions like, who was the last person to touch something that could potentially have affected this application? What was changed? Etc. cetera. Um, this is what I've been working on for the past two years. Um, so we are working on this now. Um, we're looking for feedback. I can't think of a better room of people to ask for feedback, so I'm doing that now. Um, if this is something that sounds interesting to you, uh, come and speak to me. I'd love to show you what we're working on and get a little bit of feedback on it um, and give you access. Hopefully people will be getting access in the next week if I get some pull requests closed. Um, so if you're interested, I'd love to, love to hear from you. So what did we learn? We learned that outages are always going to happen outside of our mental models. They're always going to be caused by the thing that we didn't know that we didn't know because if we knew it, we wouldn't have got into that situation in the first place. Therefore, tools that require mental models in order to use them aren't going to help because we know our mental model is going to be wrong. The situation will have forced us to question our most basic assumptions. Therefore, we need to be making our systems more discoverable on the fly. Um, when things are broken, we need to be able to discover the config and the changes and the dependencies as quickly as we can. So I want you to think about this next time you have a problem. How long did it take you to find the right data? Is there a way I could have made my configuration more discoverable? I implore you all to read the Stellar report. It's really, really good. Um, S-T-E-L-L-A, it's on GitHub. Uh, you'll find it if you search for that. Um, and come and chat to me if you have any cool ways that you're doing this today. I'd love to hear about it. Thank you. Awesome. That was uh, a little triggering at the beginning about the printer. I, I have a lot of feels on that, and I've had to tell my family members often that I will not debug their printer or any printer-related things. Um, just nothing but pain there. Uh, any questions from the audience here? Look around. I know. I'm like between you and food, so. <laughs> All right, so real quick before we break, we are going to take a, a nice long break now for uh, lunch. In the chat, Jason has actually dropped a whole slew of really great food options. There's food carts that are not a long walk away. Bunch of great local areas as well. We're going to reconvene back here uh, right around 2 o'clock for the next round of talks. So get out there, enjoy the beautiful weather, and have a good lunch. Thanks again. Big round of applause for Dylan.
Hello. Yeah, just talk. Hey. Hello. Is this on? It's on. Is it? Hello? Okay. <laughs> hey, Welcome Natalie. back, everyone. Can we see about getting the doors closed? I, sorry, I wasn't asking random attendees, but I appreciate it. <laughs> you, you are an American hero. Good afternoon. How are we feeling after lunch? Who made it down to any food trucks? Yeah, amazing. Who's got the favorite meal? Like you ate it and it was life changing. Just yell it out. Who do you got? No, no meals. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Go to uh, is it Little Shlom? Yeah. Little Shlom. Little Shlom. Yeah, Little Shlom. Little Shlom. Yeah. Get the hummus with brisket. It's it's life changing. Life changing. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so if there's one place If in you Portland, eat meat, if you don't get the hummus without the brisket, it's still really good. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot because I have opinions about Portland's food scene. Like, if there's one place that folks new to Portland have to try before they leave, because, like, let's be honest, most people who think of Portland think of voodoo donuts. It's okay. Like, you're still welcome here. But, like, what's the, what's the one place? Okay, remember how before I said I really like fish that's in cans because it's delicious, right? So there's a Russian restaurant on, where is it at? Yeah, you be quiet. So it's over, it's called Kashka. Uh, it, if you like, let's say you were like, I really want to have like pickled fish with like mayo and beets into this like round thing. That would be where you would go. And it's amazing. They also have dumplings and other things. The thing that I actually find to be most incredible because it sounds terrible and is, I had to try it, is they have all these infused vodkas. So if you imbibe into the alcohol beverages, it's really interesting to try crazy flavors. But the best flavor is horseradish vodka, which they now bottled and I guess you can buy it here. And it, again, that was really great. All but right. uh, hard, hard pivot. Okay. I want to hear, sorry, no offense. I'm just not into Russian food. Um, Hot takes, like I spit out hot takes right now. What? Uh, I'll I'll start us off. AI. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't like you know I started, you complete it. Just. It's not an SAT test. <laughs> give me a give me a topic. Hot takes. What's that? Okay. Anybody besides Corey Quinn. <laughs> the answer is. Kubernetes. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> VC. Yeah, do we have any hot takes about VC? For no reason at all. It has nothing to do with who our next speaker is. <laughs> Sorry. Thinking, somehow oh, we managed to squeeze like all the hot takes into one talk, if that's possible. Is that what's going to happen right now? I think so. All right, okay. I'm, I'm going to hand this over. Thank you all. I hope you ever, everybody have a good lunch. Yeah. All right. Glad you made it back. Let's have a good second half of the day. And He's going to take us there. All right. Well, while our next speaker is going to walk up here and plug his laptop in and deal with Google, sh Google Slides because it's a terrible piece of software to make it work, uh, that's three if anyone's counting how many times I've gotten irrationally upset about Google Slides. It's confusing to tell us apart now. But, um, so, yes, that is <laughs> – while he's plugging in, I did want to share this story, which, first off, we did not plan this. Um, when I saw him, like, 30 minutes ago, oh, yeah – Three of us, it's, we're so nerds, oh my God. So the reason actually why I wore this shirt is twofold. One is it's, it is my favorite shirt. I, I mean, who doesn't? I, and people, random people, I'll go to the coffee shop and they're like, oh, I like your shirt. Just like, it has nothing to know about graphs or anything else. But the, the, actually the reason I wore it today, specifically today because Joe is speaking, was that uh, Joe was actually the one who gave me this shirt at the first Monotorama, which of course now everyone's like, Jesus, Pete, you're wearing a shirt that's like, 13 years old, yes, it has worn well. High quality. So this was uh, from a company uh, that Joe was a uh, founder of called Librato. Um, he is not, uh, yeah, good, Librato is a good company. Um, cool, people. Don't let the fact that he is a VC fool you. He has done tech stuff in the past. And I'm very excited. Is your thing working? Uh, oh, yeah, well, can we flip him over just to make sure his, yeah, just, see, this is waiting. what I'm talking about. So... <laughs> So don't let it fool you that he is a VC. He's going to share with us the uh, storied history of monitoring. Let's give a big round of applause for Joseph Rossio.
right. Can everybody, can everybody hear me okay? Is the mic working? Good? Awesome. Cool. Um, did they say they let Corey Quinn in here? Sorry. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought. Anyways, um, yeah, okay. Uh, super excited to be here. It is like really hard uh, to believe this is the, the, the 10th Monorama. Um, I've been involved with uh, monitoring observability uh, for basically the bulk of my career, and it was kind of the, the, the realization that it's been 10 years of Monorama led me to this sort of uh, reflective place where I was thinking about everything that's changed in the last 10 years. It's been a lot. Um, and you know, what, if anything, what, what, what's driving that? Uh, and, and what maybe that might um, lead us to infer about the future. Uh, and so, yeah, just to, like, background, like, Pete did a pretty good job. I'm, this is me. Uh, I dropped out of a PhD in computer science like a million years ago. Uh, it worked on a bunch of startups, all uh, in distributed systems of uh, just some kind or another. Went from telecommunications, high performance computing, um, data center orchestration, and finally landed in, in the cloud. Uh, I wasn't screaming at the time, uh, but uh, yeah, Librato, we were one of the first, uh, very first cloud infrastructure monitoring companies, uh, and then sold that to SolarWinds, uh, exited that, SolarWinds acquired it in 2015, and I got to work a couple years there helping drive their cloud product strategy. We did a, a bunch of acquisitions like Paper Trail, Pingdom, Logly, um, and some others. Uh, had some fun. Uh, after that, yeah, as, as Pete uh, mentioned, I, I moved over to uh, this place called Heavybit. We're an early stage venture firm. Uh, we're deeply vertically focused on developer tools, developed first infrastructure, uh, enterprise uh, software, and so as you can imagine, um, monitoring observability continues to be a very active area of interest of mine, uh, and I am actually supposed to very barely kind of have some guess of what's, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, this just, uh, just because near and dear in my heart, I went online, this is a picture of me, the last time I spoke at Monorama, it was in Boston, it was 10 years ago, uh, I gave a talk uh, about data visualization, uh, this is the uh, best picture I could find online of it. So um, production quality has increased at this conference uh, since then uh, a little bit, uh, which is good. So I, I had to come back and, and get something that people can actually see. All right. <clears throat> now, moving on to the task at hand. So uh, a relatively new engineer, whether this is you know, someone you're mentoring or someone uh, in your team comes and says, hey, I need, I'm wiring something up, I need some observability, like, you know, what should I use? And uh, because you're an experienced engineer, you, you start with the, the normal call and response, and you say, well, it depends. Uh, and then you say, well, let's just go and take a look at what our options are. And this is the point in the movie where, like, the record scratches and it freeze frames, and they say, oh, you might be wondering how we got here. Um, because this looks like a hot mess. Um, and it's certainly inscrutable and not at all uh, welcoming to, to you know, someone new to the craft. Uh, but you know, much like any legacy system, and by legacy system I mean a, a system that makes money and keeps people employed, <laughs> um, like any legacy system, when someone new shows up and, and says, oh my gosh, I can't believe how gross all this code is, I can't believe all the you know, the, the trade-offs that have been made, like, how, how could you all have done this? And you say, well, you, there's, there's this kind of natural progression of, of events. Um, so, and the, the, the lens that I think especially, it's, it's not the only thing that impacted all these, but I, I do think as I was thinking through and trying to find some, some common narrative threads, uh, in IT, uh, as an industry, uh, it's a case study of uh, Clayton Christensen who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, notion of a disruptive innovation, uh, a, a IT platform shift. And these are uh, things, they, they rewrite the rules uh, first slowly and, and then very quickly uh, when they hit or it feels quickly. <clears throat> and so why, why do these happen other than just the uh, shiny object syndrome, which I, I do admit helps drive them, but I'd, I'd like to think is not the only reason. Uh, and they are because 
these platform shifts promise new features and capabilities, uh, the, the, the ability to build things we couldn't before, uh, generally some significant performance uh, imp improvements, and these can be you know, performance not just in terms of like raw compute and, and, and memory, but also uh, cost performance, uh, flexibility, um, removing, you know, this, this one's a little more subtle. A, a lot of these help remove communication coordination overhead, and, and which is a very pernicious kind of cost. And if you think of your, um, your, your mythical man month, Frederick Brooks, uh, anything you can do to reduce uh, coordination overhead helps you scale your team. Um, and importantly, uh, usually you're trading these off. <laughs> you don't usually uh, get all of them. Um, and also, they let us, which, which I think is most important, uh, we consistently, uh, which I think it just is great as, as us and humans, um, we, we don't stand pat and say, oh good, now this is easier. We say, oh good, now we can build something bigger and more ambitious than we ever have uh, before. So. The downside, the trade-offs, uh, IT platform shifts, so they are, uh, there's no free lunch, no silver bullets, uh, incompatible with our existing solutions, usually, uh, also alien in terms of, and, and this is because um, the new thing lacks backwards compatibility because you don't actually know if the new thing is gonna be the new thing, and so it doesn't make sense to have any of those constraints until you're way down that path. Um, and at that point, everyone's adapting to the new thing and, and there's less, less need for that. Um, but yeah, the workforce often needs to be retrained, business models need to be altered. Um, and this usually leaves a gap, especially because in the early days of the new thing, it's commercially uninteresting. The, the market's not large enough. Um, and uh, the uh, incumbents, uh, whether those are projects or, or products, um, are, are motivated to believe uh, that the new thing's not going to be the new thing. Um, so, with, with that in mind, uh, the baseline I'm gonna use for this, I mean, you could go all the way back to um, ENIAC or, or the beginning of IT, but we're just gonna start, we're gonna fast forward to the late 90s uh, when uh, your typical uh, dot-com era uh, uh, architecture, scale up, proprietary, you got big iron machine from uh, Sun if you were best in class or if you were uh, doing, uh, you know, just buying from a single vendor, maybe HP, IBM. Uh, this is the kind of uh, infrastructure that all, all the large giants at the time were running. Uh, and you had system administrators um, manning the, t the helm. So, uh, very first kind of platform shift I wanna look at is the move from that to scale out uh, commodity x86 servers uh, and open source software. And then, you know, a specific example being the LAMP stack. Uh, and there's a bunch of uh, coming lately uh, providers who went and took this path. Uh, reducing costs for both hardware and software and bringing rise the discipline of, of web operations. Uh, and this driving down of costs and making it easier to run, uh, uh, run larger fleets of servers starts to unlock uh, some innovation. Um, at the time, then this is where we're gonna take our first look at monitoring. And you know, prior, instead of just using proprietary tools, this is in my mind, and, and of course like on Solaris or uh, there are other platforms that were like system monitoring tools, but this is where I think uh, we first took, uh, like I said, a background in HPC, uh, tools like Anglia, which came from the University of Berkeley to run uh, large scale out clusters. Uh, Nagios uh, was brought around in uh, 2004, uh, and we have this, very simple workflow, but that works for the systems at the time. Um, so for, like I said, first of all, everything works. Um, and then second of all, like don't ever change anything. Uh, don't ship software. Uh, don't, uh, and if something goes wrong, now will find it, we'll log in and fix it, and we'll rinse and repeat. Um, now, what the big inflection point here, even though this is a relatively simplistic uh, initial state, uh, is that uh, open source software uh, has a much deeper impact than just reducing licensing costs. Um, open source also uh, drove down barriers to collaborating across uh, corporate boundaries and, and maybe I think more importantly, um, lowering the activation energy required to just put something out there and start working on it and start solving problems. 
Um, and you know, recently, you know, I, I, you know, I go so far, and, and you're going to see, because the whole rest of our story, like the open source never goes away, and yes, there's more commercial vendors coming in, and myself included, um, but you know, I believe, and I firmly, that open source software is like the most positive transformative force in the history of IT, and that uh, this is something that is going to play out and has played out to date in observability and will continue as long as we're doing it. Um, and every one of these projects starts the same way, where uh, someone's just staring at a screen like really, really, really angry and decides like <laughs> enough is enough with the current status quo and starts working on a new way to do things. Uh, and they can do this and share it freely with, with uh, anyone. And in, in, in venture, we talk a lot about total addressable markets and TAM, which is like you know, the acronym, um, and that need to be large enough to justify you know, the investment and spending time on something. Well, uh, it, it, open source software requires a TAM of one, you, and the budget of your time. Uh, and you can start with that uh, and, and build something around it. So. Moving forward, uh, the next in my worldview uh, shift, uh, and, and some of these overlap a little bit, but you know, we're going to go through them sequentially. Um, you know, DevOps. Uh, so we had driven down the cost of procurement, and we've increased the potential for collaboration and innovation. Um, and then you know, software started becoming SaaS. And so uh, the release kind of processes and timelines that we had built and designed for shrink wrap software. Uh, do not work anymore. So in SaaS, this turns to be like at best like a quarterly release of just like doom and tears. And if you've never either experienced that, like I know some of you have, uh, or you, you should, if you haven't read the Phoenix Project, it's, it's just this great novel which, I mean fiction, but does just an incredible job, the starting state of encapsulating just how dreadful that uh, process was. And so at this time, like, the ability to change is the scariest, riskiest thing. And so what uh, DevOps the, and the people who were kind of building DevOps out of raw clay set out to do was like, well, let's just make change really, really cheap. Uh, and we'll do that with automation. We'll do it with configuration management for our servers, continuous integration delivery um, for our, our application software. We're about just 14 years over to the day since the, the 10 deploys a day uh, post was put up. Um, and yeah, and then we decided, sysadmins, that we'd rename to um, operations engineers. We had to rename to DevOps engineers. Um, but it was at this point, uh, the inflection point here is this is when monitoring like really started to come in the forefront, right? Because this was less like, okay, we're not touching anything, we're just making sure it's okay. Uh, this is if, hopefully most people have seen, this is uh, the SRE hierarchy of needs, SRE being a, a, like a concrete instance of DevOps, I think the way they, they describe it. Um, but you'll notice at the very bottom is, is monitoring because there's this totally mangled and hallucinated and not actual quote that says you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, but it actually turns out to be pretty true in this specific uh, context. And so you can only change things like as quickly as you can safely verify that the changes had the intended effect. And so it's in this environment uh, that these teams, um, you know, pushing the state of the art, started building, uh, you know, some dramatically more sophisticated open source software uh, to start handling this. And on the other side, you started to see more commercial vendors pop up with more sophisticated uh, uh, web native uh, capabilities. And here, like I said, we, uh, we're doing continuous delivery, so we get the code out there. If the tests and the graphs look good and the alerts aren't going off, um, we can rinse and repeat. <clears throat> so next, um, armed with DevOps and uh, continuous delivery, uh, our next bottleneck is now uh, just literally uh, procuring systems to run the software, right? Like you're ready to ship code, you know what you want to write, um, but you have to file a ticket, you have to wait for the stuff to show up, you gotta wait for it to be racked and stacked, uh, maybe you're behind other people's tickets, um, this is not IT's fault, uh, as there's like orders, like I said, need to be placed, the capacity need to be management, and importantly, finance teams that had to be satisfied. Um, but 
you know, moving forward, a cloud, at least for me personally, this was probably like the single biggest inflection point in my career. Like as soon as I realized that like um, procuring a, uh, provisioning a server could be an API call, like this whole world opened up. Um, and this also then started, uh, you know, led to a new set of tooling because um, we went from a world where, like I said, hardware very static, hard to get going and provision to <laughs> hosts can just come and go. And, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like the software that assumed two digits uh, would be enough for the dates for like Y2K or <laughs> even better, like we're however many years away from the epic timestamp exploding. Um, but uh, this notion that a host could suddenly be ephemeral, like I'm not sure, there, back then, uh, kind of the classic joke was like, well, let me show you this uh, graphite graph and it's like two lines and then the legend is like every single host that has ever reported that metric uh, because the idea that hosts could just go away um, wasn't a thing. Uh, and you know, on the logging side, where are these logs gonna go so we can still use them because these hosts are gonna go away, they're not gonna have local log files. This led to the Elk stack which led to a million different uh, logging providers built on the Elk stack. Um, Datadog uh, kind of really came to the forefront. That's my little tiny dent down there or in the bottom. Um, and, and yeah, it started to work through things like uh, easy onboarding for users, uh, long tails of integration, custom metrics. So, bring this to our, 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 our last uh, kind of shift here. And this is um, <laughs> cloud native computing which when that term arose, if you had been building natively on the cloud for like five or six years was like confusing. Because uh, people were like, that's not cloud native computing. And you're like, well where, what, oh, okay. Um, but I think you know, if you consider you know, Conway's law, which hopefully, uh, or if you're not familiar with it, uh, basically says that uh, it, 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 like there's just no way around um, because software we collaborate uh, in modular format, format and the communication boundaries are more challenging at departmental or, or organization boundaries, always, always, always looks like uh, the organization that produces the software, right? I'm paraphrasing a lot. Um, in theory, high performing, large scale organizations should have small to coupled teams. Uh, they should each be accountable for a subset of concerns and they should be empowered to optimize locally. And if you were to sort of then reverse engineer like what the software architecture might look like produced by an organization there, you end up with something that looks something like this. Microservices, um, we've got your orchestration, there's higher level cloud primitives to push out non-core competencies. Um, even JavaScript uh, SPAs and GraphQL fall into this because I, I know people get salty and, and, and like, uh, yeah, SPAs, I'm not a fan but it allows those orgs to split the front end team from the back end team and they don't have to talk to each other if the GraphQL is set up and it turns out there's like a lot of value in that. Now we're reaching the stage of our journey here where there are always trade-offs, always, always trade-offs. Like none of this is for free. <clears throat> and a thing I like to tell people, uh, which I feel like I have experience from both sides, uh, is like, and, and politely, you know, it's like, if you're gonna use these, understand what you're getting yourself into. Um, Pete has a slightly saltier take, which is okay, but, uh, you know, don't die because you're spending more time managing Kubernetes than your product. Uh, but, you know, the main more is like, choose your foot gun wisely, okay? <laughs> like. Understand what the challenges are, understand what you're getting, what you're not, and make sure it's like stage appropriate. If you're early stage pre-product market fit and you got a small, tightly coupled team, like you don't need a bunch of microservices and Kubernetes and all that jazz, you just need customers. Uh, you will get to that point when you're ready for it. Uh, and coming along with that complexity, uh, yeah, we now have deep systems, large fan outs, uh, which are very hard to reason about and have like, a, quadratic communication paths that you have to like put together and tie off. Our, our metric systems, which are pre-materializing views for known unknowns, which is great. Um, now there's so many things you wanna track and you say, I know, I'll just pre-materialize all the views as metrics. Um, and it turns out that's how you end up with like a million dollar data dog bill. Um, 
which they like, but I wouldn't <laughs> recommend for you. Uh, and so we've brought you know, to the forefront uh, things like uh, yeah, distributed tracing, uh, the whole observability practice and what Honeycomb and the team there has done are, are all kind of driven by, okay, how do we wrestle down this complexity? How do we r reduce uh, you know, the cost and what we need to record to do what we need to do? Okay, so uh, hopefully that resonates with people. Where we're heading, or just some, this is the, the, the hot take. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, like a sub goal of this talk was that like every slide should actually be its own talk. And that um, felt more approachable when I started doing it than when I was halfway through it. Uh, okay, so uh, first of all, um, commodity instrumentation, let's start with a layup. Right, because this is something um, I want to highlight because I feel like to people in this room and audience, uh, this maybe is like, oh yeah, of course this is happening. This is not globally and, and throughout the, like it, this is happening at the early adopter, but it's, it's not happening long tail in the, in the late majority. And it's something to, um, you know, open telemetry pre previously, open tracing and open census, I mean, I. Uh, was there when Ben Siegelman and the team at Lightstep were cooking up open tracing and specifically trying to address the problem of like, for distributed tracing, how do you ensure you instrument literally every single microservice uh, if that, w the, the level of vendor lock-in that would Im imply. And I, and I thought what he was doing, because uh, Ben is just like genuinely one of the like best humans I've ever met, was like super um, genuine and, and well-meant, but I just, I didn't think it could work. And so where we are today, uh, with things like, um, and, and there's a couple, between open, OTEL, you know, Prometheus exporters, uh, what you can get from eBPF, which, you know, the nice thing about eBPF is it's not just like, oh, we can make automatic instrumentation like um, portable, but we actually can get new, net new in instrumentation we never could before. Um, and this reduces lock-in barriers to innovation uh, and leads to, you know, this next area. So this is, this is, a little less of a, a, a coming out, but uh, it's something I'm really fascinated by. And so one of the great things about observability, uh, and, and, as, and as we went through DevOps and cloud computing, is it created this shared language between Dev and Ops, where we could reason about production and, and we could make uh, kind of joint uh, decisions and verify those outcomes. Um, and so developers being able to add custom metrics to their code or spans uh, or use observability tools is really critical to help developers uh, really take ownership of, of what they run in production alongside the, um, I don't know, SREs or platform engineers, whatever they're called now. Um, but uh, this missing mode where, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice if you had some input when you are actually writing code as to like, what does this code look like in production? Like this line I'm about to change. Like it's cool that when I ship it, I'll get a graph, but why shouldn't I just know now, like in my IDE? We have the data on these lines of code, or we could have the data on these lines of code. And so there's a couple of teams now working on what I, I think is really fascinating of really shrinking a developer while they're writing new code, their point of view to um, just like the pull request I'm working right now, the lines of code I'm working on right now, and move everything else out of the way. Meet them in their, their IDE. So I, I think this is a thing that's gonna really be widespread. I don't know if it's gonna be separate products or if it's gonna be you know, features and good products. Uh, I don't know, open source versions, I think there should be, in, at least in the you know, uh, Grafana Prometheus stack, um, but that's early. Um, okay, now this next one uh, I think is really important. So um, it's probably a stretch to say that rising interest rates are a platform shift, but like it's gonna feel that way to some people, for sure. Uh, there's been, you know, now 15 years uh, of, of um, very low interest rates, which means that the value of very long-term cash flows was very high. Um, we're aggressively inverting that curve right now, and there's still all kinds of unforeseen consequences unfolding. Uh, but one that's pretty clear is that um, teams are going to have to manage all of their costs uh, better. Um, and I, I really, and this, is, this comes from, so, very personal experience running a pure monitoring SaaS 10 years ago. Uh, the actual very first time I ever saw this, uh, this GIF, um, Pete Cheslock was on stage talking about his relationship with my product uh, to an audience in this theater. Uh, and so on the one hand, 
That, that's not the sweet spot, right? Like I, I, I tell all my companies, like, look, if, if people sign the deal too quick, or if they don't like wince a little bit over the price, like it's too cheap. But also, if people are like, no, you're, you're literally, I've got the kidneys, I've got my children, like what else can I give you? Like that is not a good long-term relationship with, with your customer. But the, the challenge is that like, it, it's, um, it's just very hard to scale, look at scale, uh, because the, the impact on your infrastructure of your customer's usage scales linearly, you are reselling cloud at 80% margins. And that's not a good place to be. And I think uh, that we are definitely going to uh, have to find ways, or, or new ways will emerge, hybrid architectures where the data plane comes on-prem to some extent uh, to address this. Uh, a big piece of this, uh, observability pipelines, if you know, hopefully many are familiar with this notion of a, a stream processing uh, a thing that sits in front, very similar like segment.com uh, for customer data, but more for your infrastructure data that will give you the ability to um, basically uh, uh, route, uh, uh, filter. Um, I think this is going to be endemic. I, th I think it's going to be part of this. It's going to be uh, everywhere. Um, you know, Cribble has created this category just a few years ago. Um, gives you this fine grain, like I said, location where data goes, uh, really the ability to do everything you need to it and, and maximize the value of the data you're sending to different vendors. Um, I think, you know, there, there will be integrated options. You want to use Datadogs or, or Mesmos or whoever's, you can use their in-house. I think primarily it will be standalone just because the incentives are really disaligned there. Um, yeah. So the last one, sorry, I meant to say, well, we're done, right? Well, except uh, if you want to know if there's a platform shift, just find out wherever VCs are losing their goddamn minds. And like, <laughs> you will have a sense. Uh, so we've got just a couple minutes. All right, so Jeremy, uh, so this, um, yeah, definitely fits our definition of a platform shift, a broad definition. Like, I, I, you know, there's some people who are like, oh, this is the new cloud. It is not the new cloud. Uh, but it is going to impact a lot of different things, and probably maybe more different things than, than we've had in a while. Um, we're super, super early in figuring out what any of this all entails, where the limits are, where, where the, where the uh, uh, value is. And um, um, Gates Law, this thing where like, we way overestimate um, what can be accomplished in a year and way underestimate what can be accomplished in 10 years. This is the like, most burning example of this in my you know, 25 year career. Um, I'm super long bullish and like, I just wish the noise would calm down a bit short term. Um, quick framework I use, uh, when, and, and this prior to LLMs, even just with ML, uh, same thing. Um, so when, when I'm thinking about uses of AI, it's like, well, wait, like what's the acceptable false positive rate? Like if this is the thing I'm doing and if it's 90% correct, it helps me, that's great. Um, if this thing is gonna, send me a page in the middle of the night, like 80% correctness is not okay. And, and this has been like the, um, yeah, uh, in the sense of superpower, another way to look at it, does it give you human, human superpowers? I'm for it. If it says it's gonna replace humans, I'm very skeptical. Uh, and I think generally these are not like standalone, we're the AI this, we're the AI that. It's a thing that should give people seamlessly better experiences in, in your application's usage. Um, yeah, just running through uh, things I think are laughable. LLMs are not going to reduce the number of software developers. They're not going to, you know, observability, spe observability specific, detect all anomalies in your systems. Uh, it's not gonna predict all your maintenance. We've been, there's been 20 years of just, um, th there are like two kinds of AI ops. There are two kinds of AI ops companies, dead ones and new ones. Um, <laughs> and like that, it's been the case for 20 years, that may change. I'm always open-minded to a change, but when I see a pattern like that, it's, you know, I have to understand why. Um, and, and, and just the reason for that, like I said, is some the, the framework there. It's just uh, systems, just our systems are constantly changing. There's no pre-training pre data. Um, oh, and lastly, like you know, specifically, LMs will not replace you. By the way, uh, you know, I was doing this, I was like, you know what, I should ask ChatGPT if it thinks it's gonna, <laughs> replace software uh, engineers. And it turns out ChatGPT is actually smarter than most of the people like relentlessly tweeting about it. Um, but it gets it. So I, I think they'll figure it out at some point too. Now, and um, yep, we're coming in because I'm right on 30. So Pete, 
has got the hook right there. Uh, yeah, so this is what they're gonna do. It's gonna give experienced developers superpowers. It's gonna help your new developers learn faster. Um, I think it's really exciting, these, these next two, um, I think has a lot of promise, just like things like crazy query languages, like uh, Honeycomb, you should check it out. They've done some really cool stuff, just like, well, hey, instead of having to remember HoneyQL or whatever it is, like, just ask us a natural language and we'll mostly figure it out for you. Um, and that's the kind of thing, making it just easier to use tools, like, uh, is, is a really, really valuable thing. And, and ultimately, like I said, I, I don't think it's gonna replace people. I think it's gonna, especially software developers, it's gonna just make you way more valuable. Um, last thing, the very last thing, um, you know, these foundation models, all this is built on right now, these, these are black boxes, not just in that you literally can't see inside, but also even the orgs that build them, you can't see inside or understand. Um, it seems likely, barring regulatory capture attempts that I feel like are going underway, uh, it seems likely that there will be open source models that complement this and that people run themselves. And if that's the case, then there'll be pipelines and infrastructure um, and you all will be on the hook for helping your teams understand like, is this working well? How much is it costing us? <laughs> is our user like happy or completely just about to get violent because the bot is not doing the right thing? Um, and you know, these costs, and not just training costs or inference costs, but like just the ongoing carbon costs, I think are gonna be important to know with these because this is not cheap to run. Okay, cool, that's about it, I think. <laughs> All right, do we have any, uh, any questions from the audience for, uh, for Joe here? I didn't agree to questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they know you're a VC, so they're already very Did my PR people vet the, 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 just kidding. <laughs> awesome. Was there a question out there? It's so bright up here, I can't see anything. Yeah, yeah, I can't see a thing. Oh yeah, over here, thank you. Oh, hi Adrian. So I'll, yeah. I'll repeat the question real quick. It's uh, generally the cost of monitoring has reduced, but we're kind of approaching a situation where it costs more to monitor the thing that we're actually monitoring. So like, how do we, how do we deal? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's funny, there's a, there's a couple pieces of prior art that kind of always come to mind. So, so one is like when, when New Relic first launched, well not launched, but when they, on Heroku, when they first came out, their very first add-on on Heroku, like some acclaim because Heroku as a black box, like you, you couldn't shell in, you couldn't do anything. So like anyone doing production on Heroku had to pay for New Relic. And uh, they were charging one cent more per dyno than the cost of the dyno. Which at the time, I, it was like five cents a dyno hour for the dyno, six cents a dyno hour for New Relic. And that just made my head explode then. Because I was, how could this make sense? Um, the other one is, uh, I remember in 2012 talking to um, uh, uh, the person running observability at Netflix <laughs> who told me that 25% of their bill, AWS bill, was observability. And I, again, I couldn't believe that because at running the startup, we were like, well, we can get maybe 5% and anything over 10, we're getting kicked right out. Um, which, by the way, uh, an interesting thing, of, you know, I ran five or six different observability products all with different uh, characteristics at, at SolarWinds and um, every single one of them, was fascinating me, had a different uh, high price mark over which churn went through the roof. Right? And for some of them it was 5K a month, some it was 50K a month, some it was 100K or more a month, but like every single one of them there was like this high water line uh, over which people were just like, I can't do this anymore. Um, so uh, bringing it back to your question, um, I mean, and this is part of why I had this sl the slide on that is I, I do really think like the part of the cost that increases linearly, if we're talking at scale where it's like not just that it costs more, but also it costs like a lot, right, as I scale my business, um, I think that just has to get broken and we, the data plane costs, we have to have the customer pay the data plane costs at their like rock bottom wholesale cloud prices and we see where we get there. Um, a pure serverless is a little tricky on that, but I, th I think potentially can be done. 
Um, but yeah, that's why I, 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 don't, I, I don't believe that like pure SaaS, we're gonna resell cloud at 80% margins is, is viable 10 years from now. Awesome, any other uh, questions from the audience? Oh, one over here, thank you. Give a ballpark idea of monitoring costs as a percentage, like a percentage of cloud spend. Um, yeah, well, I think where we're at right now at scale, and this is why I think Adrian's question is important, is I, I you know, like I said, 10 years ago, it, it felt like five to 10% was as much you can get away with. Um, and, and like the Netflix number was this huge outlier, which by the way, um, the individual at the time reminded me that Netflix content budget was, I forget how many billion dollars. So there was literally nothing they could do on AWS that would move the needle. So that was kind of a special case then. Um, but uh, now I, I think this 20 to 30% number is a lot more prevalent at scale. And I think that's really, really dangerous for observability uh, providers uh, to think is okay. Because I, I, I think it's the lowest level that hierarchy it needs. And if that's the only way to do it, you're gonna do it. But people are gonna be very, very motivated like you do not want your customers to have at the top of their priority list, like whenever it comes up, try some way to get this down, right? Um, not that this is my talk, but the one topic I'll put on that one, which was Amazon cost management tools became important when the Amazon bill showed up in a board meeting. And I guarantee you, because I've heard this from board members of public companies, observability bills are showing up in board meetings. No, a million, a million percent. Uh, <laughs> And not just Coinbase's ridiculous one, right? Like uh, many others. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that's actually true. I mean, in, in many cases, to, to Adrian's point, like the, the second biggest bill after your cloud is observability, your, your SaaS observability. Uh, and or if you're being honest right now, like you're, if you're running like a team of 11 people with open source software, like that's not any better. Um, so I don't think this is a solved problem. All right. One more question. Any good references to how to better spend on monitoring? Oh, um, sorry. When you say better spend, do you mean like at the bill down or? or? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, not if it, because that just tends to be sensitive data. I mean, I do think um, there's kind of so much ambient, you could probably throw together some kind of qualitative. There's just so much kind of ambient anger and complaining about it. Uh, and I, I do think periodically, uh, you'll, you'll find, obviously biased, you'll find something a vendor will put up will be like, oh, of course you want to spend this much. Um, but yeah, I, I would focus my energies on like, uh, like I said, like what, what are the you know, future ways likely to help you get better control over that and more fine grained, um, you know, the signal and noise ratio on what gets sent out to who, because they all charge by volume, right? Um, awesome, let's do another big round of applause for Joe. <laughs> All right, well, our next uh, block of talks are our wonderful sponsors. Hopefully, you've made it to their, uh, their tables and picked up some socks and shirts or hoodies, perhaps. It, uh, it is a little chilly in here. I don't know if you've noticed, I had to go put pants on because I was freezing. Um, but if you stopped by this booth, you may, I don't even know if you have any left, but you might have a, uh, a hoodie to keep you warm right now. So... Um, <laughs> All right, let's do a round of applause for our next speakers from, oh, wait, I'm gonna wait to start the timer until we, we flip over the thing. Here we go. Our next speaker's from ClickHouse. Everybody enjoying the event so far? It's good? Awesome, okay. I am Tim Davis, I'm a developer advocate with ClickHouse. This is Vlad. And uh, we're here to just talk to you for a couple of minutes about what we do. Um, you know, at this point, all of our hoodies are basically gone. We have socks, we have t-shirts and stuff like that, but also we have databases. Who here uses a database? Come on, I see hands that aren't up. Come on. Okay, that's what I thought. All right, Vlad? Hey, my name's Vlad, uh, Vlad Salaverstov. I lead observability team at ClickHouse, and uh, 
going to tell you a little bit about ClickHouse and how it relates to observability. Uh, ClickHouse has started uh, back in 2009 at Yandex. It got to open source in 2016. Uh, initially, it was uh, built for handling a web analytics use case, uh, but it rapidly have grown after going open source, uh, got very popular, got 29,000 GitHub stars, tons of contributors, lots of releases, some bugs. Uh, it's a columnar oriented data store, uh, does pretty well with aggregations, it's distributed, supports sharding, multi-master, cross-region replication, uh, and works best for OLAP database use cases. Uh, regarding the observability, the ClickHouse really efficiently stores data. Uh, the, it's best for storing the structured data, like structured logs, traces, errors, error stack traces, time series events, metrics, everything, everything's structured. It's resource efficient, it's cost efficient. Uh, depending on the alternatives considered, you can get the cost savings when switching to ClickHouse tens or hundreds of times. ClickHouse is used by observability vendors that do uh, observability products like uh, highlight.io, uh, what else? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I blanked. Uh, uh, as well as like uh, platform building teams in uh, companies like Uber or eBay. So, how much data are we storing internally per month? Uh, we built our internal observability system in ClickHouse based on ClickHouse. Right now we are ingesting about 1.6 petabytes of raw data uh, monthly. And uh, we store about 2.5 trillion rows uh, per month. That's a little bit. <laughs> That's quite a bit. <laughs> so if you're curious about like how we handle at scale, like the answer is yes. Um, you know, whatever number you think is big, yeah, that's fine, we can do that. Now with that, um, like you mentioned, we have you know 29,000 something stars on GitHub on the open source project, but really, I mean, if you're interested in kind of taking it a step further and having a fully managed service, that's what we're looking at as well now. So we've got the ClickHouse Cloud platform, and with that, we've got multiple public clouds that you can spin up on. This has to be updated soon, because we are in beta on GCP, but that's going to be uh, coming out soon. Um, and with that, it just allows you to have fully managed instances of ClickHouse. And we are, at this point in time, very developer focused. There's been a DevRel team for a while. I've only been here for about a month and a half, but really, one minute, you're good. One? okay. So, um, you know, we're really, really focusing on the developer experience, on the, you know, data and everything like that. So. Uh, Really, if you have any questions, if you're trying to replace things that are expensive or anything like that, or you've got like massive amounts of data, come talk to us. Um, you couldn't have missed us coming straight in the front door. Um, if you haven't come and gotten some swag, then please feel free to, uh, to come and do that as well. Um, if you wanna learn more, we've got the QR code to go ahead and scan, but also we have a data sheet up at the front that will give you, what is it, like 300 bucks in free credits for ClickHouse Cloud? Free credits. Yeah, so if you're interested in kind of kicking the tires and seeing what it's like for the fully managed solution, we've got 300 free bucks for you to come play with. And uh, appreciate y'all for having us. Everybody's been really awesome here, so uh, it's been a really cool event to be a part of. Enjoy. Awesome, thank you, ClickHouse. All right. We're gonna have up our next speaker from Ground Cover. Oh, it's a Google Sheets. That's four for you keeping count. Are we up to four? Who's keeping track for me? All right. All right, let's give it up a round of applause for Ground Cover. Hey everyone. Uh, I know you're tired after lunch, so I'm gonna try to be uh, interesting. 
Uh, so Grand, I'll tell you a little bit about GrandCover. I'm Shachar, I'm the CEO and co-founder of GrandCover. And GrandCover is a cloud native uh, full stack observability platform, which basically means that like a lot of other solutions you know, we provide metrics and traces and logs and Kubernetes infrastructure monitoring and a lot of, th of things you, uh, you would expect from a full blown observability system. Uh, but you know, other than the obvious stuff, let me tell you a bit about why we're so different than what you usually used to know. So one of the things that ground cover is based on uh, is an eBPF observability sensor that we've actually built in house and uh, it's probably m one of the most advanced uh, eBPF sensors out there. To whom, who doesn't know uh, eBPF, that's a really interesting technology that allows you to monitor code without requiring an SDK instrumentation or anything inside the actual application, which means that we can deploy an eBPF sensor on the entire Kubernetes cluster and, and with a minute we get logs, deep application metrics, infrastructure metrics, traces, Kubernetes events, and a lot of other stuff you would want to collect from your production or, or staging environments. Uh, eBPF promises 100% coverage all the time, which means no, whatever piece of code is running in your production, it's covered, whether it's a legacy code or a new service you just released, there's no need to do anything. It means zero code changes, so you can uh, focus on actually uh, uh, getting value from the observability platform rather than maintain it. And it's also super lightweight compared to SDK instrumentations or agents that you're used to running uh, on, your, on your clusters to get uh, data. This observability agent is very, very lightweight and consumes very little resources, uh, which is sometimes a problem at high scale. The other part of it in which we're different on is how we actually store the data. I mean, you have all these logs, metrics, and traces, and you have to store them somewhere efficiently, right? So uh, we've actually built an in-cloud observability backend, which is uh, based on the latest and greatest technologies that uh, are in here in this conference as well, like Victoria Metrics and ClickHouse. Thanks, guys, for the, for the great uh, efforts you guys are pulling off. Uh, this backend means that it's completely scalable to uh, whatever size that we would like, to, would like to have. It's very cost effective in resources like memory and CPU since it's built on top of very, very modern technologies. And it also can offload uh, data into uh, much cheaper storage verticals like S3, which is something that can save a lot of, uh, of, lo a lot of money in high scale costs. Uh, the other part that we do interestingly is that we completely separate the data plane and the control plane. So this entire observability backend basically runs in your cloud. So uh, you can get all the benefits of a SaaS experience of going into groundcover.com, seeing all the data that you just collected from your Kubernetes clusters, but you don't have to worry about shipping this data out from uh, an egress cost perspective or from a privacy perspective. So it means data is private, it's in your control, you can reuse it to whatever you want. It's suddenly in your cloud environment and not at some foreign SaaS environment. But it also means that if we harness these great technologies and combine that with an uh, on-prem storage, we can break the bond between pricing and volume of data, which is something that is very, very often uh, problematic in, uh, in APM solutions. So we don't pri price at all by log volume, metric cardinality, trace volume, or anything that could be unpredictable or fluctuating. Uh, it allows us to reach a full observability solution with up to 90% cost, but more importantly, get a predictable pricing, which I know most of you out there, which I've talked to a lot of companies over the last couple of years, this unpredictable price is sometimes even worse than the price itself. Uh, and that's a lot of what we can guarantee with that. Uh, and the other part is we, we can integrate with any data source. So uh, uh, using this in-cloud observability backend, we can also consume custom metrics using Prometheus and any OTIL traces or logs, CloudWatch, uh, cloud uh, monitoring uh, metrics and so on. And uh, since we chose technologies that are Grafana com compatible, we can also uh, support people that use Grafana, which is a lot of the market out there. So we host our own Grafana so you can experience the data sources that you have in cloud with our Grafana, but you can also hook it up to whatever Grafana you're using. And that means all your observability data in one place, whether, it's, whether it originates from our EBPF sensor or from another source and an easy Grafana compatibility for all you guys out there using Grafana. Just a quick glimpse into ground cover uh, before I'm cut off here. Uh, we can see all the workloads and the pods running in the cluster auto detected with all the relevant infrastructure metrics that you guys are usually after when using Kubernetes. Um, the relevant metadata and CPU memory metrics and so on. We also build a full dependency maps of who's talking to who from an application layer and the actual golden signals on top of that like request per second latency, error rates. We can also let you explore all the, explore all the traces in the cluster, uh, filter by something and actually get the payload of the request you're looking at, which is something very hard to get with OpenTelemetry or other APM vendors. You can actually troubleshoot with examples. 
Uh, and we also provide API catalogs that aggregate the APIs, SQL queries, and anything you're doing in the cluster so you can uh, basically look at whatever is going on and figure out who's the slowest bottlenecks. And of course, log management and dashboards. Um, and I I'm gonna stop here, so thank you. Jump over to our booth, get a, get a demo, ask questions, which I'm sure you guys have, and thank you for the time. Awesome, thank you, ground cover. All right, we've got one more uh, sponge talk before we head into uh, our last talk before break. And uh, this is going to be Shoreline. And we're going to make this work. There we go. Let's give it up for Shoreline. All right, good to see everybody today. I'm Chris from Shoreline. First time at the conference, so we're thrilled to be here. Uh, but I guess that means the number one question we got this morning was, what does Shoreline do? So it's great to meet everybody. My uh, goal here in, in five bullet points, one slide, and a quick demo, answer that question for you. So we fully automate runbooks. Everybody's got great tools for observability and for you know, the ticket monitoring, incident management, so they can see what's happening, get alarms when that happens, and assign it to someone to look at. Shoreline's all about helping you fix those problems. So if it's uh, something we've seen a lot before, maybe that's a fully automated resolution to resize a PVC or uh, update a certificate or those sorts of things. If it's something that needs a little bit of human intervention, the runbook's going to walk you through some diagnostics that have been pre-populated, like a Jupyter-style notebook, and then give you some commands based on what you see that you can run. Everything we do, every action that's taken, fully audit trail um, to help your security compliance guys feel good about this. We also eliminate the need for direct routes SSH access into a lot of the boxes, which makes people uncomfortable, and sometimes that means your L1 uh, response team, support team, can't actually fix the things you need them to fix. So we take that um, out of the, out of the uh, consideration as well. Um, the problem with runbooks, more often than not, is that these things are out of date. It doesn't reflect. Your, your infrastructure is changing all the time. How do you keep them up to date? Shoreline's got hundreds of runbooks that we've built and then validated. We're running the same infrastructure. We should, you know, essentially the same tools, the same types of things. We should learn from each other the best practices we've found. And that's the whole purpose of libraries, to give people a, a head start on getting there. And if we see something novel, we're using generative AI to build additional runbooks on the fly uh, based on what's needed. You get a set of recommended steps that you could take, some diagnostics, and then you curate that, test it, and roll it out to your team to handle that type of incident. And finally, we've got a fun free tool that'll actually ingest your ticketing data and do some AI-based uh, categorization and grouping to figure out what are the top problems, what are the things you really need to focus on that you'll get the most bang for the buck for automating. So let's take a quick look at what this looks like. So here in Shoreline, we've got our top problems report. We've, we've sucked your data from PagerDuty or Ops Genie or something, and we've grouped these things together to find the things that are important. And you click right into the thing that looks Im uh, important, and it shows you how many times it happened? What's the MTTR? How many people are involved? And if this looks like something you want to automate, you generate a runbook for that. And here you can see it's starting to build that, the automation steps, the, uh, the actions that are going to be taken to remediate this, as well as um, some diagnostic steps. You pick and choose the ones that make sense for you. Um, you package that up. You export it to Shoreline, and it's ready to be run as a, as a live runbook. Um, these runbooks are tied to alerts, it's launched automatically or, or tied to your ticket data um, and you, from there you can jump into the, the notebook itself, see the steps, see some of these diagnostics coming in. This ticket was about a high CPU problem that we were seeing on some of our pods in the Bookstar app and it's going to provide the diagnostics that show what's happening um, and as you step through the subsequent steps, you know, our hypothesis, maybe this is a garbage collection thing, actually is true. We see the allocation failures happening here. And then we're going to jump down to the recommended action, which is, hey, let's save this data, thread dump, heap dump, put that in S3 for the engineers to figure out what the problem is, bounce those trouble pods, and let's get back to uh, business with that bookstore. Um, everything, like I said, in Shoreline is going to be audited. So you can see in the dashboard the actions that have happened, what, you know, what's gone on, and you can come back and see individual step by step, whether this was something that's fully automated or something that was run by your team. So that's a super quick five steps, one slide, what Shoreline does. We'd love to show you a more detailed view of that. Um, you can visit us in the booth upstairs. Um, you may ask, who do we work with? They're typically companies that have a large cloud infrastructure today, a rapidly growing cloud infrastructure, 
or they're, uh, you know, they're looking at a cloud migration project and trying to figure out how are they going to manage this infrastructure with a team that's you know, not going to scale the way that system is going to scale. So one last bit of fun. We'd love to have you join us tomorrow night. We're running a party with Sumo Logic and Kentech. Um, stop by the booth. And uh, we'll, we'll get you signed up if that QR code isn't, you know, you're not quick enough on the trigger to sign up. Uh, just a couple blocks away at Hunt and Gather. Uh, hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Shoreline. All right, well, our next speaker is getting all plugged in and all set up. Yeah, I just want to make a, a, a statement here on Joe's talk that, uh, you know, he posted a, an incendiary tweet I made about Kubernetes. <laughs> Uh, and, I, and I need to actually kind of clear the air on that tweet because, um, you know, I received a call from a conference organizer who will remain nameless, who was very frustrated about the state of technology and, and was confiding in me about uh, their, their, the pain and suffering around Kubernetes. And I hear this often. I talk to a lot of operations people. And, and, and this person was just like, oh, I, I wish I could, I could say something about this online, but, like, I just can't. Like, I just can't deal with the backlash. And I was like, I got you, buddy. I will launder this tweet for you in five seconds. I was at my son's. <laughs> I was at my son's school party, and I'm just like, I will, I will shit post this out so hard right now. Needless to say, uh, some people had opinions on it, and I haven't looked at my Twitter since. Um, all right, well, I'm really excited for this talk. I hope you are too. Let's give a big round of applause. Let's do it. How you doing? Um, I'm Dan Ravenstone. Uh, my talk is about thinking critically about learning. Uh, a little bit about me. Dad, an engineer, skateboarder. I like to do photography as well, so you'll see that sprinkled throughout my presentation. And I have ADHD, so I'm really great at starting things, really bad at, and I get distracted really easily too. <laughs> uh, I also talk really fast as well, so I've got a couple of notes on here, so to make sure that I speak slowly. Uh, it's not a shock color, but at least it'll, it does work for me, so <laughs> we'll take it, hope that'll work. All right, so another talk on alerting. Um, this is interesting, because there's like four talks at least, but possibly more in this, uh, uh, this conference where we're talking about alerting and on-call. It's still a problem, which is really kind of alarming almost, but it is still there. Um, it, it's, uh, it amazes me that sometimes you get these alerts and people are just don't, like they ask, like, what am I supposed to alert on? What am I supposed to do with this? What am I supposed to monitor? Which was actually brought up earlier by Adriana, which is like, these are the kind of questions you get all the time. It's like, how do you answer this? But first I want to talk about alert fatigue because that is a problem. We have to be actually very cognizant of the fact that alerts do cause problems. And I'm going to get into a couple other little things, but first I want to sort of First fire, a lot, I uh, actually had a survey, um, and you know, 52% 50 of alerts were false positives, 64% were redundant, and that's just not good. Um, when I was at BlackBerry, I was in the lawful access engineering team, and when we were doing that, um, I forgot to set my timer. Uh, <laughs> uh, when we were there, we, um, when we were doing the on-call, we would get like three alerts a night, and because our environment was very critical, we actually had SLAs, we had that year or two, and we had these like black sites or, uh, all over the world. And so we'd have to make sure that our system would come back online right away, or, and it was, very, it was a tedious process, but it only took about 10 minutes at once we kind of got the hang of it. It took a while before we actually figured out how to leverage daemon tools and get that working properly. But that meant though, whoever was on call, and there was only like four engineers on our team, so whoever was on call, every week would be, like that week of on call was, no sleep, because you, you honestly would get paged all the time. And even though we could do our work by, uh, you know, even with our BlackBerry, it would still be, you know, woken up, and it's not fun. Um, and that's when you know what you're supposed to do. Uh, another uh, situation, I was at another company, and I went, went on call, but they had no documentation whatsoever. And, and I'm highly only got two possible scenarios when it, with alert fatigue. There's millions of different ways, but uh, with this particular situation, I got maybe paged three times at the time I was there. It was during the day, so it was fine. So there was people who actually knew the systems and were able to help me out with the problem. But I was terrified of being on call because when you go on call and you don't know what to do when a page comes in, it's, it, it, what do you do? Where do you start? Where do you begin? What, and that is just so frustrating and terrifying and it stresses you out. And this is a thing we would try to avoid. 
So what is alerting? It's decreased quality of output, so your poor customer experience, increased response time, so latency, loss of uh, availability, so downtime. So these are just three sort of high-level concepts. And I like bringing in the Anna Karina principle, um, which is the first line from the book, but I mean, it's said a little differently for us. All happy alerts are alike. Each unhappy alert is unhappy in its own way, and it's so true. So all happy alerts, when they work, you know what they're doing, you know what they're supposed to do, it's great. But when they, you don't know what's supposed to do with it, or it's too many of them, or whatever, all of them have these own little characteristics, and it's really, really hard to deal with. Now, I can't say the second word. Sensitivity versus, I can't say it, so I'm not even going to try but Dan Simon, uh, Slimman uh, posted this article about car alarms and smoke alarms. And he also did a talk here at Monorama in 2014. Read the, read, either read the post, watch the talk, do both. I can't do it justice. But he proves with math that when you have too sensitive of alert, it will cause a problem. You will miss stuff. And it, it, it is so true. How many of us pay attention when a car alarm goes off? We just find it annoying. We wait, oh, why is that guy... Why? And you get upset. You're like, no, no, wait. But when you hear a fire alarm go off, normally, like, the first reaction is, okay, what's going on? And you look around, you look, you feel the door, you're worried, you say, okay, I might have to do something about this because it is actually something that you have to react to. And that's the thing with our alerts today. People still feel that I don't, in case I miss it, I don't want to miss this. And that kind of validation, that kind of thinking actually is hurtful. It causes us stress. So we don't want to do that. So the anatomy of a good alert. I know some people don't feel this way, but I feel that all alerts should have run books. And the reason why I think that is because in a run book to me, in my way of sort of defining that is it doesn't necessarily need to have the solution in place. It just needs to get somebody started going. Sometimes you'll have basically a rock to walk through of all the things you need to do. But in my opinion, it's, you've got to at least have something to start with. So when a person is on call, they have a run book, they, they, and they're woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning, the first thing you're going to do is like, okay, what's going on? And you look at the alert, and you're like, okay, I, I think I know what this is, but it'd be so much easier when you have something to say, okay, check this first, check this first, and if it's this, call this person or call that team or whatever, and you escalate or whatever has to be done. When you don't have that kind of information, and I haven't been there in my, personally been in that situation where you don't have a run book, you don't have documentation about the service you're supporting, it is so stressful. It's one of the worst things I find. The other thing I find, too, is priority. You've got to set your proper priority on these things. Like, I mean, if it's, like, if it's not impacting the user, why is it being sent out? For a couple months ago, I got an alert from staging saying that uh, no data from, uh, like, or incomplete data from uh, one of my alerts in CloudWatch. Why? <laughs> you know, you, you don't need that, right? <laughs> like, why, do we, why do we have this as an alert? Why do we, and you know the problem is, I'm just too lazy to actually fix that. It still comes through sometimes. <laughs> So that's my bad, but anyway. <laughs> um, I like dashboards. I mean, there, there's some, but I like a dashboard where it, 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 I can give them that kind of bit of information. I like a, at a glance kind of dashboards. I don't dashboards solve everything, but for, especially when you're dealing with folks who are new to the, um, to monitoring, new to the concepts, having those baselines and understanding and having that visualization of where they, where, what things are doing and how they're behaving is helpful. So here you go, you're gonna start here, you're gonna be here, you know, okay, this is what's going on. Well, I'm seeing some, okay, that's the anomaly I'm looking for, and that gives you a starting point to go digging deeper. Another big thing I have is labels and tags, um, that, or whatever you wanna name them, but I mean, basically, these things need to be done properly, so people actually know what they are. I've seen mislabeled, mistagged, or no tags, no that. so you, you get these alerts, and you're like, well, who does this belong to? What is this actually impacting? Is this in production, is this in staging? If it's in staging, then why am I getting it? But you have to have these things set properly, and, if, and you have to have consistency. And I find that a lot of times we don't have consistency either in our naming conventions. So in one environment, be, or one group of uh, team will have one way of saying things, another will have another way. So one person will say pro, the other one will say production. You know, uh, one was used client ID, the other one used user ID. You know, it's like, but they're the same thing. So you have this misconception, so it's always important to have that. And of course, is it routed properly, right? So if it's a critical alert, make sure it's going to the on-call. I mean, you have to make sure people get notified about this. So alert control. Now, I've gone through 
a couple times trying to validate alerts. Um, where you go through this process and say, okay, like I was out, uh, again, going back to BlackBerry. We used EMC Smarts at the time back then. I don't know if anybody ever used Smarts, but it was an interesting tool. I won't get into it. Um, it was great, uh, in this, but we would get traps all the time for just network flaps. You know, a port was up and down, up and down, up and down. So we get a million of these of alerts, and I'm not kidding, it was literally a million in the console. It was a waterfall of red of all these network devices flapping. Well, you know, like that, where's the, what's the point of having all that? Because there's no action to be taken on it. So alert controls, lower the sensitivity is one thing. Leverage, I like to use leverage data for sports because they will help sort of show you what is good, right? Um, if you look at baselines, you can understand what's working there, what's not. Um, I find, especially now with uh, a lot of us are working remote, so we don't, some, you know, some, we used to have dashboards in our, in our little areas that are, uh, when we would work, and we would like at least have at least something that's decent we can actually see if something's going on. Now we have to actually go to the dashboard because you're at home. You may have only two monitors or one monitor, so you, you have to do that. So it's, it kind of has to become a change of sort of philosophy how you do that. Alert schedules are very important too. I mean, if it's something that you need to be notified, it's only like, you know, business hours only, then don't have it alerts in the middle of the night. Don't wake up anybody in the, in the, in the, on the weekend. It's not a point, it's pointless. And use auto, remedi auto remedi remediation. So that helps basically, you know, if you can, Run a script, it'll fix the problem. You know, until you actually get, you know, whether it's a bug and you get that sorted out later or something to that effect. But use these kind of tools to do that. And so we would mainly go through this process of trying to you know, triage and validate and eliminate what is good and bad and do that stuff. So reason for this talk and the reason why I, I, I've been sort of going over this is that I've been thinking about how to help developers and engineers actually do this without them really engaging with me. So for give them a, a, a formula to look at their alert, or look, actually let's, let's, let's be very clear, look at the events that are occurring in your environment and whether or not they should alert on it. I, I should have started out off with that sort of definition. There are events in your environment which is fine. Get all the events you need to, but what do you need to alert? What events should be alerted and to, to, to tell you what's going on? So I've been going over this concept, like how do I help engineers and developers to think through this and do this so they can actually have a way to like, okay, I can, I know what events I need to be notified on, but is it too sensitive? And it, so you look at this sort of, and I've, I had some ways of doing this and I'm hoping from after this talk, your feedback will allow for me to sort of get a better idea or you know, does this work? Um, I'll get into a little bit more of that later because I did do a little bit of uh, experimentation with other folks. So, um, Slavic Ligas, who wrote um, Effective Monitoring, he talked about eligibility and severity of alarms. And when I first started working on this, I was thinking about um, uh, recoverability and severity, and I thought, well, I'll just mash it all together. So, impact, frequency, and then recoverability. So, what is the impact to the end user? How often does it happen? And how easy does it recover? And so I broke it down into, well, we'll first talk about impact and frequency. So I broke it down into just, a, just what I'm hoping is a simple thing. Um, and it's like from one to 10. So one being the least impactful or least, or you know, so no impact or it's rare. All the way up to 10 where it's critical, I'm just going down, everything's like toast and it happens often. So that's like a bad scenario, right? So. I mean, if you, you better check your code if you're going to be like constantly going down 100% of the time for like three hours or more. And these things, I was like, okay, this is how I first started looking at these things. And I actually just had a, like a sort of a magic quadrant kind of thing set up originally when I walked out and we could just put dots in where these alerts would fit. But then I added the whole recoverability thing. So my, when I walked through this with a couple of the engineering teams where I currently work, uh, the feedback, I was hoping by this point I was able to give you some actual metrics on how well this worked, whether it did actually reduce the noise. Unfortunately, just because of timing and all that stuff, we didn't really get to that point. So initially right now, though, so where we're at right now is they're just starting to use this, adopt this idea. So they started thinking about this. So they started applying this thinking to their events and seeing which ones were actually causing problems. And it's been favorable. 
And what I've done is I've taken actually the, so the impact and the uh, frequency are you add those two numbers, and then this is the multiplier. So what I've done with this is that if it recovers automatically within 15 minutes, it's like you multiply by one, therefore you should really not be worrying about it at all. Um, and then I've gone obviously to the, the worst case scenario, unknown scenario, recovery time is unknown, full manual intervention. And I, what I'm hoping and I, I'm, when, with this talk is that you can, you know, do these make sense to you? Does the descriptions, the ideas behind it, is the ratings or the iterations between each one make sense to you? To explain to your engineers and developers as the, you know, so they can basically do better event categorization. So hopefully you can be able to tell me about that. Because um, then this will lead, all leads into this legend. So if it rates between one and 19, it's ignore, delete, or auto remediate. That's basically it. So don't have it come to you. Don't, don't alert, don't, don't do anything with it. If you want to throw it on a dashboard or whatever, or graph it, that's fine, but don't, don't, don't wake somebody up for that. Don't even put it in in Slack. I mean, that's, even like putting it in Slack is noisy. Um, if it's a 20 to 49, it's in that sort of sweet spot where it needs to be alerted. And you need to have a rumble. You need to have a starting point. So the engineers who know that they're being called on, paged out have something to start off with, and they can go, I'm going a lot faster than I thought I was going to. Um, <laughs> and then um, 1579, evaluate the event, right? Sometimes if it's, um, you may need to make improvements. It might be a bug improvements or some, you know, you have to do some improvements. Um, but it also could be something external you can't control. Like, you know, if you're in Amazon and US East 1 goes down, which somehow has happened a couple of times already last year in, a, in weird ways, um, then you probably put, might have to figure out how you do your DR a little bit better. Um, but if you have good monitoring, you should be able to detect it and be able to take action. If it's 80 to 100, then you've got a serious problem. Like that alert, it's, it's just a, a doom situation. Um, so hopefully you never have to do, you know, deal with that, but that does happen. And that's it, really. I kind of flew through this a lot faster than I thought, but this is, um, I have a spreadsheet which actually has laid out all this information. So you can actually, you know, take the, take a, the, the, I didn't put it in here, but you can just take it, you can, you can copy it out. Um, and what you can do is you can, you can use the drop downs to start doing those things and it'll give you the number and color code and all that fun stuff at the end as well. So it, if something, that I really want, uh, I'll put it in the Slack channel. So I really want uh, for folks to take a look at it, um, provide feedback. Does it work? I mean, is, is this something that actually helps? Because if it does, that's great. Because that's, that's the goal of this is just to help people, give them the tools to say, here, you can do this. You can figure this out. You can do this on your own. You don't need me. Let me go focus on some other problems, but you can do this. And it kind of teaches them to fish as opposed to fishing for them. Um, and that's it. I thank you very much. Pete's not here yet, so I'll just keep talking. He's running. I hear him. I don't know, some guy. God, who's running this show? <laughs> All right, do we have uh, any questions? Oh, we got one right down here. Yeah, um, there's a lot of different schools of thought, I think, on, on dashboards. I like dashboards, but when they're done properly, quite frankly. Um, it's, um, when you're doing the, uh, to me, this is how I look at it. And I understand, though, but there's also the, the, the threat of having too many dashboards, too much information. So when I've walked through the dashboard concept with folks, I always say, okay, listen, you want to have it at a glance, right? You want to have, you got to, th and think about the key elements. Look for the top left. Down to the right, so your most important is up here. Well, most important is up here, and then down to the right is your least important. But the, keep it in a window. Like, it has to fit your screen. Anything beyond that, especially, like, again, when you're on call and it's the middle of the night, and you want to kind of get some high-level ideas like what is going on, you don't want to be scrolling through multiple pages of a dashboard, because that, that's not helpful either. That's just, just as, as, as uh, terrifying as having no information. 
because you don't know where to look at this point. So you have to know your environment well enough so you can just have those key elements there, the KPIs, or, and eventually hopefully SLIs, and then eventually get into SLOs, and, and then you don't even have to do this stuff anymore, and that would be great. I mean, I want to, <laughs> ideally, this is only for those folks that don't do SLO alerting, because if you do SLO alerting, then you don't need me or this concept. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I got a question in the middle here. So with creating a score, how do you disseminate the information about the score and make it actionable for developers? Yeah, so <laughs> a dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> It's good. So what I like to do is, it, it's you got to get an idea of what, what kind of events are going to be coming out of the environment. So you have to have those metrics come up, and you have to have some some historical analysis, right? You just can't just nobody can just say, oh, I, you know, CPU doesn't matter. But you know, in some cases it does. But normally it doesn't. But in some cases it does. And you want to have that metric, or you want to have that historical analysis to say, okay, you know, this is what's going on, and this is what normal baseline life looks like. And occasionally you may even see when things go off the rails and you look, okay, look, you know what, CPU never spiked, so, you know, we don't need to have an alert on that, we just, but we do need to have latency put in there, and this is the point we have, and you kind of try to, it's an iterative process, like everything else, like, I mean, again, bringing up SLOs, uh, that's an iterative process, you just don't smack an SLO and then say, call it a day and walk away, you have to, you know, start off with a number, see if it works, revisit until you get it right. But, I mean, you have to invest some time to it, but then at the end of the day, once you've kind of done that, it's a lot easier to manage moving forward because you don't have to think about it like that anymore. You don't have to worry so much about these things because you've got a baseline. You have a good understanding of your environment and what's happening. Uh, let's do one more question just to somewhat catch up on time. We'll do this one here. So basically, like the the many teams, many alerts problem. How do you how do you approach that? Yeah. So everybody has, like you said, everybody has their own sort of viewpoints on these things. And I'm hoping this. The idea with this exercise is for people to look closely at their service, right, and understand what is good, what's like a, when the service is working well, and when it's not working well. And hopefully, so they will have different alerts. Like one team may have, you know, who are heavily dependent on RabbitMQ, will have problems there, and they'll want to focus on those alerts. Whereas another team, you know, it's a whole other, you know, they're, they're, they're database queries, so you, you, so you know there are gonna be different alerts. But you want them, my goal with this was for them to look to those events, and so they actually understand, the, the idea is for them to become more familiar with how it actually works in the wild. So when, when somebody mentioned this earlier this morning about when you, as soon as you release the code to, to, uh, to prod, it, you, you, you have users getting on there now. And those users will do things you never thought of. So until you do that, you have to start, you have to have some, if you don't pay attention to what's going on, you'll never understand how to alert on that properly. So this, I'm hoping, forces people to look at that critically and go, okay, we know that this, when this happens, this will impact the user experience. When this happens, nothing, nobody's impacted, so we, we can keep moving on. Um, so that's the idea, it's more part about people getting involved in thinking as opposed to, like this is not a technical solution, this is more like hoping to open up the door a little bit so people can sort of do it themselves and understand why it's important. Awesome, let's do a big round of applause for Dan, great talk. Just a reminder too, you can uh, feel free to accost Dan after his talk in person or uh, you can, I guess, just go into the Slack channel if you have any other 
thoughts or questions, we're going to head into break right now, and we're just going to slightly shorten the break so we can start the talks back on time, and that will be at 3.45, so enjoy some snacks, I'm pretty sure there's some snacks out there, and we'll see you in a little bit.
All right, welcome back. Hopefully everyone is full of sugar from those uh, amazing cookies. Uh, that really got me where I had to go because I don't think there's any amount of coffee that's going to help right now. And we're only on day one, people. <laughs> so I really feel for everyone else who has had to fly. Uh, I flew in from Boston, which is a very short time change co compared to the, the crew that came in from Slovenia and London and all these other places. So... Um, all right, well, I'm actually really excited for this talk because this, uh, these types of talks that um, really make the single track experience so much different than a multi-track conference is that we all are experiencing the same event together and being able to talk about uh, alerting and then talk about the impacts of that alerting uh, and, and the stress that we have to deal with is really, uh, really important. So um, let's give a big round of applause for Mike. Whew. All right, thanks everybody. Um, this is uh, Stress on Calling You. As mentioned, my name is Mike. I'm going to talk a little bit about stress and stress related disease. Um, that's kind of the, the downside of the talk, uh, followed by hopefully the upside of um, things that we've done, things that we've learned through research um, that make stress less damaging to us long term. Basically, ways to modulate the impact of our stress response. A uh, quick background on me before I dive in uh, I'm an SRE. And I've been breaking production for like 12 years. Um, and I've been on call for most of it, so most of those pages went straight back to me. But um, that doesn't mean that I don't like being on call. Um, I don't love it. It's not my favorite part of the job. It is quite stressful. But I don't want this talk to seem like I'm saying on call shouldn't be part of our jobs. Um, it's, it's one of the best feedback loops we have for how production works. It's the difference between the theoretical um, application of our service and the reality of it. So um, yeah, don't get rid of on call. But I think that. We all know that on-call can be stressful, um, as Dan kind of alluded to in the previous talk. It can be terrifying. I've certainly been part of rotations that um, gave me anxiety the week before my rotation even started, because I knew that once that my rotation did kick off, I wasn't going to get sleep. I was going to get paged incessantly for stuff that I didn't really have control over, things I couldn't really change. And I knew that it hadn't gotten better since the last time I was on-call, because it was hard to prioritize that work, hard to make the tech deck go away. Um, and that put a lot of strain on my personal relationships. It meant my dogs, who deserve all the love in the world, didn't get all that love, and that didn't sit well with me. So I uh, got interested in this stuff. I got interested in understanding why um, stress does the things to us that it does, uh, how to better handle it, um, and patterns that folks have found over the last 100 or so years of research to make it less uh, controlling over us and less impactful for us over long periods of time. I do want to call out separately, though, that I'm not classically trained in that stuff. I'm not um, a doctor, I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, I'm very interested in this space, and I found a lot of the content to be really accessible, um, and I'm really happy to share that. If, if anyone is interested in learning more about this space or seeing some um, of the background behind the research studies that I'll talk about up here, hit me up in the Slack channel, and I'm happy to share those out. There's also a bunch of really cool stuff in terms of books, uh, video lecture series. A lot of times you can just sit in on things from uh, Stanford and Harvard and just take those classes for free if you want to know more about how our bodies handle stress and the neuroscience behind it. Um, it's a really cool space. So uh, with that out of the way, um, I think it's worth first getting a vocab check in place. Um, we all have probably experienced stress. It manifests for all of us in slightly different ways, and that's, that's completely normal. Um, but fortunately, there's sort of a funnel uh, for stress. There's a point um, that most of our bodies will all run through the same response um, that's quite easy to measure. It's got a common set of what I honestly just think of as SLIs that um, make it really good for research. And that's what I'm referring to when I'm talking about stress up here, I'm mostly talking about the stress response, um, which we'll touch on in a second. The response itself uh, is, was discovered in the 30s by a researcher named Hans Selye. And like many wonderful things in science, it was not intentional. He was not studying stress. He was just really unfortunately for his lab rats, but fortunately for us, like terrible at handling lab animals. He would um, forget to feed them or forget to leave the heat on or he'd forget to leave their cages locked and so they'd escape and he'd have to chase them around the lab with a broom. And these poor rats just lived incredibly stressful lives. Uh, what we now know as stressful lives and they all developed chronic diseases. And he um, fortunately had the insight to put those two things together and uh, connected the dots. And he proposed this idea that we all um, are vying towards homeostasis. And for the folks that haven't thought about seventh grade biology in a long time. Don't worry, I hadn't either. Uh, homeostasis is like that Goldilocks system. It's the, the state where we have all the right energy. We have all the right food, shelter. We're safe. We're not getting paged. All of these things are the perfect homeostatic balance. And when parts of our environment knock us out of that, um, he proposed those were stressors. 
and our body's response to those stressors uh, was the stress response, which we'll touch on in a minute. It's uh, broken up into two parts, kind of the easiest way to think about it. Um, none of this is going to be on the test, so don't worry about writing any of it down. But um, the easiest way to think about the two components is kind of the gas and the brake. You have the sympathetic nervous system. This is the thing that triggers all the parts of stress that we generally associate with stress. It uh, increases our heart rate. It launches cortisol or glucocorticoids in our bloodstream so that our muscles have more energy. They can do everything they want. Um, it excites parts of our hippocampus. It makes parts of our brain a little bit more um, rapid to think. It's probably why I'm talking extra fast up here, uh, because that's what stress does. Um, and then we have a separate part, the flip side of the coin, the parasympathetic nervous system that does the opposite. The same way the sympathetic floods our body with hormones to get us out of an emergency situation, to help us deal with um, life or death situations, the parasympathetic floods our body with hormones to put us back into a rest and digest state to get us back towards all the work that we know is important, um, but isn't as critical when we're in an emergency. And the advantage of this system is mostly an evolutionary one. Um, when you are in a group of folks that are uh, perhaps walking in the savanna and you encounter a lion, if you can uh, get a little bit more energy, a little bit more oxygen to the muscles that need it, um, you're gonna run a little bit faster and you're gonna survive that encounter slightly more likely, or you're more likely to survive that encounter um, than the other members of your group. Same thing if you're able to think a little bit faster or if your immune system is able to respond to infection a little bit faster. All of these things give you a slightly higher chance of passing your genes along to the next generation, which of course passes along the stress response to the next generation. Um, easy way to think about this is we get really bad super, superhero powers for short periods of time that are focused purely on survival, focused on handling that emergency um, which is kind of how the stress response becomes our emergency response system, our internal incident management system. Uh, this <clears throat> has kind of evolved across the animal kingdom. It's not unique to humans. It's certainly not unique to mammals. But um, we have a specific uh, sort of shortcoming here when it comes to humans and some advanced primates in that we have continued building on that legacy infrastructure. Our underlying alert system, sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system, these things uh, have been around for hundreds of millions of years, but we've continued to evolve things like the cortex and the prefrontal cortex that have given us a bunch of new functionality. And like any modern system connected to any legacy system, there's a bit of loss in translation. Uh, the connection is not always exactly what we expect it to be. So we've evolved awesome new functionality like the ability to share emergencies, um, not just experience the terror of running away from a lion, but also share that with other members of our group so that they don't have to go to that same part of the savanna to learn the same lesson. They can just avoid it altogether. And that's, that's wonderful. That's a great way to help their genes pass along to the next generation. Um, but it means that our underlying alert system sees the same uh, sort of trigger in both scenarios. When we are getting chased by a lion, life or death situation, or when we are hearing about getting chased by a lion, life or death situation, to the alert system, it's the same thing. We're still triggering the same response. We're still flooding our body with the same hormones, um, and then eventually flooding them with the opposite hormones to turn off the emergency response. And this is not too bad um, in general. If you, as long as you don't live close to a zoo, um, you're not running into lions very often. Uh, but most of us trigger the stress response not just because of true life or death situations. We trigger it because of any number of things that happen in the modern world. We trigger it because we're stuck in traffic. Uh, we trigger it because we are watching the stock market, it's not doing what we expected it to do, or um, as Dan mentioned, because we're getting paged in the middle of the night every three hours and it's preventing us from going to sleep um, and we're knocked out of that homeostatic balance and so the sympathetic nervous system comes in and tries to get us back into it. Um, and when we're in those situations where we're chronically triggering that stress response and we're chron chronically sort of engaging these um, additional sort of powers for us, um, it's, not, it's not free. The stress response is penny-wise and dollar-foolish. It comes at a cost. We can think about it kind of the same way that you normally handle an incident response. Um, when you're handling a site outage, it doesn't make sense to think about the deliverables three or four or five quarters down the line. The point at the moment is to get the site back online. It's to recover from the outage. It's to mitigate the problem. And that's exactly what our uh, stress response is doing. It's focused on getting us out of that emergency situation, getting us to either fight or flight. And to do that, it turns off a bunch of other stuff uh, that is expensive. 
It is very expensive. It takes a lot of blood and energy for our bodies to break down proteins and turn them into amino acids and then turn those into cells. Um, but it's not useful in an emergency. Like that's just not the best use of time and energy if you're running away from that lion. So digestion, growth, healing, repair, turned off. Reproduction, turned off. Um, and again, this isn't so bad in a world where we only come across that lion once a month. Um, but it gets more damaging. It gets more... Uh, painful for us over long periods of time when it's every day or when it's uh, a week long every month or um, when it's something that we just kind of continually uh, own and, and manage for the entirety of our careers, this stuff will add up. And it adds up in kind of all the bad ways that you can imagine. Um, the stress response and uh, sort of stress-related um, pathologies are Across the, across the board as far as things that they can affect. Um, the cardiovascular system basically just gets slammed all the time by being in emergency mode. It's pumping extra blood that it wasn't expecting to pump. It's shooting a bunch of extra sugars into your bloodstream that it wasn't expecting. All of these things put more wear and tear on the system. They get our insulin response kind of mucked up, so we have to deal with things like diabetes long-term. Um, our gastrointestinal our immune systems, both of these get confused by the toggling, the constant uh, flapping of the system when we're triggering a stress response because we got paged and then we silence that alarm and we go back to sleep and then it happens again an hour later. We're triggering the sympathetic nervous system, flooding our body with all these hormones to sort of figure out the problem, get, it, get, us, get ourselves out of it. And then separately, an hour later, flooding it with uh, parasympathetic nervous system responses, turning things back off, turning things back on, turning things back off. Um, and that toggling over time just kind of confuses our body. It leads to um, damages to our, or, or I guess, uh, issues with our immune system in both suppression and, uh, sorry, immunosuppression and autoimmune diseases, which is to say it can make our immune system more active, like fight things that it shouldn't be fighting, as well as ignore things that it should be fighting. Gastrointestinal, same way. Neurobiological, kind of the same way. We end up traversing a lot of neural pathways that get strengthened as we traverse them um, that aren't necessarily the things we want strengthened over long periods of time. So we see growth in things like the amygdala, we see decay in things like the hippocampus. Not great uh, for the longevity of our careers, not great if we want to be healthy long term. Fortunately, um, that's all the bad stuff, not the good stuff. Fortunately, uh, folks have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to better manage this stuff. Um, we all know that stress sucks uh, and folks that have funded a lot of research over the last 100 years have spent time and energy to figure out um, patterns to not necessarily just remove stress from the equation, but to deal with stress knowing that it's just gonna be part of our lives. One researcher in particular out of um, Rockefeller in the 70s named Jay Weiss was really good at this. He came up with some really cool kind of keystone studies that have been repeated a whole bunch of times. And those are the ones I wanna to touch on the most. Um, and he did this by yoking rats together. And uh, when I say yoked rats here, I'm not talking about egg yolks. I'm also not talking about like super ripped shredded rats that lift weights all the time. I'm just talking about rats that are connected with an electric circuit. And that electric circuit guarantees that when they experience stressors, um, they're gonna experience them at the same time of day, same frequency, same duration, same severity. Um, it gives them, it gives a sort of, it gave Weiss rather, um, a chance to see the same stress uh, situation for two rats and then compare them over time when you introduced small changes to the environment of one rat. He did this uh, so that he, had, he could kind of verify some of his hypotheses. One of the first ones was that he believed being able to predict uh, stressors, being able to say, I think I'm about to get stressed pretty soon, would be protective, would, be, would give our bodies a chance to warm up or stretch sort of those stress muscles before they had to cold start into the stress response. And he did this by having these two yoked rats together. One of them uh, had a little warning light before every stressor went off before they were about to get stressed, um, ten, sort of 10 seconds or so before the light would go off. And that would give them advance notice. And he, he believed that, uh, that this would protect the rats against the long-term damages of stress, help the rats recover from stress a little bit faster. And that's basically what happened. I think this is intuitive for those of us that have kind of been in stressful situations. Um, if you know it's coming, you can prepare a little bit. But kind of critically, one of the big findings here uh, was that knowing about it Starting was useful. Knowing about it ending was really useful. Um, knowing that uh, our parasympathetic nervous system, that break, could come in and start turning off all those uh, emergency response systems, could start silencing all of our internal alerts, that was incredibly valuable. It gave us a chance to um, 
recover faster to, to clear out all the cortisol from our system and to start doing all that KTLR work that we'd been putting off during the emergency. Uh, Weiss also proposed that having control over one's environment would be useful, would be uh, a great way to protect against stress. Um, and so he did the same test with one minor change. In this case, two rats yoked together, same duration, severity, et cetera, of stressors, but one had a lever. When the stressors started, they could run over that lever and they could hit the lever, and stressors would stop for both rats. So we're not seeing one rat get stressed, let the stressors turn off early. It happens for both of them, but to the second rat, they start and stop randomly. Only the first one knew that their actions changed the outcome of the world. And as you can imagine, this made things less stressful. I think anyone here that's uh, been able to actually solve problems in a, a high-level incident, um, it is dramatically, uh, I guess it feels quite good. It, it helps us resolve that internal stress very quickly when we can affect change in that environment. But kind of as Dan mentioned in the previous talk, when we go into it without knowing anything, without having the uh, run books or without having enough knowledge of the systems, that's when stuff gets considerably more wild, more confusing. Um, but control was found to make stressors less stressful. And this is, this is mostly measured by that SLI I uh, mentioned earlier, the glucocorticoid count. This can be monitored throughout the duration of stress response, and we can see that uh, when the first rat had control, the amount of stress they experienced was lower, which meant the recovery from that stress was faster, um, which meant return to baseline was also faster. The last one, the last Keystone study I think is worth talking about here, um, is one around social support. Weiss proposed that being not alone during a stressful event made that stressful event less stressful. Um, or rather, at, at the very least, protected us um, from the impacts of that stress. And so he had the same setup, two yoked rats. In this case, after each stressful event, uh, one rat was able to go hang out with friends. They were able to leave their cage, go groom each other, go play, go curl their little fists at the stars and scream about how unfortunate it is to be a rat in a lab specifically designated towards testing stress. That's a very unfortunate roll of the dice. And all of that helped. Being able to commiserate with the other rats, being able to groom, be able to sort of release that tension and share the load um, made stress less impactful in the system. It made long-term pathologies reduced. So much so that this study has been repeated many, many times, not just across rats, but across humans in a whole bunch of different situations, social and otherwise. Um, we still don't know fully the extent to which community seems to provide a protection against all-cause mortality, but we know for sure that it um, is incredibly protective against stress-related pathologies. Um, just having that additional support, having some sense of community that you can go to to share the pain, or at the very least, um, get your mind off of it quicker is a really, really wonderful system to have in place. So what does that all mean for on-call? What does that mean for incident management culture? Um, hopefully it's already a little obvious. Um, there's kind of three points here. We should make our on-call more predictable. Easy to say, hard to do. We should make our on-call um, operators more empowered to change things. Easy to say, hard to do. Uh, and we should make sure that our on-call operators don't feel alone that they're not isolated, um, that they have the support of the team behind them. Easy to say and really, really hard to do. Um, so I don't have like a great guaranteed list of things here, uh, but I can go through a couple specific examples, things that I've found useful. Um, I would love it if folks could share things that their team uses in the Slack channel. Um, I'm still trying to find more ways in which we can categorize some of these patterns so that we can share them out holistically across the industry. These are just a few that um, popped into my head off the bat. For prediction, we should use on-call rotations. If you're not, please do. <laughs> uh, don't make people be ready for an emergency 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365.25 days a year. It's just not sustainable. Give them a chance to engage that parasympathetic nervous system. Give them a chance to actually disconnect. If the only time folks can step away is when they're on vacation, that is not enough. Um, and that's not just to say that you're going to burn out your engineers and you have to hire new folks. This is, your systems will become less stable. Systems, all, everything that we run is not a technical system. It is a socio-technical system. So when you make your team more resilient, when you make your services more resilient, all of that works together. Um, and this is part of the thing that makes that socio-technical socio system more resilient, um, is making sure that your operators are healthy and happy. Another one that's probably more controversial is considering boundaries when you're introducing change. Um, I'm not saying don't ship code on Fridays. 
What I'm saying is that if you're shipping code on Fridays, or if you want to get to that world where you can ship code any time of day, uh, and your CI, CD system is going to catch everything that will break pre-production, and the stuff that breaks in prod you're going to catch with your canary, and the stuff that makes it past the canary you're going to catch with your automated alert system. I want to get there too. Um, I would love to be in the world where all of our systems are just fully rolled back and we never actually even have to think about service health, but realistically it takes time, um, and in this case it takes a lot of pain for us to get there. You have to learn a lot of the things that your service um, is responsible for, like occasionally just by getting paged for them or having folks be getting paged for them. So when you're thinking about the longevity and sort of the support for your uh, human operators, try to account for how much this is gonna cost them in things like health debt. When it comes to empowering operators, once again, easy to say, hard to do. The most obvious thing to me is to make sure that we're doing stuff with our action items from incidents. If you're going through the effort of recording incident, having a postmortem, figuring out the action items, um, at the very least, try to get some of them done and to market those out. Make sure that the other folks that are responsible for other things in your system, other operators in your community, see that change happens. Um, don't let AIs go to the backlog to die forever. Um, just let folks know, let folks internalize that change happens and that things get better over time so they're not showing up to every on-call thinking it's gonna be just as bad as it was before. Um, also, back to the previous talk from Dan, calibrate your alerts. Uh, this, again, this one actually feels a little easy, like not that hard to do, like set aside an hour or um, a couple hours every six months to just run through all of your alerts and make sure that they're still measuring the right thing, make sure the queries are still valid, make sure that the thresholds are realistic. Um, it's a short, small cost, and it is going to reduce the noise for your systems, which is always great. It's gonna make sure you cover gaps that you didn't know you had, and it's gonna give feedback to your operators to know that things are getting better, that we're not just letting this stuff build up indefinitely um, in our alerting systems. And on the community side, on that social support side, if there were a good runbook for this, I think um, a lot of folks in the management side of the world would be using it already um, or would be out of jobs, I don't know. Um, but I, I don't think this is easy. I think this is probably the hardest of the bunch, um, especially in the hybrid world where we're all split across different offices, maybe we're all fully remote. I know, I'm guessing most of the folks in this audience have been in at least one Zoom call in the last couple of years that was just, um, an icebreaker and then like awkward crickets for the next 20 minutes. And that sucks, I'm not saying d go do that, um, but keep trying, keep trying to find ways to build your team's trust in each other, keep trying to find ways to get them closer together so that they can rely on each other for production incidents. Um, if those awkward meetings don't work out, try something else. And it's, it's painful and it can be really frustrating um, when these things don't work out. But into, when you find stuff that does work, when you find a way to draw the team closer together where folks know that they're supported, even if it's not necessarily an immediate escalation during an incident, but they just have folks that they trust that they can go to to rant about the state of the world and then get it out of their system so that they can go on to make things better, that's huge. That's, a, that's something that will pay back into not just, again, the, the individual technical system being better, but the whole socio-technical system being better. Your, your entire service set will be more resilient because your operators are more resilient. And that's kind of the gist. Um, the corny side uh, is the last slide, which is to say it's not stress on calling you, it's all of us. Um, I don't think we're at a point yet in the industry where we can safely assume that being on call in any service randomly is gonna be a safe thing. Um, I think when you're interviewing for a new place, it's a reasonable question to ask how bad on call is and a reasonable question to be suspicious about the answer because no one's really gonna share the true depths of it. Um, but I think that we can get there. I think we can get to the point where most of the time on call isn't terrible. Um, but I think that to do that, we have to share out some of these practices. We have to find ways to, um, I guess, normalize the approach that we take so that we can all get a little bit better. And I think that's the end. The last one's just the, would you like to know more? All right, thank you. Uh, who's got some questions here? Any questions from the audience? I see one. Oh, right up here. Maybe this is like a scary question, but does any of the research that you've talked about talk about like a threshold? So like what level of stress, because there's definitely going to be some level of stress that's inherent in off work and when we've all experienced it, maybe all top of all, also experienced like too much stress. <coughs> is there any data about what, what's the threshold? Is that individual? Is it like your team threshold? Your organization threshold? What is your threshold? 
So uh, the question is, is there any threshold, whether individual, team, organizational, that, uh, you know, I guess mm -hmm. matter for this, uh, any research on it, especially around the different thresholds? Yeah, I, I don't think I have a study off the top of my head for that. Um, I will say that uh, there's one researcher, Robert Sapolsky, who does a bunch of stuff in this space, and he's definitely done a bit of research into that for other primates. Um, and it has not been a universal approach, right? I, I, which is to say kind of what you were mentioning, like it's, it ends up being fairly unique per person. Um, and a lot of that comes down to their experiences, their ability um, to trigger the, basically the second half of the stress response, the parasympathetic to come in and clear things out. And that is not consistent from person to person, um, which makes it a little harder. And so I think that that's one of the things that has led to some of the culture that we have now where um, the folks that can deal with it kind of wash out and the folks that cannot, or sorry, the folks that can't deal with it will wash out and the folks that can will stick around and just be part of the on-call culture that is probably more painful than it needs to be. Um, but yeah, I, I, sorry, TLDR, no, I haven't found <laughs> like a, a number yet. Um, but it's, a, it's a definitely worth asking. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, any other questions? Oh, I got one right here. Thanks for the talk, Mike. Um, I have a question about the control aspect. Mm. Are there any metrics mm. that are a proxy for the feeling of control as it relates to stressors? Yeah, I, turning that qualitative data into quantitative data would be wonderful. I have not seen anything yet um, that immediately comes to mind for, uh, aside from, yeah, essentially like opinion polls, like how safe do you feel or how much uh, sort of reactivity do you feel like your, your team has? Um, this would be a wonderful question for things like the DORA research side of the world. Um, and I don't know how, I'd, I'd be curious to see where they have, have landed on that type of stuff. Um, yeah, the, the helplessness side is a, is a tricky one um, because it's, it's fairly insidious. Um, it kind of leads, you know, it's, it's a bit cyclical. Um, I think one of the scary bits on that space in general um, from the research that is kind of neat is that once you unlearn helplessness, once you feel that there is a sense of feedback and that you can change things, um, there have been a few, num a few studies, uh, double blind, that have shown that you can actually remove that ability. You can make things no longer um, actually affect change, and the protection remains. Um, so even when you, I guess, remove the lever from the rat, um, and they, or remove the connection for the lever from the rat, um, they can still press it and feel like they're doing things, and it will not actually change anything, but it will still protect them from the long-term damage of the stress. Um, which doesn't say that we should just trick people into thinking that they're making things better. <laughs> but if you're in a crunch and you need to, like there, you know, there's a lot of cool research in this space for ways to get some of the benefit without all of the cost. Great. Uh, I see one more in the back there. Yeah, um, you know, talking about on call and the stresses around that, you know, coming out of a pandemic recently, I'm wondering if there was any like uh, research that you found that talked about like baseline stresses and then increases from there, right? Because like as the pandemic happened, I was in an on call team, and I found it much more difficult to be on call. I found even small stressors to be like escalating my responses a lot more because the baseline stress was there. And I'm Yeah, it's a good question of, of uh, any research on higher than normal uh, baseline stressors of personal life or pandemic related uh, we've all experienced over the last few years. Yeah, um, yes, uh, I think so. There's uh, this book here, uh, Behave by Robert Sapolsky, a little bit um, why don't the why zebras don't get ulcers, but more on the behave side, um, touches on the neuroscience of stress quite a bit. And the thing that you're describing to me um, is that we have, we have one part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex that is kind of the thing responsible for us doing the hard thing most of the time. And a lot of times dealing with stress is doing the hard thing. It's making the choice that is better for us long term, but not um, necessarily the thing that we want to do at the moment. It's why we eat vegetables instead of junk food kind of vibe. That's the PFC doing its work. Um, and like anything else, it can get fatigued, um, especially when we're going through 
periods of high stress, we can end up spending a lot of the sugars that are kind of inherently in our bloodstream, which mean we don't have the additional energy we need for the PFC to do its work. Um, and so then it can essentially fatigue uh, and, and we end up falling back on easy behaviors, stuff that um, we don't have to struggle too hard against. Uh, so I, I think if you're interested in that space, or I, I don't have any um, specific studies to point at, but definitely like areas around the prefrontal cortex and um, how we deal with sort of decision making there would be very, very orthogonal to that. All right, great questions. Let's give another round of applause to Mike. <laughs> Definitely an important topic for many of us. Uh, all right, well, while our last speaker is getting plugged in and set up, I just want to remind everyone that uh, after we finish up uh, with the talks today, uh, tonight is the uh, official Monitorama after party. Uh, if you're in the Slack, go to the general channel. It's going to be over at Castaway Portland. If you've been here before, it's a place we've gone previously. There are uh, games, there are food trucks, there's uh, drinks, there's fun, there's networking. It's great. Um, it's from 7 to 10 p.m., so you'll have a nice bit of break to hopefully unwind and uh, grab some dinner or whatever. There will be food there. There will be drinks, so obviously, um, you know, you can take care of that. Uh, address and whatnot is in the Slack. And if you have any problems, just at any one of us, Jason or myself or one of the other organizers, and we'll point you in the right direction. So, awesome. Well, uh, I'm really excited for this talk as well. Uh, really, honestly, big round of applause for all the speakers today, day one. Uh, they've all been amazing. Um, but let's give it up for Brooke for our last talk of the day. Hello. Can you all hear me okay? Awesome. Well, thanks for hanging out with me for the last talk of the day. I really appreciate you all being here. I attended my first Monitorama last year and had an incredible time. And on the flight home, I felt really inspired and started brainstorming talk ideas. And I'm super excited to now be here this year as a speaker giving one of those talks that I brainstormed. So today, we are going to be talking about how observability intersects with software engineering team culture. Before we jump in, I'll share just a little bit about me. My name is Brooke, and I am a software engineer at Honeycomb, which is an observability tool to help engineer engineers understand what their code is actually doing out in production so they can solve bugs and outages more quickly and effectively. I've been at Honeycomb for just over a year now, and I work on the API and partnerships team. So I work on our external APIs, Terraform provider, and integrations with other tools in the developer ecosystem like PagerDuty and GitHub. Prior to joining Honeycomb, I worked for a Fortune 50 company where I worked on headless e-commerce websites and IoT, or Internet of Things. And I was actually a Honeycomb user at that job. And I got really interested and passionate about observability when working on IoT specifically because there's a lot of complexity in orchestrating the firmware and the mobile apps and the cloud that really helped me to see the value of observability. During my time there, I worked in both IC roles and manager roles. And so I was able to experience firsthand how helpful observability tooling can be as an engineer trying to solve problems. But then also when I put on the manager hat, I could see the bigger picture of how it also made the team unit better. And when I'm not working, I really enjoy baking. Pies, cookies, and breads are my favorite things to make. So like I said, before I became a Honeycomb employee, I was a Honeycomb user. And everyone on my team at the time, and really the company overall, were pretty new to observability. So today I want to share a story based on that journey of observability adoption and how implementing an observability practice impacted the culture of the team. So we start with a team of four engineers. For the purposes of this talk, we'll just refer to them as the Avengers. The Avengers have been asked to build a connected device platform for their company. The goal of the platform is to store device data and keep mobile apps and firmware synced up with the most up-to-date data. The team thinks this sounds like really interesting work and they accept the mission. They want to build a really strong platform and knock their deliverables out of the park. 
So the first thing they did was get together to talk about the standards and best practices they wanted to follow while building this platform to make it the best they could. They settled on the following standards. Code gets to prod in less than 15 minutes once it's committed against mean. Around 70% or greater unit test coverage is recommended before merging a PR. End-to-end -end canary tests run on core code paths a few times per hour and proactively alert on errors. And team members merge small frequent changes to keep diffs manageable. The Avengers were feeling pretty good about themselves after agreeing on this list. Most of them had worked on legacy systems before, where these things were either an afterthought or not included at all. They wanted to build a better system. Despite setting those standards and holding each other accountable to them, the more engineers that onboarded to the team and the more features and complexity they added to the platform, things got more painful to operate and understand. When discussing that pain as a team, there were two main sticking points they felt they needed to resolve to hold true to that promise of building a better system and a better way of doing things than they had experienced in the past. And those were confidence in deploys and time to resolution. When the team had a retrospective to talk through the struggles they were having solving bugs as quickly as they wanted to and were expected to, there was a lot of discussion around their logging solution, which was sending unstructured log data to CloudWatch logs. It wasn't easy to correlate their log lines to a problem at hand, let alone correlate multiple logs across multiple Lambda functions to create a full picture of what might be going on. They were starting to feel that relying only on these logs to operate their platform to meet their own expectations and the expectations of other teams in the company building on top of their platform was not setting them up for success. A couple members of the team had been hearing about observability and the benefits they'd heard about sounded like it might be able to help resolve their pain, but they still didn't really know what it meant to have observability or how to get started. So they set off to do some research on observability and what it would take to implement it. Despite hearing great things about observability and how important it was, they realized no one on the team could really define it. There are many def different definitions of the word floating around, but this is the one that they ended up agreeing on. Observability is a measure of how well the internal states of a system can be inferred from knowledge of its external outputs. This definition helped the team rally around a goal for what they wanted to accomplish. They wanted to stop needing to push new code when they noticed something wasn't working in order to be able to get enough information to debug and troubleshoot. They wanted their system to consistently push out signals to let them know both what was succeeding and what was failing so that they could eventually get to a place where they could proactively solve problems instead of chasing bug reports. Once they had agreed on a definition and understood what they were aiming for, the Avengers tackled how to make their system observable. I mentioned earlier that they were sending unstructured data to CloudWatch logs. So one of the first things they realized was how important and foundational structuring that data was on their path to observability. On the left and the right, we see an example of the same log with all of the same information but on the right, each value is associated with a key that will help with searchability and discoverability when we want to dig into a problem later on. All right, so the team has formed a really solid foundation by rallying around a common goal, and they've converted their unstructured log data to structured log data. They continue along on their journey by adding distributed tracing to their code. If you're new to tracing, this means that they started taking those structured logs or events that we just talked about 
and connecting all of the events that happen within a single request by a unique identifier called the trace ID. Each event in the trace is then referred to as a span and has all of the attributes the engineers think their future selves might care about when debugging. They did this starting with the most important service first and then carved out dev cycles in each sprint to add traces to at least one more service until each service was fully instrumented. They invested in a tool to help with visualization and discoverability of the telemetry data they were generating. In this case, they chose Honeycomb. And this tool displayed their traces with multiple spans as a waterfall so they could see how the code was executed, how long each function call took, and the actual data associated with the function call in production. And most importantly, they added an ongoing practice of observability to their code review process and held each other accountable to, the, to answer the question, how can we observe this in prod before shipping new features? This is an example of what that waterfall view looked like once they had implemented tracing. So this entire waterfall is the trace and then each node within that waterfall is a span. And every span is associated with one of those structured logs the team focused on emitting from their function calls. And when a span is clicked on, we'll see all of the structured data associated with it. So if they wanted to know the exact device type or device ID being provisioned, or which user ID might be having trouble provisioning their device, it's right there at their fingertips. Over the next month or two, their confidence in deploys increase, and every team member, regardless of experience level, can jump into debugging, finding answers much more quickly than before. The pain they were feeling is lifting, but most importantly, now that the team has an observability practice in place, there is a noticeable shift in culture. So now we're going to dig into um, a little bit more how observability can contribute to a stronger team culture and we'll still reference back to the team from our story. So we mentioned a shift in culture. The way it shifted was from a knowing culture to a learning culture. What does that mean? In a knowing culture, people are doing the same thing over and over again and know exactly how it's going to go as a result. Confidence is gained from repetition. In a learning culture, it's more common to do things you haven't done before, but with the confidence that you can observe and measure how it's behaving and adjust as needed. Work in learning cultures is approached much more like a bunch of little experiments. Like observability, there are a lot of definitions of culture of learning or learning culture floating around, but this one is my favorite. A mindset within an organization where learning and improvement are at the heart of how people prioritize their time, do their jobs, and interact with one another. In the book Accelerate, which is a fantastic book about high-performing teams and the behaviors that separate high-performing teams and low-performing teams, it is stated in the section on organizational culture and identity that the best thing you can do for your products, your company, and your people is institute a culture of experimentation and learning. And observability is a practice that will help you do that. So I wanna share some qualities that are core to a culture of learning and how practicing observability contributes to building these qualities on engineering teams, as well as other things teams can do outside of observability that exhibit these same qualities that will strengthen your team. First, we have make learning habitual. Like I mentioned earlier in the talk, a really important part of implementing an observability practice is baking it into the processes that work for the team. The Avengers made sure that asking how to observe a feature was part of their code review process, as well as actually going and observing it post-merge. It became a habit within the life cycle of a feature, 
and it allowed the engineers to make any necessary adjustments before calling a feature done and shifting their focus to something new. This is one example of learning being habitual, but it can be habitual in other ways too, such as normalizing, sharing what you've learned when you make a mistake or a faulty deployment occurs with the rest of your team instead of trying to pretend like it didn't happen. Reward curiosity. Good observability tooling does this by ensuring information is at your fingertips and every time you ask a question of your system, you're quickly rewarded with information and being at least one step closer to an answer or a solution. Other ways this can be modeled on engineering teams is engineers of all levels being comfortable, admitting when they don't know things, asking questions, and initiating experiments. This behavior can go a long way in shaping junior engineers to see people who have been promoted and climb the ladder to senior, staff, and principal levels still have that curiosity to ask questions and learn rather than act like they have all the answers. Value progress over perfection. Rewarding and valuing progress is a great way to encourage learning. Without being trapped by the rigidness of perfection, a team can be much more exploratory and take risks that can lead to really big wins. The practice of observability demonstrates progress because you don't need to know every attribute that you want to track up front. It's a journey. You start with the attributes you think your future self will want to know about, but if in the middle of solving a problem, you wish you had access to a couple of other attributes or you notice a function call doesn't have a span associated with it, you can add them. As you and your team practice observability, you'll get better at it and your system will become more and more observable over time. This quality can also be shown through size of deploys. Earlier when talking about the standards the Avengers agreed to, one of them was small frequent deploys. Being able to sense when your code adds value and merge it rather than waiting until it is perfectly baked and matches your vision exactly is a superpower. And finally, we have make learning social. Learning should be something that your team can do together. This manifests through observability in having links to interesting graphs and queries to share. So problem solving and debugging can truly become a team sport. With this capability, even remote teams can look over each other's metaphorical shoulders and build on what their teammates have discovered to reach a solution quickly. Outside of observability, having lunch and learns and hack weeks can be great ways to socialize learning on your engineering team. Hopefully seeing these commonalities between learning culture and observability starts to show how practicing observability improves your team's learning culture. And because it impacts team culture, every member of an engineering team stands to benefit from observability. To showcase this a bit further, I want to highlight a few different archetypes on the engineering team from our story and talk about how they each benefited from this journey the team has gone on. First, we have Michael. He is a senior engineer who has been recruited to join the Avengers. He has quite a, a bit of experience coding and working on systems, but he hasn't worked on a team with a strong observability practice before. He's pretty new to the concept in general. What he noticed through his onboarding process is that he's able to get up to speed faster than usual. Having a tool where he can see traces, how services interact, and the schema of the system helps him assemble a mental model so he can begin contributing. Having fresh eyes on system telemetry data also means he can point out things that don't make sense to him, but the rest of the team already sees as normal and solve bugs with only a couple weeks on the team under his belt. He's also able to work on different parts of the system with relative ease, using the telemetry data as a compass to get himself oriented and understand the attributes that are important and the general flow of information through the system. As he onboards to this new way of working, 
He also learns to share context with his team members by instrumenting his own code, so anyone on the team can understand what's going on when it breaks, not just him. Next we have Brittany. She is a mid-level engineer who is eager to learn and level up in her software engineering career. She was on the team prior to the push for observability and once distributed tracing was added and she learned how to explore the data in Honeycomb, she felt far more empowered to jump into investigating bugs and outages. She used to only feel helpful troubleshooting problems that she recognized and had experienced before but now with observability tooling in place, she also feels helpful figuring out brand new errors as well. As a result of jumping into solving so many new problems, she is able to level up in her career faster than she would have on a team with no observability practice because she wouldn't have had the confidence or the right tooling to solve those same problems. She is able to gain context and learn from senior engineers like Michael through the instrumentation they place in their code. Then there's Tony. He's been brought onto the team as an apprentice after teaching himself to code for several months. He will be on the team for six months to learn how to be a software engineer and launch his career in tech. He has a lot to learn, and while how to instrument code and the jargon around observability still feels a bit confusing and overwhelming to him, he's still able to reap the benefits of the instrumentation the team has put in place. He was chosen as an apprentice because of the curiosity he exhibited, and Honeycomb is the perfect place for him to ask endless questions to learn and satisfy that curiosity. He feels like it's the stack overflow of the actual system he's working on and loves having a visual way to understand how data flows through the system. Not to mention, he has a place to independently ask questions and be curious on top of also having senior engineers around to ask questions of. He doesn't think he would have been able to ramp up on the system as thoroughly or effectively if he was left to shuffle through only cloud watch logs to figure out how things worked. The impact of a team having a strong observability practice doesn't necessarily stop with that team. In bigger organizations where not all teams have the same standards and tool sets, one team's telemetry data can also benefit other dependent teams. In the case of our story, the Avengers built a connected device platform, so any teams building mobile apps or, or firmware on top of that platform stand to benefit from insights into how the platform is behaving. So the final archetype we will talk about today is an engineer on a neighboring team, the Guardians. Their team is building an app that sends data to the Avengers platform, and they haven't yet gone on their own observability journey. One of the features of the platform is to validate incoming data and reject it if it's outside of the boundaries agreed on by the two teams. To help the Guardians understand what is wrong with the data they've sent that has been rejected, the Avengers provide them with a developer dashboard that shows a table of relevant telemetry data that hit the platform so the Guardians can have a quicker feedback loop and efficiently fix their data problems. Having this data as a common language between the two teams also helps communication about problems in the system go much more smoothly because it becomes less of a blame game uh, with the conversation rooted in data to show clearly where the problem lies. The Guardians are also able to learn observability implementation tips from the Avengers so they can get more visibility into how their app is operating and potentially even connect their client side requests to the platform requests for an even fuller trace. So this brings me to the end of our story about the Avengers platform engineering team and their observability adoption. They were able to learn and grow and successfully meet the business goals they set out to achieve in large part because they had an observability practice to help them both with solving technical problems and fostering a strong, curious team. A few takeaways are 
that the foundation of an observability practice is structured events. Buying a tool is not observability. Observability becomes a superpower when it is successfully embedded as a practice into existing team processes. And observability benefits every engineer on the team and possibly even engineers outside the team, not just the most senior engineers. Thank you again for coming to my talk. Um, you can sometimes find me on Twitter um, and I will be around all week and I'm happy to chat and I will also be hanging out in the, the Slack channel for the talk and happy to chat there as well. Awesome, thank you. All right, do we have any, uh, any questions from the audience uh, for book? I know, it's like between us and, and the, the after party. <laughs> Awesome, great. Well, that's another big round of applause for Brooke. Why are you standing so far away from the microphone, Jason? It's the end of day one. Can we get a big round of applause for all the speakers and also the amazing staff here who's been flawless at screens and audio and everything. And Pete. And for our volunteers and staff that help run this thing. Yes, all of those people doing real work. I'm just, this is like the verbal, verbal shitposting, like Twitter shitposting, like in person, IRL. <laughs> so Jason, what are your thoughts on the end of day one with the distinct lack of any, well, except for Joe's talk about AI. We were almost through the day, Joe. I'm not sure there were enough hot takes. Were there enough hot takes? We have two more days. Yeah, There's true. still time. This is true. Um, honestly, like, it's hard for me because I'm, like, in 50 places at once, at least virtually. Um, but, like, one of the things I, I, that I love that I say is a positive, like, signal for any event is, like, how interactive folks are. And, like, I loved all the questions in the talk channel. So, like, thank you all for, like, doing that, asking more questions, giving feedback. I love that. That's, that's a lot of fun to see. Um, yeah. And lunch. I, I really like Little Big Burger. Yeah. It's the truffle fries that gets yeah. you every time. That fake truffle flavor, yeah. I just love it. I can't get enough. Awesome. Well, this was a really fantastic first day. Really appreciate everyone joining and, and obviously coming back after lunch, being so engaged. Again, 7 uh, p.m. is uh, Castaway, Portland. Details in the Slack channel. Uh, tomorrow, doors open here at 8 a.m., and we're going to kick it off again same time, 9.30, right? Yeah, first talk at 9.30. I'm really bad at this. I'm like, yeah. I don't actually know what time I, I, I It's actually right behind you. Well, no, that's just That's today. for Never today, mind. Jason. Sorry, sorry. I had to confirm. So. Uh, all right, just to add a little detail. So, yeah, Castaway Portland, uh, if you haven't been there, it's just it's on the northwest area of uh, Pearl. Uh, it's very easy to get to. Uh, it's probably far enough that you either want a bike, scooter, or a lift. Uh, but it's, it is walkable. It's walkable. But, but let's keep in mind it is uh, it's Portland. Portland. You will walk through <laughs> some areas. Uh, I, I, I personally wouldn't walk it alone. I'd walk with a group of people. Um, but again, I have walked it alone and I'm still here. So just again, be, be aware of your surroundings. It is a trek, but if you've been sitting all day, you know, a 20 minute walk probably might feel pretty good. Yeah. But that's up to you, obviously. You could yeah. just take a scooter and, and risk your life to those crazy things. We will have food trucks and we're bringing back the churro food truck, if y'all remember it from last year. Really, really good. So um, yeah, arcade games, ping pong, foosball, uh, lots of other good stuff, obviously a bar. Um, yeah, be safe, have a good time, uh, and I'll see you all over there. See you all tomorrow.